and so begins the Halloween stream. Oh, Ooh. scary! People are like, what the fuck? It's not even Halloween. Shut up! It's, it isn't it's some Halloween places. It's Halloween in Australia, damn it! Yeah. E? Happy Halloween, Fringy. Yay. Yeah, that's right. And so, so this is happening over there already. Week. What can we expect? What's going to happen? I'm not sure. I haven't been awake that long. Oh. oh, yeah, that's fair. As long as it's not like an overabundance of demons this time around, just your handful, because we've got stuff to do. Just a regular sort of number of, you know, an acceptable number. Yeah. Manageable amount. Manageable is the way to put it, I think. So, hello, everybody. Um, we got to make you aware immediately, because time is actually running out. Oh, yes, my God. The oh, plushies. My gracious. Run. Run now! You're so close. It's too late, almost. You got one like... day remaining, and a few hours on top of that. But still, you got very little time. Essentially left. a day. A day and, like, it's like a day and a half now, isn't it? Almost exactly. Yeah, and this is the news from News Chopper 6. Uh, we've got, I have passed over a thousand units, as has Rags, as has Wolf. Fringy is well on the way, which means Wolf will indeed be chained down and forced to play Gollum. Rags oh very likely will because let me check here because I didn't have this prepared. Ooh, it's close. It's, <laughs> yeah, ooh, it's the, the hoodie's uh, at 952. 952. Right. This gets oh, to 1k. Boy. Rags oh, boy. will also be chained down and forced to play Golem. The Not only will, will I be chained down, then we'll have to do be chained together. So oh, yeah, we gotta chains. do more of that. Yeah. That's right. That will happen. So, so yes, this is Seriously, if you've been if you've been holding off, if you've been procrastinating, if you've been thinking about getting one, if you're pretty sure you want to get one, now's the time. There's because you've only got yeah, you you've got a very short amount of time left, and then that's that's the end. And they will gone. never be purchasable again. Right. Right. Go <laughs> go go and check them out. Go go grab so, go grab yours if you want one. I actually did ask about Derp Wolf. Uh, apparently, it's been scrapped. There is there is no way to get no! access to it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Fools! I know. How could they have done that to Derp Wolf? I know. Scrapped? What are they gonna reuse the material on another <laughs> on another one? You know, you'll see him someday as some part of like they've got like a physical promotion somewhere, and he'll just be one of the random. But we'll be like, like hey, Franken, <laughs> it'll be like a a Frankenstein of like half of a face. I is found the weird Derp Wolf. Blue eye He's and... out there. It's uh, it's cruel, but that's how it works. So yes, if you want, disgusting to get. Uh, Mall of the Longpire, Rags or Lantern, Werewolf, or Fringy the Raven, they're all only available for another day. Right. I actually have to, I need to double check and see, um, because I already have a hoodie, mm -hmm. and I already have rags, because mm -hmm. they gave me the prototype rags and the prototype hoodie, so mm -hmm. I really only have to buy three. <laughs> wow. This guy. Why don't you buy backup hoodies in case you're too cold? You need extra hoodies. That could happen. All right, yeah. If I am wearing a hoodie and I'm still too cold, I got layers and layers. I thought you were going to say I've got different issues because I must be in fucking one of the poles or something. <laughs> but yeah, I, I like to right. stay toasty. You know, yeah, I, got, yeah, I, got I, got, I got my layers, you know, I got my long under armor and I got my my thinner and my little thinner long sleeve shirts. And I got oh, man, I still got my um, my ROTC. I, I don't think I was supposed to keep it, but I did. Um, but this 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 ROTC like military green sweater, those uh, you know you you've seen them where they have like the kind of like the pads on them and they're wool and they're kind of tight and green. Oh man, those things keep you warm. Ooh. sure. You'll be sweating up a storm in those. And then I put the hoodie on top of that. It'll be like an oven in there. In case you were unaware, if you buy any one on its own, you get it for the price as seen. For every one you add, you get five percent off until you hit all five, and you get 25% off the entire collection. The EFAP Halloween collection. Very spooky. And, uh, of yes, course, indeed. tomorrow you'll be unlocking the end of the Nightmare on Elm Street arc, which will give you probably one last reminder about these guys, in case you were thinking about it. But yes, before we would do any such thing as ending a, a, a different horror movie arc thing we, we we got we got some other horror movie to talk about one of right we if not the greatest horror movie in existence i'm gonna go ahead and bet that that is not everyone's necessary position here but i'm just saying okay one of one of 
one of them. It's up there, right? One at least of, yes. one of them, at yeah. least. Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Do you think The Shining is better? I already know your answer is yes. I like it more. Yeah, that's what I'm fucking thought. I better haven't actually the... seen The Shining. What? <gasps> really? I know. Really? I need to. Yeah, I, re- I have it. I, re- I need to. No, that's all right. You can see it now, <laughs> and you can yeah, watch I've, it and you'll enjoy it. I've heard it's really good. I just haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it'd be you a fun get time. Gotta I've, get him. Uh, I'm, I'm, what do you want me to I'm do? Middle. Get him. You gotta, you gotta, Come you at me, bitch. Do it. Pie, I'll cut right? you. I'll cut I, you. I, oh, God. I'm, I'm the just gonna cut you, here. Rod. I got a me. knife. You gotta cut them. Well, I'll cut you with sharp criticism. The others, I'll use a knife. I'll use a blade. I always keep a blade hidden. From that time when so I was in Pro TC, <laughs> I always got a, I've got, I've got the a bayonet hidden away, squirreled away. Well, in case someone comes at me. All I'll say is the thing has been a long time favorite of mine. Uh, it's always referenced by us as an example of how to do horror right, how to do a hell of a lot more than just like one layer of kind of scaring an audience, doing doing lots of different things. The special effects are lauded in the thing as being some of the best that film has ever seen. And I guess you could say... Uh, Boy, well, that's is... what people say first. That's often yeah, the first yeah. thing people will say, that the special effects are so good and they hold up because of how impressive they are and how practical they are and how incredibly well they have aged. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like they, a fine Dude, they wine. age better every day that passes. Like it just, It's just... Uh, mm-hmm. Modern modern day is helping it out so much, but uh, the other thing I was going to say, of course, is famously did not do well in the box office at no. all, and, and uh, released the same day as Blade Runner as well, which also failed. Also, also did, did badly. Not, yeah. <laughs> so if your movie, if you make a movie in what 1982, I think, don't release it on that day. Yeah, avoid it's that day. Cursed. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're from movie the past. Came out that day? It didn't. It didn't do well, and it got poor reviews. Very poor reviews at the time. That's so weird. Yeah. Well, it got well there's really a really there's a bunch of things movie. working against it. I mean, Alien had just come out, and then people had expectations of it based on that, and then like, and you had a bunch e. of uh, you had E. T. as well was another thing. You had established a sort of <laughs> the Alien this is after sort of a friendly e. entity, right? <laughs> yeah, and then there was a bunch of other box office competition like Poltergeist and mm-hmm. Tron, I think, and some other stuff in an era where people were really spoiled for quality films in a way they might not have realized at the time. I can't, I, dude, some I, reason, I, I looked at the thing and said, this ain't good. I can't and imagine fucking wild. seeing this in the eighties. Like it just, just in the theaters. I don't know. Me personally, I mean, like, I feel like I'd be blown away by it. Uh, the the, the, the it's specifically the effects of it, but hey, you know what? It would be interesting to go and talk to the the audiences back then and see what they thought. Maybe it was too horrifying, or maybe they were like, "I don't get it." Like, oh, mm. in any case, I shall handle hand the reins of this EFAP over to Mister Fringy, who's going to guide us through this wonderful movie, and we're probably going to discuss uh, all kinds of things. Oh yeah. Unless the rains uh, as, by the way, I've, I, I've I've kind of been losing my voice, so just bear that in mind. You might, I, I might, I'm just, I'm, I'm just <gasps> saying. Thing. But, uh, yeah, you think? Thing. No, 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 no such thing. If he went, blah, 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 we'd be like, no, that's free. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, that's right. If I see, yeah. It's, oh it's my gosh, it. Didn't didn't hear it. it must be him. Oh, did it not come through? Oh shit. No. The oh, fact that Discord like a... muffled hey, it look, means right? it's definitely him. Look, right, we, we we should move we should move past this, okay? We we, we gotta talk about <laughs> oh, okay. We gotta talk about it. Yeah. Uh well I even I know I know it's already pretty apparent what everybody thinks, but I, I would like for everybody to give their uh, you know one minute statement on the thing, uh, going from left to right. So Cap, why don't you right. why don't you provide your summary of your thoughts on the thing? I love this movie. It's incredible. It's it's one of the most sort of thrilling, paranoid, angst like like anxiety ridden horror movies I've ever seen. As mentioned, the visual effects, I would say probably the best I've ever seen in a movie period. It's up there anyway. Um, I think it's a really interesting case study for a type of movie that doesn't really seem to bother with anything like character backstories, but manages to 
to show character through action in a way that a lot of people don't seem to realize is possible anymore for some reason. It's an incredible movie. It's about smart characters dealing with an incredibly, um, what would you say, horrifying situation. And I think for as grounded as the movie is, it has, it's like surprisingly symbolically coherent too. Uh, we'll talk more about that as we go along. I just think it's an incredible movie. It's almost pitch perfect. There's very little I have negative to say about it. And I'm excited to talk about it in detail. Sweet. I love this movie. I, I think it's so finely, it, it's so like expertly crafted, like an incredibly tight script uh, that is very, with, with a very strong understanding of what exactly is, 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 uh, is being sought to be achieved with the storytelling, creating the, the sort of fear and paranoia, the distrust, the sort of rising tension as the film goes along. And then the crescendos with the phenomenal practical effects that, of course, have aged flawlessly, that are st still like some of the best instances of practical effects in any film ever. Uh, and just like really, really um, superb filmmaking overall. This film is, I, I'm, I'm also in a position of, it is very, very hard to get me to say negative things about this film. It's very hard. <laughs> this film is, it, the, the thing is, is, um, it it is probably my favorite horror movie uh ever uh yes this uh film is goat of all time tier uh it commonly uh, most people talk about the effects in it which are like 10 out of 10 it is the gold standard for practical effects um but it's a 10 out of 10 in in so many aspects i think like it's uh you have a, a crew of characters acting very believably towards this thing. And um, the, the screenplay is incredibly, in, it's intelligently written. All the characters are intelligent, including the thing itself. Um, and it has something, it has thematic heft to it. Like it, it's really at its core a movie about the importance of trust within a community of human beings. And if that isn't there, then it's just everything just sort of decays into sin and violence. And that's punctuated quite well by its ambiguous ending, which is one of its greatest strengths. I mean, just 10 out of 10 ending, great cast, great dialogue, great practical effects that never age. And it probably will, we might not get something as good as this ever again in terms of like practical filmmaking. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Like, I'm just, I mean, like in... In terms of like how filmmaking mod in modern day is sort of leaning so much into visual effects and doing things digitally, like feels like that's just sort of going to take over. Practical may not be a thing, in which case this is like, this is the goat. This is the, the horror movie to see. Yeah, I mean, you know, not to just echo what everyone's saying here, but I'm not surprised that we all have this perspective. It's it's. This is one of the films that are very rarely reserved for the. It's a, a goat of goats. It's the. It's not just one of the greatest films of all time. This is one of the ones that gets considered for like we we might be peaking here. It's it's really difficult to get any better. So little could possibly be changed, other than like tiny continuity errors maybe. Like the, the, the that's how tight and amazing this is. One of the things that strikes me about this film that I wish more films would do is just how much it respects the audience's intelligence. Um, obviously, when setting out to make something like this, it was important to provide X amount of information in order to generate the same experience, at least somewhat, that the characters are going through. I think that was kind of a masterful stroke of artistry, that the end of this film is being debated to this day, and that that's what John Carpenter wanted, that we're all like paranoid about exactly who or what or how everything happened, which is exactly what the characters experienced throughout the entire film. And that um, it's not just that, like, the creature is an allegory and it works on that level. It's it's also one of the most iconic and crazy fucking creatures ever and absolutely horrifying in both a psychological way, an existential way, and a body horror. It's it, The gore in this is so fucking amazingly done and so uh, poignant and, and, and terrifying in that aspect. Uh, and, of course, any aspect that hasn't already been mentioned, we're hopefully going to cover it, but... Uh, the soundtrack is amazing. The cinematography mm -hmm. is fucking top notch. Everything feels so deliberate. Love the performances. All the characters feel very, very real. Uh, gotta love the dialogue too. And I look forward 
to discussing all the information we get about different pieces of how this story unfolds. And I wish they made them even a fucking quarter as good as this these days, but they don't. Oh, right. Well, the thing is, uh, it's a great barf bag movie, all right, but isn't any good. Well, I found it, I found it disappointing for two reasons. I think that the superficial characterizations and the implausible behavior of the scientists on that icy outpost, mainly. Characters have never been Carpenter's strong point. Oh, he says no. he's he reading his this. Movies, oh, he's no. he's and reading his this. Oh, and no. I guess he'd rather no, see no. us jump six inches oh, and get involved in the personalities oh, of characters. Oh, I, I know, I think I know. This time, <laughs> though, despite some roughed out typecasting and a few reliable stereotypes like the drunk, the psycho, the hero, he has populated his ice station with people whose primary purpose in life is to get jumped on from behind. The few scenes that develop characterizations are overwhelmed by the scenes in which the men are just setups for an attack by the thing. True. And that leads us to that second problem, plausibility. We know that the thing <laughs> likes to wait until a character is alone and then pounce, digest, and imitate him. By the time you see Doc again, ooh, is he still Doc or is he the thing? Well, the obvious defense against this problem is a watertight buddy system, but time and time again, Carpenter allows his characters to wander off alone and come back with silly grins on their faces until we've lost count of who may have been infected and who hasn't, and that takes the fun away. The Thing is basically then just a geek show, a gross-out movie in which teenagers can dare one another to watch the screen. There's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. I like being scared, and I was scared by many scenes in The Thing, but it seems clear that Carpenter made his choice early on to concentrate on the special effects and the technology and to allow the story and people to become secondary. Because this material has been done before and better, especially in the original The Thing and in Alien. There's no need to see this version, honestly, unless you are interested in what makes the thing, uh, or in what like what the thing looks like or what it might look like while starting from anonymous greasy organs extruding giant crab legs and transmuting itself into a dog. As amazingly, I'll bet that thousands, if not millions, of moviegoers are interested in seeing just that. Um. So Roger <laughs> Ebert gave, uh, gave the thing. <laughs> A two and a half out of four. He also gave the 2011 prequel The Thing two and a half stars out of four. Jesus. I uh, know, re reading some of the quotes from the reviews at the time for the film, it's just like, fuck, did we watch the same movie? What the fuck? <laughs> uh, like, it's, it's like, it makes you question whether there's any justice in the world, you know, when a, a movie like this <laughs> gets made. What's the made point in living anymore? <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's like oh, I'm sure a lot of people would like this. Well, didn't make that much money, so you know. It's it's tragic to think that John Carpenter would have thought like made this and then th thought based on the reactions, I made a mistake. Yeah, I shouldn't have made um, this movie the way I mean, that I did. He, uh, he got torn to shreds uh, when this came out, and this was uh, this was one of the films that contributed to his disillusionment with Hollywood. The other one, obviously, Big Trouble in Little China. Which is another fucking mm -hmm. legendary movie. Yeah, um, another film. For the record, though, he's aware of just how much people adore the thing at this point. Yeah, so fortunately, yeah. there's that. But I mean, obviously, at the time, this cost him. The, the I, uh, I, I think he had like a multi-film uh, deal with with uh, Universal that fell through because the thing didn't do so well. I think I, I've heard him say that this is his favorite movie of his in hindsight. So at least there's that. So yeah, well, it's, I don't, it's I, one of those. It's one of those pieces of work that people on Easton's just weren't ready for. Like, it's 2001 had a similar thing. Like a bunch of older yeah, audiences right. hated it. But yeah. then you had all these young college students going to go see it saying, this is fucking amazing. Like, mm -hmm. And then it gets appreciated much, much later. I suppose yeah. the reason why it's also bizarre, though, is because it's, it's, like a, it's not like anything has changed about the way that the film was crafted. Nothing to do with any of the writing or the cinematography or the sound design or the music. Like, all of that, it's not like anything changed. It's kind of the annoying thing about examples like the thing in Blade Runner. It's like, I don't know what happened, guys. Like, you just, you just didn't, you, you fucked up. Like, you didn't, you know, it's, it's not, there's nothing about the idea that the film was, like, aged into being good. The film was always good. You just didn't yeah. see that for whatever reason. I mean, it's almost like, was it, were you guys distracted by the, the practical effects and, and the gore and stuff like that to where you thought that's all the film had to offer? 
as though like the whole point of the film isn't obviously in terms of dealing with those themes about paranoia and and, and what that does to people in societies you know i don't know like yeah. it's hard to it's hard to point them to the most egregious thing he says in that review but for for me what sticks out is the part where he says that oh he doesn't care about the characters and i just fundamentally Ugh. disagree as i mentioned before yeah. i feel like this demonstrates probably more clearly than most movies ever made how much you can communicate about a person without any sort of backstory without any sort of tragic flaw or anything necessarily it's just we see them take action to solve a problem and we learn quite a bit about them in the process and it's how is... you learn about people mm -hmm. in the real world. Real, real the people. Part. You'll feel real. Yeah. You don't really get people's backstories until you know them. And oftentimes you have to prompt them to give their backstory. Um, well, but of course, you just yeah, notice the way that people like behave. That. The backstory is going to become irrelevant once like the threat emerges. Um, it'll be that the backstory will sort of come through in terms of the way the characters will interact with each other. And it, it may well even play into... Uh, who they don't trust, right? Like which characters they actually suspect yeah. of having been assimilated, mm -hmm. uh, maybe in you know not based necessarily on what facts actually are available to them about why somebody would be, but whether or not they actually disliked that person or had problems with them before this situation arose. But I mean, that's reality. Once the situation starts, the focus is entirely on the present, not characters sitting around like. Oh man, this reminds me of that summer, and you know, like, <laughs> like we don't need to know if McCready was divorced or something. Like that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. it's not exactly. not that you couldn't include that or little details like that, but it's just it doesn't need it. And I feel like a lot of people have this weird idea that you need that. Well, it's it's funny because um something that uh in in terms of uh because we we can spend a little bit of time talking about the meta surrounding this film before uh before we we dive into the scene by scene breakdown um. You know, th this film is based on a novella uh, called Who Goes There by John W. Campbell. Um, have any of you guys read that or know anything about it? I've no. read the plot synopsis, but I've not actually read it. Yeah, I read I Jurassic read Park. Oh, ah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, cool. um, <laughs> the, uh, well, that's a book. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's right. It is a book. It's a book. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Um, uh you have the the novella then you have the uh the film from the 50s uh and then you have this film and the intention with this one was to be more of a faithful adaptation of the uh novella and like you know you read the novella and obviously there are there are deviations there are definitely like changes um not all of the same characters uh not the same ending um even the characters that are in it don't necessarily have the exact same traits but like you you can still see a lot of the 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 same like elements present um in in, in that story and and it's, it's in that story it's not like this emphasis on all of the characters backstories or anything like that there is the focus on the present situation and the paranoia and dis distrust that um that uh the the existence of the thing provokes as well as all of the conversations you know about like the existential threat that is the thing and and all of the same kind of questions and the same counters getting developed so it almost feels weird that it's like the thing is getting shit on for something that the the original novella that is very well regarded, rightly so, doesn't get criticized for. Yeah, that's yeah. odd. But I do wonder you... if... Strange. Maybe when this came out, maybe there was a certain... I wasn't alive in 1982. Um, and I, so, so I can't say for certain. But I wonder if when it comes to a movie like this and the fact that it's like a gory horror movie if that maybe colored the perception and kind of unfortunately he got taken in by that and didn't give it its fair shake because of the style or kind of movie it was trying to be and it got swept up in similar kinds of movies maybe it reminded of reminded him of movies he saw when he was younger that weren't good i i, I can't say for certain but it is weird that it got you know missed out on for what it really was yeah. um um very strange I find it to, you know, I find it so thematically rich and focused and important, simple in a good way. It has like what it has to say about the importance of trust among human beings, I think is so it's important. And it, and the all the creature effects is just icing on the cake in my view, and there is so much of it as well. So mm -hmm. it's just like you're getting the best of both worlds. And it, it's funny how it like you know with a lot of movies you hear the right way to do it is to never 
or show your monster as little as possible. But this <laughs> goes balls to the wall. It just depends on how good your, your face. monster I looks. Think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and think it, it takes the. Uh, I think it kind of uses that, but in an inverse good way. Where if you do get that reveal of what exactly is lurking underneath the flesh of any of these people and what it can become it really actually adds a lot to the the horror of who it could be instead of imagining oh is it just like a like a spooky killer with a knife or something like that no it's an insane alien psycho space monster from hell <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. i think it, it's it's aided by the fact that every time we do see it it looks different because it's a shape-shifting yeah entity so every time you see it you're like holy fuck that's completely different and that's more that's horrifying even... than the last thing i saw and, yeah. and it's 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 worth praising uh they they ran over budget on their uh on the on the uh, practical effects for the film but look all right Not a i appreciate it i respect an investment it in the uh, future <laughs> rob button was the uh the makeup like special effects artist on the film uh and he works very hard he works very 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 hard on the film um and, and and it's of course it's like one of the things that gets singled out as a point of praise, but it almost feels like, yeah, but like you gotta praise it some more, okay? It's like so <laughs> so well crafted. Like the the defibrillator one, like god damn. <laughs> you know, just go in and still then... hard for me to watch, and I've seen the movie like half a dozen times. There's yeah. um there's shots for me where I'm like, I love that I can understand how they built that and I can definitely see the like sort of animatronic nature of it, but there are some here and there that I wouldn't mind highlighting at some point, uh I'm just like, man, that's that's just almost at the point where I can get so immersed. I'm just like, oh god, if I saw that on set, I might have been like, what the fuck, guys? <laughs> what, have, <laughs> what have you made? Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Um, something I was gonna ask, by the way, because I was just curious if anyone here, do you have a preferred John Carpenter film, or would you consider this the best one he's made? This is the best one. Yeah, there's some other ones I like too, but this is this is clearly Head and Shoulders his best one in my opinion. I'm not a bunch of his enough. I haven't seen. I imagine I would still like this the best if I had seen. So Rain, like, but I could be wrong. Competition would be Halloween. They live in the mouth of madness. Uh, Big Trouble in Little China. We just mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. why am I forgetting? There's so many more. But, but point being is the they would that would be the, yeah of course and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, escape from New York yeah yeah escape, escape from, from New York. LA um. That would all be like the the competition, which is a really cool fucking filmography, honestly. The set he's got a variety, um, yeah, very impressive. But for me, like the thing, oh, it's just I don't know. Like for, for me, it's it's not close. Uh, I, I adore this film so fucking much, and I think it's got so much to celebrate about how it was made. And uh, oh yeah, it's so sad it didn't Good get job. the success it deserved when it came out. But there we are. But hey, everybody likes it now, which is yeah important. Which is good. And good. It makes makes you feel good, <laughs> you know. In the end, it's like in the end, it had a happy ending. Not like this film <laughs> <laughs> or itself. Well, well see, uh, it's about uh, your interpretation. <laughs> Might be a happy ending. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose there was a more positive. Yeah, exactly. Happier. But uh, in order to talk about that, I suppose we should start at the beginning. Yes, and we should. Very fine place to start. That's right. We can start with the worst shot in the movie. <laughs> uh, so, well, I mean, if I mean, you you got like a solid minute there of just Ennio Morricone's soundtrack. Mm -hmm. which is like, mm -hmm. All right, so yeah, we're we're starting off really well here. Oh my, sorry, I I have an alarm going off. Give me a sec. It's time uh, to talk about the thing. Okay, the soundtrack right. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, it evokes. It's, it's very much a case of immediately establishing that disconcerting tone that's going to be carried throughout the film. It's a very dissonant score. I quite like it. Oh yeah, um, even even atonal at a few key moments. It it gets real spicy. There's some crunchy chords in there. Apparently, the score was nominated for a Razzie. What? Which oh, uh, if you're not familiar with the Raspberry <laughs> Awards, it's, you give those to things that are not good. That are which, terrible. You know. The worst is what they're meant for. Fucking that, that is conspiracy. Get that There's is a conspiracy here. against this film. That's Something unhinged. happened. Somebody I, I wanted mean, someone gone. The Shining was nominated for several Razzies as well. So, mm -hmm. 
happens yeah. sometimes. Yeah, Danny DeVito's Penguin, I know he got a Razzie for that. But see, just, every uh, time I've heard I can, of those, I can, it's I can, like, I can understand I that more than, than this, because yeah, a lot of people found that to be like a grotesque, horrifying thing, which is like, okay, like it, wrong tonally, but this. Are you talking about the Penguin or the Thing is the grotesque, horrifying? Well, this is a horror movie. So you, you, you make sense to find something grotesque in it. It's like. Mm. Yeah, because people make genre arguments for Batman. Yeah, you know, oh. why but that, that's what I'm saying though. As case. much as I would take issue and, and argue back, I can at least understand why someone would come away with that after seeing Batman. But seeing this, I'd be like, "What? What were you expecting?" I don't know. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I imagine it's probably due to like the the melodies going like sort of in all directions, but, but... like. <sighs> That it, it can be anything much like the creature. Like, the the creature is informing the melody. And I think it works quite well. It's, the, it's got, the melody has an unpredictable nature to it. The strict first impression I got before even necessarily thinking too much about what it all may or may not mean was like, uh, like a ticking, like a heartbeat, like a stressful staring at someone and trying to figure out yeah. if you can trust them. That's what this fucking soundtrack does for the whole movie. Like, it just, you just stress that because you, like, can't... Yeah, I feel like I can't grab onto anything. Snap. Nothing is like for sure. And uh, just waiting for boom, something boom. to happen. So yeah, the, yeah, and then as was mentioned, the turn. discordant beats coming in every once in a while of uh, just uh, perfectly representative of the chaos and horror that is the creature uh, getting one up on you in any way, shape, or form, keeping you off balance. Like I don't know. I just how could you have anything but good things to say about it? <laughs> Maybe yeah, and like Adam like, of like much much of the best move many of the best movies ever made it knows when not to use music as well there's really long sections of this movie where i don't think there's any music at all and it really it really helps mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. i would say uh you compare and contrast right to the 2011 prequel movie which uh has a very insistent soundtrack mm -hmm. that is uh coming in constantly playing like suspense action music whenever the thing starts attacking anybody compared to in this film when there's like no music typically for any of the encounters with the thing yep. it's just the diegetic sounds which i think was the correct choice i'm certainly appreciating that more and more when i see it just having no music just like it feels more chaotic right everything. because like in a sense the music is uh providing a certain rhythm and and, and pace that's consistent yeah. you know as, as it, music tends to do compared to if it's just the sounds of people screaming or shuffling or you know like things breaking um and the the flamethrower it's like yeah it's all it, it, there's no like tempo that you can sort of latch onto it, it just seems chaotic i those wonder if in a seem... way sorry i, I was wonder if... say those moments seem to last longer too without music yes I agree. Yeah, yeah, there's no guiding background. Well, yeah, how, how long of... does it feel like um, Gary and, and Childs are sitting there tied up on the uh, the chair Forever. while uh, Palmer <laughs> is transforming? <laughs> yeah, it feels so long. And, and like, McCready trying to reset the flamethrower, and it's just not working. <laughs> it, it just feels, like, so protracted and I've always and felt so bad for them in that moment. It's just, like, it's so unfair. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then they have to sit there tied to the chair while windows is getting shredded <laughs> and they can't do anything either it's like it, it it just contributes to the feeling that they're all so helpless i do wonder as well yeah. if there's that part of our brain that recognizes if you're hearing a soundtrack there's a subconscious like oh this is a movie there's a soundtrack playing there's music playing so if by having no soundtrack at all it does kind of help even in a subconscious way our brain just be like yeah this is actually occurring I don't know, I just mm -hmm. feel like there are too many examples of not using music being, like, ending up in these amazing... No Country for Old Men basically oh. doesn't have a soundtrack. Oh, um, and goddamn, you know, like, the shootouts in, in like, the, just having only the, the, the sounds of the, of the world, it really does create a different sort of sense. And, and it feels like that's kind of the point, right? Because it's it's a deliberate use of music i mean already right out of the gate in terms of trying to like establish tone but also knowing when to pull back and i guess that's the thing right like it getting nominated i would assume i would have to assume that if you're considering what film has the best or alternatively worst soundtrack you have to think about the 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 music in the context of the film not just the songs on their own yeah. um in a vacuum like how do they contribute to the storytelling and in this case it's 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 uh, it's actually like unbelievable 
that a bunch of people could sit there and go, yeah, this is one of the worst soundtracks, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. No, it's crazy. Maybe they confuse a lot of the soundtrack with just, like, ambient noises. Like, it isn't music. It's just, like, it. it it's a, like, subtle tension building, or it's a sense of unease, or it's... Uh... Yeah, but, like, there are a couple of tracks that are just, like, actually kind of nice to listen to in, the, in their own way. Like, um... One of the tracks that I really like in the film is the one that's playing when Blair is running the simulation, uh, where uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Where, where where it's starting to sort of project like how how quickly the thing is going to take over the world. And it's like that's that's like a that's just a a song you can listen to, um, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then of course I think uh, wasn't it that um, there were unused tracks from the thing that got used in um, uh. Tarantino's um, The Hateful Eight. Am I mistaken, or was that... Oh, yeah, that was case? definitely uh, yeah. inspired by The Thing somewhat as well. Yeah. Well, it's just that I'm pretty sure that there were some tracks that were from The Thing that actually ended up... that didn't get used in the film that got used in uh, in that movie, I think. If, if That's I'm like my mistaken. favorite thing about Hateful Eight is the soundtrack. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, it's funny how music scoring can work, because, like, you know, if you're making a film and you're sitting in the editing bay and you watch certain scenes, sometimes you'll feel like, oh, this needs something. Or it's like, oh, this is stronger w without any any music. And sometimes it's not clear as to why that is. Uh, but I think in a lot of cases with horror, I find it stronger when there's no music because I think it, most of the time in those cases, it can act as a buffer between you and the thing that's happening on the screen whereas if you're just listening to the ambience and this diegetic sounds of what's happening you are more in it like you're more present in the scene and uh it's more horrifying that way i suppose that does uh rags it rags mention it it probably is like one of the few things that i would criticize in the yep. film we, we see a spaceship fly on, on Dude, screen it's just like Predator. On Earth. just like predator yeah I did not need be to see this. Almost yeah. fucking flawless. Why did you include this? And you know why they included <laughs> the it. We all one, know. The one thing I would have removed from it. I, I think thing. it's starting yeah. with the credits in space. Okay. I'm with it. Yeah. You could just start in space and pan to the planet. Perfect. I just it's it's great. It's something you'll probably forget as the movie goes, and then you're like, oh yeah, they because you obviously later you see the spaceship and everything. But like, oh, we already know there's a spaceship. There's an alien coming to space. It's it, that's the thing. The thing is in the spaceship. Um, it's coming. It's coming to Earth. Just now, nah, cut it. Just have the story start in the Antarctic after the credits pan to Earth, and that's all you need. Yeah, you is, don't need a spaceship. Like, it's not too consequential in the sense that this shot, like, it doesn't doesn't tell you anything about the thing as an entity or like the effects no. that it's going to have. And on you the do crew, get but... the reveal, so to speak, not in a. So the, the, I actually am more okay with this one than the Predator one because in Predator I absolutely adore the build-up being a confusion on whether or not something else is happening. But we already know something else is happening because of that intro. While in Predator they've got a whole other film happening almost and you get subverted into a completely different one. The thing, this opening is like, I mean, it, does, it you know, it, we discover that nature of its origin pretty quickly, but I guess you could say this this still you know the story's going to be an alien-related one. You're just like, it's just unnecessary, guys. We were going to get there real yeah. well without it. One, well, especially well, yeah, when we... you can... Oh, go for it. I think we had, a, we had a similar complaint with Prey, where there was, like, a very obvious sort of uh, shot, I think, of, like, the alien spaceship landing on Earth, yeah. and the protagonist lady, she, like, kind of watches it or sees it or whatnot, and I was like, oh, man, we just didn't need that. We know what it is. And also, like, we just don't need to see this. It's just, we, we just well, don't so need this. I'm not even kidding. Um, if you show this film to people, like, I, I, I'd be half into, like, the whole, eh, maybe start the film after it. <laughs> like, but it's, like, it's like a consideration. <laughs> uh, I think Predator benefits from not having that scene in it. Um, the thing I'm 50-50 I'm on. If, if it, it just, doesn't... yeah, if it just start, opens up on the text of it's, like, Antarctica 1982, and that's just the opening, and you don't even see the thing as a title, you could probably just pass it off as being a creative decision to just, this is where the film begins. <laughs> and by the way, for anybody being like, why are you spending so much time on this? Like, it's like the only flaw. 
It's barely even it's a floor. The, it's, <laughs> this is the biggest criticism we have of this film. Even, is this one it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a really big one either. Like, no. yeah, it's, really, it's, it's only it's, biggest by yeah. comparison. It's like necessarily the biggest because that's just it. And it's like a <laughs> meta experiential floor, which is very unusual for it. It doesn't damage anything continuity wise. No, yeah, story wise, it plays out exactly the same. And it doesn't impact the characters in any way because they're not witnessing this. Um, but I in a sense, be better it's to... like it's all, it's just thinking about in terms of viewer expectations because you know we we open up on the the first like proper scene of the film where we find ourselves in Antarctica and there's a helicopter descending oh. from the mountains into a flat. Yeah. Before that, I just want to compliment. I love the um the thing being revealed by fire in the title. It's cool. That's Which, just, yeah. It's just mm -hmm. how fucking cool is that on a couple of levels? Just good job. Yeah. And, and right. So not on, not only is it a special effect. Yeah. But like just the the thematic relevance of the fire, or you, practical right. you just don't see focus. shit like this ever. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, yeah the, this is this, this is one of the few things that they actually take directly from the thing from another world, the '50s movie, because that's very different. Uh, I don't know if we talked about it much, but the thing from another world, it's not even like a shape shifting alien. It's like a vampire type thing. It's hmm. it's quite different, it's and not, it's, it's not as faithful of an adaptation of the. No, it isn't. But this title reveal is it's taken from or borrowed almost uh, directly from the thing from another world. Is it like so one to one as in the oh, font, or similar. even the, the fire reveal thing? I don't. Uh... I don't remember exactly how they made it, but it's very very similar. I'll find okay. a picture. Well, in any case, obviously, I love it. <laughs> mm hmm. Uh. But like, yeah, so the the first scene is uh, we find ourselves in Antarctica with a helicopter flying over the landscape, and you got a, a pair of Norwegians chasing a, a sled dog, and one of them even grabs a gun and begins shooting at the dog, which right away, you'd be looking at this and thinking, <laughs> this is very odd. So you know? I watched this for someone who'd never seen it before in prep for this EFAB, and they were like, what the fuck? Why are they shooting a dog? Like, they were kind of <laughs> yeah. angry at it, and I was like... <laughs> that's just kind of, kind of the it's, idea, right? It's, like, it's very yeah. clever how the opening scene plays against that. Like, it's like, oh, they're shooting the doggo. <laughs> don't shoot the doggo, yeah. right? Which I mean, again, we talked about you... that before. That it's this thing where you don't kill the dog. Like, you can utilize killing the dog because it makes the audience feel a certain way, and you can utilize that in a storytelling sense. You are caught and, as uh, off guard as the characters are. You are one to one with them. You have no idea what the fuck yeah. is going on. They're like, shooting a dog. What you the guys, hell? these two guys, are, not only are they doing that, but they're putting a lot of effort into doing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what makes it so odd. It's like you guys hopped into a helicopter and you're pursuing this dog like relentlessly across the Antarctic well, landscape. What? When you what know, on? on second watch, if you know, if you're thinking about it, it is such a like, oh my god, they came so close, they, they could have stopped the thing close. if they just killed. So you're like, you're like, get him, get the fucking dog, <laughs> you can do and it. If you, and right. hey, you know what? If you treat the 2011 prequel as canon, which I don't, you you could be like, oh man, we saw what they went through, <sighs> you know, and they almost won. I, uh, yeah. I um, <laughs> I, I feel like we're not going to talk about that film much at all, hopefully. But uh, th this is like one thing that I feel is like worth pointing out. We, we talked about it before, but the 2011 film has a really generic, lame, like, horror movie soundtrack. But then, like, at the end, when they're doing, like, the post credit scene that ties directly into this film, mm -hmm. the music is good again, suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it just emphasizes yeah. how, um, how bad the music had been up until that point. I remember not liking plenty of the 2011 one, but specifically, you know when you get the big showdown in the spaceship and the big CG flute monster comes out? Yeah. Oh, I remember just being like, good fucking god, you make me sick. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> How dare you connect yep. yourself to the thing? <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. How dare you stand that, That's okay. We, we don't have to talk about it much. Uh, stand uh, going to stand. Um, and then the, 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 the doggo, he, he just keeps running, but then we see uh, the crew of an American research station going about their routines. Uh, so you've got Childs outside conducting maintenance work on uh, one of the vehicles, and then in the rec room, Blair and Copper are playing table tennis, Gary and Fuchs are reading, Windows is in the corner playing his guitar, and Palmer is listening to music. This is like one of the few glimpses into their routine unaffected by the existence of the, uh, of the thing, or, or even like much earlier in the film, just their, this strange encounter. You know, if it was like that momentary glimpse of, of like what Life their lives looked like simple. before this horrible situation. 
<laughs> well, I don't know if we'll, I don't know if you'd call it happy, right? That's kind of the, the takeaway. Relatively, right? it, it <laughs> relatively speaking, sure. Because I mean, you got um in the in in his little watchtower, McCready is drinking scotch. He's playing chess on his computer. And, the chess um, wizard. Ooh. Well, I don't know if he would be the chess wizard because he loses. Mm. Oh no, that that's the name of the machine, chess wizard. Oh right, right, yeah. Do you want to summarize it quick? Because there's there's some fan discussion about this that I find super interesting. This chess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he inputs a move, which the computer uh, responds to in McCready's view poorly. Uh, but then when he puts in his next move, the computer totally outmaneuvers him and checkmates him. Uh, McCready is a bit big mad about this, so then he pours his drink into the computer and destroys it before calling the computer a stupid bitch and leaving. Cheating bitch. <laughs> oh, cheating, yeah, cheating bitch. bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I guess, because uh, I, I find it super, super interesting, but I was going to say, does, uh, does anyone draw anything about the whole film from this one scene? I like that it um, establishes that he is somebody who is willing to play quick and dirty to get the job done to make sure he comes out on top. Um, like, uh, just not accepting loss. But, you know, it, in pouring his alcohol into the thing. I also like that this sets him up as sort of a loner. Um, yeah. Like, isolated from the others. And it's, I think it's quite clever that, in a way, it's his uh, sort of lone wolf attitude, his disassociation from others that kind of gets him out of this alive. Well, maybe, you know. Um, uh, it helps um him. You know? Completely reasonable. I, I meant in more of an autistic way. So this scene, <laughs> um, it's like, you know, there's a lot to take in. I think that, again, I, I got to be careful about overreaching in terms of how masterful I think this may or may not be, because I love the film, so I'm very much on the film's side. But um, mm -hmm. if we start with like the simple, sort of more straightforward, the he's playing against the computer, less just for the sake of uh, allegory, think of the computer as the thing. And this is their fight, and this is going to represent the whole movie. McCready thinks he understands the opponent and has got it. The opponent does something he doesn't expect and wins, and then he destroys the game. That, to me, is one-to-one -one with... He gets the upper hand with the blood test, the thing outsmarts him, and then he ultimately destroys the entire station, so nobody wins. Like That, that is like a one-to-one -one in terms of how the film runs down, but... A lot of people point out, and this is definitely a uh, one of thing, one of the other thing. It depends on how you feel. Um, the chess game completely switches if you compare the two screens. The continuity is completely yes, wrong. Yes, that's right. It does. But mm. the thing is, all right, someone might highlight that and be like, so that's a mistake. So it could be. could very well be. I'm going to entertain that. Very well could be just they didn't show the right screen or that whatever seems, have you. That seems unlikely to me because this is, of how they would shoot this. Because this there's I mean. never it, a scene with well, the, the screen and him in it at the same time. So... Yeah, it feels like they would have had I... full control, and so I think an interpretation, not going to say this is 100%, but an interpretation would be the computer didn't necessarily cheat, but it changed the rules of the game, or rather it changed the game entirely, like it glitches, like the, the thing is not actually reliable, it might be that his chess wizard is actually a bit broken, and so that's why he fucking destroys it, which is, could be seen as quite uh, unreasonable, because like, we, we would want to keep that active, right? It's like one of the forms of entertainment, but... If it's got a history of like breaking apart, that could explain him saying, "Oh, you fucking cheating bitch." But it also, I think, matches the thing really well as like a making a point about how it can alter itself, like genetically almost, like if in an equivalent way of uh, the computer glitching out and presenting a different game and winning it. But like I said, I don't know if I'm reaching a bit too much into that. I I love this film. I can't wait to find more and more pieces that match different things because I I almost see the thing itself as like a flesh AI that is desperate to try and replicate and express in any way that can give it a chance at living further through like algorithmically understanding life, but not actually understanding it. So um, again, <laughs> it's an interesting idea. The thing that makes me think that it's just a continuity error is that he doesn't react as if the game has completely changed. You know what I mean? If if the the computer glitches and now it's a completely all the pieces are on a completely different part of the board, which is basically what happens between cuts. He doesn't seem to react as if that's what happened. He just reacts as if like oh he thought he had the upper hand and then he didn't. 
You know what I mean? And cheating. Yeah, like he would react more like uh you remember in Family Guy when uh like they were playing chess, Stewie and Brian, and then the stuff got knocked over, and then Stewie started rearranging it, and Brian's like, Wait, what are you doing? You know, you put, like where he's actually like rearranged the pieces in his favor. Yeah. You figure that he'd have more of an angry reaction potentially. Yeah, like I said. But I mean, I, he, I mean he is pretty big bad. I mean he pours the drink into the computer, you know, so Yeah. <laughs> I I think it's explained by a continuity error. It's just um it's there's there's something to at least draw from it. It's not like worthless as a mistake. Yeah, you make it it makes me think if it's a nod for us, uh almost. Almost like an Easter eggy kind of thing. But... I think if if none of the other things that we mentioned, it could just also be interpreted validly as a jump cut to just sort of summarize a game that took longer than is depicted um, um i don't think so the game is like the pieces dramatically switch the uh, if you check the two boards against each other yeah but that that's that's why i'm saying like the time could have passed to allow all those pieces to move from Different one place game. to another you know what i mean i'd say that would be very confusing depending on the here, dialogue but... the jump cut may not be valid like i need to watch the scene again can't remember. Yeah, I don't know if the pieces are congruent with the same game. I I just can't remember. I think it's the it's more that surface level thing that you said. Well, not not that it's necessarily surface level, but just the the obvious thing that like <laughs> he doesn't like to lose, and then he destroys the whole game so that nobody can win. Just kind of mm. kind of similar to what happens at the end. So, and then we see the sled dog running over to the American research station, and the Norwegians are still on him. Uh, naturally, this is quite loud, so a whole bunch of uh, the uh, the Americans head outside to see what's happening, um, and then they get to see the Norwegians start to throw grenades at the sled dog, which feels like a even more of a dramatic escalation. It's it's just a case of man, you are. You are desperate to uh, to get this doggo, aren't you? Which obviously, watching at this point, if you don't, if you have no clue what's happening, it's a case of wow, you guys are like, what, what the fuck? This, like this seems as insane. wacky as it is. It also feels there's just not going to be a good explanation for this. Like whatever you guys are doing with that dog, this is just too much. There's nothing that could explain it, it's this. It's too much, exactly. Yeah. Uh, except, obviously, <laughs> all of the uh, the characters who make it, you know, much further in the movie will have a. Really good understanding yeah. of why this is happening, but unfortunately, it's too late. Uh, the Norwegians land, uh, but one of them he he uh, he fumbles, he drops the grenade, so that blows him up and destroys the helicopter. Uh, and then, as the sled Which dog, is pretty it, funny. I just want to say that I mean, goes, yeah. and it goes by. Oh, dude, the yeah, the struggling to find it. It's such a like oh. Yeah. Well, it's a bit <laughs> awkward because the uh, the other fellow, I I, I mean, I, I, you know, like I don't know what he said exactly, but it seems like he's telling him, you know, fucking forget it, like run away, <laughs> like it's over. You dropped it. You're not gonna find it. Yeah, it's because he weird. manages to get away. He runs off. But it's, I mean, yeah, it's a bit awkward just try to find it. I think it's it justified is by the fact that they got the big old gloves on, and these aren't military guys. Oh, sure, and, yeah, and they're desperate. Yeah, and they're yeah. Desperate, yeah. yeah. It is comical, but I can believe a, a cylinder like that slipping out of a glove like that. There wouldn't be much friction there. It's just yeah. funny. It goes yoink. Look at it go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Yeah, he, uh, he rolled a one on that one. Yeah. The uh, the the last Norwegian. He starts shooting at the the sled dog, and he, he hits Bennings in the leg, uh, and everybody else ducks for cover. But inside, Gary uh, has grabbed a pistol and shoots the Norwegian in the head, which is, that's the end of the Norwegian crew. Mm -hmm. And now they have absolutely no clue why this was happening. And are only essentially from this point left to draw conclusions about why in the world what they just saw happen, happened. Um, and can I just say, everything they do with the dogs in this, holy fuck, they got everything right. Like dog immediately running to the group that don't know anything about it, trying to lick uh, Bennings, mm -hmm. which is it's just like, yep, and then when they start firing close, the dog immediately starts running past him, because it's like, fuck, it's gonna that's get right. me. It's so mm -hmm. cool to watch the knowing that's a very intelligent creature trying to pull off a particular set of goals, while when you first watch it, oh, cute dog, and he's just, he's oh, scared. Cute dog, and he... Exactly. But the thing is, is that the more that time goes on, the more that you start to see the dog acting in ways that are like, that's a bit sus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're a little bit, what are you doing? What are you up to? Um, 
No, we, we got a, yeah. I was just going to say, I mean, we can talk about it later too, but it's probably the best performance from a dog I've ever seen in a movie. Really yeah. good. I don't know. Have you, I don't know. Have you seen 101 Dalmatians? I think the <laughs> live action one you made. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot of movies, I actually. This, Pretty uh, this good. He's uh, got a long career as a, as a dog actor, this one. Yeah, it is crazy how talented the actual dog seems to be, like outside the story. Like it, yeah. like it knows what's going on on set. <laughs> like train. Like right. no, yeah, yeah. It's like, this is this is my, my close up? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is my moment. So, uh, as the crew starts to extinguish the fire that's engulfing the helicopter, Clark comes out and comforts the sled dog. Which, uh, I mean, you later find out he's he's the team's dog handler, which. This we we've already gotten glimpses of character already, but this feels like an easy one to point to. It's like, yeah, he he's the dog guy. You know, he's the dog guy because yeah. he's like the only one who went to comfort the dog. That's character, like plain mm -hmm. and simple. Well, um, and it's um, it's good for the audience of like knowing when we find out what the dog is, we're like, ooh, and we agree with uh, exactly the yes. assumption of like, hmm, he's sus. He's very sus. The uh, the misdirection, um. Bewildered by what they saw, McCready says the first goddamn week of winter, which, you know, pretty heavily implying, like, man, these, oh, these guys, like, went crazy really early on in the winter, cabin fever, you know? He gets uh, Bettings a drink as well, just has him over it really quick, like, for the pain, yeah. I'm guessing. It's just like, I just like that <laughs> as a detail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's good stuff. Um, I like, too, that when, um, I gotta remember, um, the name's here, McCready. He comes out with the bottle, and then even when he dives in the snow after this shot, I think he's still got it with him after he dives. Like, yeah. that instinctive, like, <laughs> yeah, you're not necessarily just gonna drop out. things. Like, I'm carrying something. I'm, I'm <laughs> taking it with me when I dive. Yeah. Save the booze! That's right. You got. Yeah, exactly. You gotta. Um... I gotta save it for my, the next time I lose it. Chess. <laughs> Back inside, uh, Copper, who, again, you, you talk about instantly establishing character, he's the doctor. Uh, he's stitching up Bennings, and he, he basically concludes the same thing that McCready does about, like, why why in the world would any of this happen? And uh, the, the conclusion is cabin fever, you know? It's uh, yep. isolated. It's, it's, it's really... I, which, which, at this point already, you can already point to, like... Because we get more and more as the film goes on of emphasizing they are in a remote part of the world... Um, even if you obviously have an understanding of Antarctica being an incredibly remote location, we'd have got the big sweeping shots of the landscape surrounding them, in which there is absolutely nothing. Um, already the, the sort of emphasis on, hmm, these guys seem to have gone crazy, perhaps, you know, for, in this case for something that's more benign, that being that the isolation has gotten to them. Uh, and, and then, yeah, just emphasizing that again, like, yeah, it's, um, and, and first week of winter, right? At, with the awareness that everybody would have of, well, winter's going to make things harder for you in Antarctica. We're already starting to really establish they are isolated, uh, which will become obviously more, uh, of a problem as time goes on. There's a funny line in here, because there's a lot of speculation about why this could have happened, why they went crazy, whether it's reasonable for them to have gone crazy so quickly. And um, Nalls comes roller skating in. He goes, maybe we're at war with Norway. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a fun one because, yeah, it's a case of the, the joke is... Well, it's just, it's a good joke in, uh, to emphasize like how long it takes for news to even get to them. Like, it's a funny mm -hmm. joke that a character would make but it emphasizes again, they're so isolated that like, maybe that could be happening. They wouldn't even know. Yeah. They'd be finding out much, much, much later. Um, there aren't too many jokes in the movie, but there are some scattered throughout that are pretty funny. And yes, there's yeah. little lines like that that are quite amusing. We, uh, we see windows in the radio room trying to contact McMurdo station, but he can't reach them. And uh, Blair walks in. And wants him to keep trying, but Windows says he hasn't been able to contact anybody for two weeks. So, again, just contributing and, and, and very, like, talk about how expeditiously you're establishing this information. Because this is really important to establish right out of the gate. You know, it's, it's important that viewers understand with complete clarity. They are isolated and they're not in a position to contact anybody. And there's good reason why they're not in a position to contact anybody. It's not like a whole bunch of contrived reasons why. They're, they're all pretty logical. Um, yep. to emphasize just, you know, how isolated they are. And also, like, Windows is a bit edgy about it. Like, he's not, he's, he's a bit, uh, he's a bit sort of like, ooh, god damn it, like, I can't contact anybody. 
but Blair is uh, pretty insistent that they keep trying, which, of course, is pretty funny considering uh, the action that he takes later in the film mm -hmm. against the fig. And when you look at something like that, you think again, like, well, that's got to be deliberate, right? Of all the characters that they got of, of trying to be like, we got to contact people to let them know what happened, that it's Blair, the one who will most aggressively initially uh, act against the thing and prevent it from being able yeah. to make contact with anybody. Wilfred Brimley, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. Wilfred Brimley currently, or at least when this was filming, ascended. alive. But currently ascended, yes. The, uh, <laughs> The crew is all assembled in the rec room, and, and they've discovered that the Norwegians belong to a crew of 10 that only arrived in Antarctica eight weeks earlier. Uh, and, 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 and Copper is pretty insistent at this point that he wants to make the hour-long trip over to the Norwegian station so that he can investigate what happened. Um, Gary is pretty dismissive of the idea. Uh, he thinks that the weather conditions aren't good enough to go, but um, Bennings thinks that, the, uh, that making the trip is viable. Um, so it's, it's basically decided, like, he's, he's insistent. He wants to go check it out. I don't, I wonder, I don't know if there was anything that anybody would want to add in. There. Well, <laughs> I wonder if there was, uh, Bennings is, the, Bennings is when he gets shot, isn't he? So yes, I wonder yeah, if yeah. there is an element of him being like, like, damn it, I got shot. I'm going to figure out what the, f what the hell's going on, you know? Guy came over here well, with a gun. I got shot. I need to figure out what's going on here. Well, Benny, it, it seems like Benning's one step because he's ain't, he ain't going. No. It's McCready and Copper who uh, will end up going. And, yeah. and then you see McCready outside. He's He found 15 cans of kerosene in the wreckage of the helicopter. It's like, man, 15 cans, huh? <laughs> like, it's, I, I, just, I just love how all of these things, it's just a case of, dude, it's, it's too strange. It's just yeah. too strange. Mm -hmm. You have to be yeah. wondering why. Like, why, why in the world would they have done all of this? One thing to, to notice here, I think that it's interesting. McCready doesn't want to go up. He's like, no, the weather's too bad. I don't want to go up. And then later in the movie, once, you know, th shit has hit the fan, that question will come up again. And he's like, no, we're going anyway. Fuck it. We need to know. Well, I, uh, I really like the, the dynamics in this scene because, you know, Copper comes out and says, yeah, McCready, get your gear on. And then McCready looks up at the sky and he just kind of sighs. And then uh, we cut to, you know, maybe maybe a few minutes later as they're preparing to take off. And, and like, as McCready's walking over, Cop is immediately like, like, look, he, he, ju he just starts saying, like, several reasons why they should go. He's like, you know, we're, we're the nearest ones. And, and, and McCready, McCready basically says, like, yeah, I mean, I, I get it, but it, it's, it's, it's dangerous. We're taking a chance. And then uh, Gary, who inside was complaining about the weather, says, um, you know, stop complaining. The conditions will get, you know, clear once you're high enough. And McCready just sort of glares at Gary for a few moments. He, he just sort of looks at him, like, kind of pissed off, kind of like, what are you doing? It, it feels like it's establishing pretty quickly, like, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like McCready likes Gary all that much, which uh, I think it's safe to say that this contributes, this this helps emphasize later on his uh, particular mistrust of Gary later on. Yeah, He's not especially, I mean, he's kind of standoffish to everyone he to is, a degree. Yeah. It's true, but like he's he's nicer to Copper than he is to to Gary even sure. in this, yeah. this conversation. But I just think it's a really interesting choice to have the main protagonist in a movie this much about paranoia and distrust be someone who doesn't seem to like people already. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. It's uh seems like a prime uh a prime candidate for uh for <laughs> you know for a protagonist of this story. Uh, and different to to in the novella, he's not he's not nearly as uh much of a loner character. In any Apparently case, the, uh, the weather yeah. was actually a serious danger for the cast and crew as well. Sometimes they were flying with zero visibility to get to and from set because yeah, there's a lot of location shooting. Well, a bunch of it was in British Columbia, actually, where, I, where I'm at. It was and then uh, in Alaska as well. Up by like the Panhandle, so around the, the border area between British Columbia and uh, Alaska. That was because mm -hmm. they, they shot a lot of it on like refrigerated. Well... I, I, the, the, there was no like area that was big enough for them to have like a fully refrigerated set. So I believe they brought in a bunch of air conditioners and like uh, humidifiers and stuff to to sort of emulate the effects. But then when they moved okay. to to shoot in um in Canada and British Columbia, yeah, the the conditions were um there there were several days where the weather was just so bad that they couldn't film. Um, and and they were shooting in like summer and, and autumn as well. So you know, obviously, it'd be a lot worse in in winter. 
but uh yeah that that was uh afterward because um carpenter was kind of like unsatisfied with how many of the scenes were characters standing around talking inside uh mm. he sort of it got rewritten to where there were more scenes that were outside when they were shooting in canada and alaska so yeah Mm -hmm. I guess that would have the the effect of just that constant reminder of their isolation where they are. They're not just in a room anywhere. They're in in the Antarctic. They're they're not going anywhere. Every time you step outside, it's just snow for yeah ever, and they're not leaving. And well, yeah, other things outside, it's 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 just like yeah. you just can't even see. There's like little a mild snowstorm, and you can't see but thirty feet in the distance, and. It just it makes it even when you're outside and you can make a film feel claustrophobic. It's really good for that, you know, the, the vibe and the setting and the moodiness of it. Yeah, and those outside, especially the night scenes outside, are so stylish with like the really crazy blue moonlight. It's just yeah. it looks so fucking cool, man. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Uh, while um, we're on the weather, another thing I really like about this bit is the use of fades to white between scenes while it's mm -hmm. snowing outside sort of mm -hmm. keeps you in you know that claustrophobic weather like i would have much preferred that rather than like a fade to black for instance kind of reminds me of like ocarina of time or something where you're running around gerudo desert and through the different sections it fades to like a light brown to sort of keep you in the idea that you're in like a, a sandstorm you know yeah i like that i appreciate cool. that it's uh just attention to detail Basically, the conclusion of the conversation is Cop is like, well, it's up to you, McCready. And McCready says, man, you you really want to save those Swedes, huh? And it's like, no wages. All right, where are we going? <laughs> and then they just, they take off. But meanwhile, we, we look inside um, and, and, and the dog, he's, he's sitting under the, the tennis table, uh, table tennis table. <laughs> and he's, he's looking, he's looking. Ooh. It's like, man, you are... Duh. it's just like that's odd. Just, for me it's like the camera is uh, uh try to be objective but is a subtle assistant to the audience it's like keep an eye on this thing okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah just, just watch him yeah yeah there's an um, element of is it showing us scenes of the dog because like oh the dog's here and it's part of the you know it, it's part of the the group now and everyone gets their shots or is it like hmm mm hmm okay hmm it's um I mean, I mean, we we basically like find out the reason why that's the case pretty quickly, because uh, we we uh, we see Benning sort of storm out to I guess you could call it like a it's like a wall mounted radio and he's telling Knowles who's got his music really high, like hey, do you mind turning it down? And, and, and Knowles is like, yeah, okay, and then he doesn't, <laughs> which he I find to, which is like ah oh, yeah okay, can act as perhaps some easy cover in case any noise might be made soon. Or, and and mm -hmm. it's telling us because you, you get the sense like Knowles is kind of easygoing sort of guy. Benning's not so much. Though, I mean, to be fair, he just got shot. So yeah, yeah. and he says as much. He's, He's like, there. I got shot yeah. today. <laughs> and then I we was have frozen uh, today. The camera slowly drifting around uh, parts of the empty station, uh, and 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 then we see the 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 dog. He just he rounds the corner and he, he starts walking down the hallway. Very uh, the acting very, is so like, good. It's so really, good. It's a really it's good amazing. actor for the dog. He is. He's a good dog the actor. Slow, he steady his head walk. Out. He yeah. checks yeah. a room. It sounds a bit silly, but it's another room. It feels like something is controlling the dog and actually making use of you know, carefully checking, but also trying to come across as nonchalant. Like, yeah, I'm just yeah. a dog. Yeah. I'm doing dog yeah, things. Yeah, just walking that around. That, that yeah. harsh shadow on the wall, it's so fucking cool. Yeah, because he, he walks down the hallway, and then he we see a room, and, the, and there's a silhouette cast against the wall. And then he heads inside. So, feels like we should talk about this for a little bit more. I think it's, it's safe to say this is the first crew member being assimilated by the thing. Yes. But uh, obviously, it was deliberately uh, shot to where... You don't exactly know who it is, of course, which you know mm -hmm. it's it's great, right? That's that's yeah, it's great to uh to sort of to have that be the case where you're immediately you know from that point forward. Now, of course, at this point, you don't actually know what's happening here. Of, of course, it could just be that the dog he wants to hang out with one of the one of the fellas, but it's all a little bit too ominous for that to be the conclusion to immediately draw for what's happening. Um, well, actually, I'd be curious, what, what is it, who does everybody think this is? Norris. Norris. Are we all basically agree that it's Norris? 
I think so. The the silhouette can't fit everybody. Obviously, everyone's not quite here, but I think it is because it the can't be. There's, there's two clear candidates for who this would be, which is Norris or Palmer. I don't think it's Palmer. It doesn't look like. I don't anything. think it is either. The it, hair it isn't right. Like yeah, yeah, the hair is like that. It's got that distinct kind of. It's got like that. What, what do you call it? The the lip where it kind of sticks out in the front just a little bit and yeah. poofs just enough. Well, there's also the question of how it um, assimilates him. Does it... Because it, uh, if it gets him Love. aggressively, it's going to shred the clothing, which is actually a hugely important detail. Well, the thing is, is that we, we, we find out about the shredded clothing later, and it's not clothing that we ever see Norris wearing. It could be that he was wearing it, like, underneath his uh, jacket, at, like, his... Because uh, his, um, at, at, I think he's wearing, like, a, a sweater... And I think it's like a collar shirt. I, I mean, it has to be because you can see the collar there. Whereas what you see is like um, is like long johns. It's it's uh, it's like a long sleeve just t shirt. Yeah, that's so... my question. The point of it is to suggest there's there's a couple of ways you can be infected by the thing, and it can be as simple as it licks you. Well, so... yeah, because they later essentially conclude that they can't they can't like eat food that anybody else has prepared. Um, because that could be a way that they get uh, assimilated. Also, to help so, everyone in chat out, I thought Fringy made it clear. Um, we know this. We, we we're explicit. This is not any one of the actual crew because it's on set. Someone filmed as not one of them. What we, what we're saying is you'd you'd still John Carpenter would, would have wanted you to assume it's one well, of them. Yeah, there, there are there are meant to be clues that are because yeah. a lot of it is it's trying to essentially piece together like the timeline, right? Like who who could have possibly that's why be at any given point. they didn't use one of the mm -hmm. actors was to obscure it, but it's still supposed exactly. to be one of them. Yeah, I mean it has to be. It yeah, has yeah. To be <laughs> it wouldn't just be nobody and then they yeah. Gone. If yeah, right. they wouldn't have been like, oh, it's the, the child's look. You could tell by all the hair. And like they would, they would keep it to be where it's. But know, but of course, the goal is they want to. They want you to be in a position where you can be debating because I mean, a lot of people in chat have been saying it's Norris, but a few people have been saying that they think it's Palmer, which uh, I'm yeah, sure yeah. John Carpenter would be glad that that people are are coming to different conclusions about who this could be. But I mean, this is part of why this film is so well crafted, right? To to very to signal immediately like the whole thing that's happening here is a mystery first time around you don't you don't know what's happening you don't know what you're meant to conclude about what's happened here at this point it's just that this seems ominous that the dog is heading into this room where there is somebody sitting there what's funny um, is um, and then of course you look back later it's the blood test scene that really makes the investigation um uh, like interesting as a foundation because there's so many people you can rule out of course Th that's what you've yeah. skipped to with the question is you've ruled out a lot of people as a result of that but it's what i find the yeah. the thing investigations to be so interesting is that there's so much information you can get really far but you can't get to the end like explicitly and definitively there's so many arguments to go back and forth about everything right. exactly if i remember correctly there are scenes later that make it I think more obvious that Norris was the first one, just in terms of his behavior. We'll talk about him. And mm -hmm. I think there's reason to believe that it, Palmer wasn't the first one because some of the things Palmer does later seem very much in keeping with who he actually is at the beginning of the movie. I um, thought that interesting is Norris flies very much under the radar yeah. yes. throughout the entire thing. By design, like, even. Yep. Uh, I, also, definitely by design. Yeah. I'd say even more by design, unless you guys are referencing this specifically, that the thing chose him after keeping an eye on everybody. It was like, I think this guy might be the one to go for because everyone seems pretty chill with him, and he's um, he's like next in line for command of the station, right after uh, Gary, mm -hmm. or at least it's implied uh, that it's... Gary would choose him. It's an interesting question uh, if, if he chose him specifically or not. It's I think the thing is, is that. I think there's good reason to conclude that that is the case because, again, jumping ahead, we see that the thing is smart enough that he would deliberately, like, cast doubt. Like, the McCready shredded uh, clothes. Mm. That's that's the thing sabotaging. That's the thing fucking things up for McCready and making it seem like he's uh, assimilated. So it, if, a... if it's smart enough to sort of figure out ways to play them against each other, it's got to be smart enough to figure out, like, who... To choose a target. Who's, who's a good target. Here's a um okay so here's a question I don't know if it really matters either way but I'm just curious is the thing as smart as people because it uh, assimilates a person is it only as smart as a dog at uh, first man, so the I thing think is is that um 
so yeah. the the answer is going to be super complicated because it is a complicated creature. I actually think its intelligence is almost down to just how many cells it currently has of, of use. Like it's uh, when you rip it down to like a puddle of blood, it's probably going to be. I think is this is this made reference to like it'll have instincts at that point, but the more cells it has access to, the more it can power itself up with like you know complex uh, biological function. The more if it's a dog, I think it's capable of making a lot of really. The thing is, strong it's decisions. something that's. It's it's something that might be the basis for um, what will become like future sci-fi things, whether it's the Grave Mind in Halo or the the Necromorphs in Dead Space. Once they get enough flesh and mass yeah. and members, essentially, it gets super smarter. The bigger, yeah, yeah, bigger yeah. It it, um, once it's like human amount of cells, that thing is fucking super smart. Yeah, because people are rightly pointing out that um, it knows things that the humans don't, obviously, because yeah. it knows how to build a spaceship later. Yeah. So I guess exactly. I'm just wondering if, while it's a dog, it has the same sort of computational brain power as when it assimilates a human, but it really doesn't matter. I'm just curious. <laughs> something that uh, something that is kind of explored a bit in the novella is the idea of whether or not the thing is accumulated vast wealth of knowledge from all of the species that it may well have interacted with throughout its like history as a as an entity which is interesting the idea of how much knowledge is it accumulating because at the end of that story the blair thing is like building a like a teleporter <laughs> like it's, well, it's very very intelligent something really cool to, just like a fun tidbit and this obviously you have to ignore all third party content uh for this one but did it crash land or did it assimilate a creature that was flying its spaceship and crash land because it was in the middle of doing that sort of thing, right? I like mean, I do I do like that that's something you can speculate on because I don't think that you can definitively conclude whether that is the thing spaceship or if that's one of the many species that it's conquered. Yeah. And it's also important to note that we don't actually know, as far as I'm aware, if there is a time gap between the opening credits and Antarctica 1982. Oh, no, that's um, definitely yeah, a, about that. a, huge, so, a huge time gap. Yeah. It's 100,000 years, isn't yeah, it? At yeah. least oh, okay, I gotcha, years. I gotcha. At yeah, least. they talk the about how the, is it so the deep ice in the is on ice and everything. Yeah. cycling yeah. up, like, things that would have been buried deep. So. I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, exactly. That It's uh, for a long, 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 long time. And that it's just been sitting there waiting, in a sense, which is nice and spooky. Yeah, mm -hmm. like tomorrow. Oh my gosh, it's just like tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, so now we we see McCready in the air approaching the Norwegian station. You see smoke sort of pluming over the uh, mountain, and then you come around and <laughs> the entire base is smoldering ruins. Wait, what's what are it's you just, laughing at? It's just the fact that it's like you want to know the, what happened here. Well, you yeah, can watch. It's like no, 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 no. I no. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to find out why there was an axe in the wall. I don't need to find it's out. It's so why cool, the axe... and they make it lame. <laughs> like... They do make it lame. They absolutely what's, do. What's isn't it so satisfying axe... now? You know. It's funny about the axe in the wall, ignoring the backstory they tried to give it in 2011. Is that later? There's like an axe. Like the like the axe comes back in the American station as well you know what i mean mm -hmm. like little little details that we see yeah. happen to them will happen to our guys later including many similar objects and rooms and stuff so it's kind of fun so uh they they set the helicopter down in the rubble and mccready uh goes inside with copper armed with a rifle he calls out again to the swedes before being corrected again that it's norwegians <laughs> <laughs> he goes on an arc for that. They, it's great. Yeah. He does a little bit of an arc, and then uh, the pair Randy slowly, Scandies. slowly move through the building, and they find the uh, axe wedged in the wall, the bloody axe. Uh, but then you also see like the the interior itself is is covered in snow and icicles. Um, so in a sense, it's kind of like in terms of like the the amount of time that would have passed right between when all of this happened is uh, a little bit unclear. Though I, I suppose because it is Antarctica, you can presume it's not, like, too long. I presume it wouldn't take too long for the for the interior to look like this, basically. Probably not too long. Look, um, I don't live in a country where it snows regularly, so you gotta help me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they, they do a good job at keeping it... I think they keep it decently ambiguous as far as how many buildings are there, which ones they actually visit... Uh, what the time span is, it really does get you wondering, like, oh shit, what happened? Like, this is and clearly old, it's been here a while. Um, what were the, these, the guys who flew over here, what were they doing? How long were they doing it for? Were they planning this for a long time? Were they, were they 
hunkered up in a bunker somewhere or such a great How way to generate it's like you're seeing the remains of a horror movie during your horror movie that's going to be directly reflective and it starts to piece things that we've seen before together while like fringy said it's actually going to foreshadow as well like yeah, how cool is that right it's yeah. it's i mean it's great and 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 it's very much a, uh, an instance of why would you even feel like you should do a prequel <laughs> movie about money, what happened money, here money. because people Marrow. love the thing <laughs> i like i don't need to see that i this is it's perfect leave it alone stop touching it so regarding yeah. Regarding the temperature in terms of how a building comes to be like this, obviously, if if the if the generator is sabotaged and they lose power, it gets to like somewhere between negative forty and negative eighty degrees Celsius at night. Yeah, on Antarctica, it's really so. cold. Yeah, well, so yeah, that's winter. Pretty quickly, <laughs> it's winter, so even colder. Yeah. The wear jacket. Antarctica, wear a hoodie. That's right. An EFAB hoodie. Yeah, an EFAB hoodie. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> wear two. Um, when they uh, go inside, they find a Norwegian, the corpse of a Norwegian, sitting in the, a chair, uh, and his throat and his throat and his arms have been cut. But it looks like he's it, like committed suicide um, mm. himself. And then they, uh, Copper starts grabbing all the notes because he wants to, you know, he figures what. Even though they're in Norwegian, it's like, yeah, just just get the notes, which is probably a good idea. Thank you. McCready, Information. McCready starts to venture deeper in the base where he. He finds, I suppose, what could only be described as like a big ice sarcophagus. It's so cool. Um, yeah, pretty much. It's it's really cool. You gotta you gotta put it up. So I mean, I'm sure everybody here knows what it looks like, but still. Um, and and again, so we will. I seriously w would like to almost stop doing references to the 2011 film, but you know, look in the 2011 they film, made you it. find out that the thing jumped out of that. Yeah, went, <laughs> jump yeah. It out, dude. It's yeah. weird how many memories you're unlocking because, like, I remember seeing that scene because it's like a it's a black like creature that just flings up into the sea. I remember being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also disappointing. Yeah. It's so stupid. Um, oh, I, I also just love the piece of music that's playing during this exploration scene. Mm -hmm. It's the one mm -hmm. where like the, there's like a really high violin melody that's just kind of wandering atonally. It's just really tense really and good. chilly. Oh yeah, and I mean, you know, I I suppose it's it'll be interesting to find like opportunities to praise the cinematography since it is masterful. Oh yeah, but uh, it's it really is just a case of like knowing when to because it's, it's it's a pretty long sort of shot ending on a on a nice little symmetrical uh, frame, seeing the uh the the uh the sarcophagus, and it's very much it's it's just like. What what is to be made of this right now? And and if, and if it was, you know, the the staggering of the information that the characters receive, because you know, th at this point, like this is odd, but you can't necessarily infer that this has anything to do with an alien at this point. But obviously, once you know later on, they go to the spaceship and you see the big yeah. carving of the of the ice out of the ground. You start to piece it all together and go like, oh shit! And of course, it leaves you in a position to wonder what did this thing even look like, which is um. It's it's fun, right? To to not know, though. Again, in the novella, you 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 do kind of. Well, it could be the alien that's on the ship, uh, but in this case, you don't even get to really know like what the alien looked like at all, um, which in itself can contribute to the mystery more. It's like, oh shit, what was the thing that was inside this ice, and then eventually, what did it what did it turn into? Uh, regarding the way it's shot, uh, it's a well-considered use of anamorphic widescreen. It's what gives you your uh, letterboxing, despite the fact that it's already widescreen film, to, you know, not only emphasize environments, the landscape, but also add a bit of a claustrophobic effect at the top and bottom, and also mm -hmm. to fit more people on the in the frame, you know, because you have, like, a pretty large cast of people here and sometimes you need like a big shot where everybody's standing around looking at something or talking to each other or whatever just oh yeah lots of oh, yeah. factors that went into that decision it's not just for its own sake just because it looks quote cinematic or something you yeah. know exactly so uh mccready and copper head outside and they that is they they find the charred remains of, of something which um just looks very 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 strange that you can't like fully discern as as being a human. Harvey Two Face. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> well, because of course you don't get your, your super duper clear look at at what it looks like until uh, 
that yeah, it shot back. really well because it's in like the they it take advantage of the depth of field and the profile that it has against the like the the white background and the two of them that are in focus in the back and you're like ooh what are they looking at all this mm -hmm. ooh. yeah because they're saving it for the big reveal but uh as they head back the dog he's waiting he's watching looking out the he's window watching. <laughs> that's a good shot because it tells yeah. you so many things i guess uh first time around it's not going to be as much information because you don't know as much but the idea that the dog is like i wonder if they found it fuck <laughs> <laughs> exactly then he's thinking about what plan he needs to enact Dude, there's something brilliant about the idea that before they you know they would do an action they were like okay you need to look very concerned but also relatively like you're in control there's actions you can take have you got that it's like mm -hmm. He nods his head, man. Look at him. And then, he and then he looks at him. Did he's, I do it? Yeah. Did I do it? And he's like, yeah, you, you did. You fucking nailed it, dude. <laughs> you know? all, all the dog shots are unsettling. Cause all its movements are very minimal and considered. Yeah. And uh, right. controlled. And like, it doesn't do, like, dog things. It's not rolling around. It's not scratching its ear or anything like that or rolling in garbage. Like, it's uh, it's just, like... Hey, whoa, okay, first off, okay. <laughs> okay, calm down. All right, Jesus Christ. Down, it's kind right. of back. Oh, they're, like, rolling yeah. in the oh, mud. No. Like oh, he's not doing dog crap. things, like, rolling around in crap. <laughs> oh, my God. Please. Jeez. Racism yeah, has I know. become too Jeez. rampant, it's true. <laughs> you know, but yes, I, uh, it's it. unsettling how static the dog is and how focused, and you start to wonder things. That's so good. About exactly. The field. Uh, and then I guess you, you you don't need to wonder so much because well, I actually, um, I guess on that note, um, it makes you think: is that intentional? That it's just like focused and thinking about what it's going to do and being deliberate, or does it not even know that those are things that a dog does to that are just like normal dog behaviors? Um, this strange yeah, we don't creature from another world. We're not getting like definitive answers on exactly yeah. how the thing performs as like a a creature and how much you know. Like I think because you can even argue you get different results at different times, different actions, and it's probably very related to you know the thing's complicated. It's not a strictly straightforward beast. I would say that it definitely needs to take some time to learn how to pretend to be human well, and I think there's really something nice about how like flying under the radar Norris is especially early on he doesn't say a lot mm -hmm. and I think if, if, we, if we assume it's him that he is the first one he's just kind of watching learning how to behave to well, a degree and there's there's just a complication of exactly what kind of memory are we dealing with with the, the thing because if it's gone through all the people in the prior outposts you'd think it has a lot of info but to learn an individual human is still very yeah, different than learning all humans yeah well, of course, bearing in mind that it's, it's made pretty explicit that the when when it splits, creating new entities that have their, their own sort of agenda that may well not, you know, that that the thing w will potentially work against other things, um, which of course is really interesting as an angle that the thing will will uh, even you know sabotage other thing if it if it protects itself. Yeah, well, there's a whole thing to unpack there with the nature of the thing, because like people who are assimilated, they don't know they're the thing, and so like if if somebody does something to sabotage the the uninfected crew's ability to like suss it out, like does do they know what they're doing? Like is the thing able to compartmentalize an infected person's awareness of what they're immediately doing or give them laps in memory where they don't even remember doing a certain thing that goes against the interests of the the uninfected you know what i mean like um, what are you basically I'm not, like uh well the, the 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 crew actually talked about that and agreed upon it that uh if if a person is infected by the thing if they're one of the things they don't know they're the thing they behave in such a way where it's just like I, I'm not one of the things, you guys, and they are saying that honestly. You know? Well, that's acting, um, right? I'm not sure I agree with that. I don't think uh, I agree the, with that either. The sense that I got, like, because I remember that there was, uh, when they were doing the blood test windows, when the test was happening, he looked like almost, he looked like simultaneously nervous and like ready to jump on um, McCready in case it went wrong. But that definitely came across to me as like, well, that a human from their perspective a human might look at the situation and go fuck am i actually infected but i i definitely got the sense that the thing absolutely knows it's the thing 
yeah and is uh and as as bullshitting and faking it right that like th the the thing has a full awareness of what it is and is employing strategies to uh consciously outmaneuver and subvert uh the other humans yeah the, but, uh, this is something that honestly confused me i just i just remember reading something i could be wrong where the john carpenter and the crew sort of ag agreed between themselves like the people who are the thing don't know they're the thing or like the thing i think has a constant awareness on some broad level or like a cellular level but then when a human being is like falsely like imitated created you can create like a brain within that person that doesn't know that it has been assimilated and so it can act very convincingly to convince others that it's not a thing i don't know i just I, I could be wrong. I don't know. I, I well, just, it I it might be something crazy. they intended. I haven't heard that personally, but I don't think that comes through. I don't, I'm not getting that from the movie itself. Broadly, you know? most of the actions, I think, okay. can be explained by the thing struggling to figure out exactly what action to take in certain scenes. As in, like, you know, that when it's tied up on the sofa with two other people, it's like, it could just attack him right now, right? And it's like, well, it's just spending the most of that scene stressed out about, like, shit, they're getting closer and closer to figuring out that I'm the thing. I think that, you know... Uh understand what you mean john and the idea that like the thing can in a sense it, it, part of what it means to be like effective as a uh in, in terms of like the performance is to have some understanding of like who the original person was and have the ability to reflect the the actions of the original person in a way that they actually would right that like what it means to be convincing is to be almost like so convincing that you are uh, that, that Do you, you believe you it? act as though it's like oh i i am norris you know right like this is right i am doing what norris this is what like who norris is and what norris does yeah but um and so it's not up to think about well, it, it, we, i don't think we get an explicit um example of that but we also don't get something that would be interesting to do of someone getting infected very in a minor way and and realizing it before they've been fully taken and gradually, over gradually yeah gradually like, like that could be like, oh shit i'm done which <laughs> uh is all right. a theory we... that um yeah uh, uh blair realized too late that he was infected and tried to kill himself but i uh, couldn't make when it when we when we I'll save it for when we get to what happens to Fuchs, but there might be something to talk about there. Oh, yeah, sure. That's another example. We are jumping around. I think Fringy was all right with that, right? <laughs> yeah. No, we can jump around. That's, that's Just, totally um, fine. It is. If we're chatting. We're chatting about it. A fucking hilarious visual. IMO, but the when he goes to see Blair, the the noose is just hagging next to him. And he's noose, like, I yeah. feel fine. <laughs> uh, like, you know, I'm ready to come back inside now. Yes, I I, I wonder if uh, Blair was realizing too late, and he might have been intending to kill himself. There's a couple ways you can interpret it, as is the thing and its power. Mm -hmm. They uh, Hopper shows the rest of the crew the corpse they found at the Norwegian base, which uh, has got two faces and looks very mangled and. Uh, I mean, just obviously, like, oh, what the fuck is that? You know, that's very much the uh, the only takeaway from that. Um, which is the first. This is like the first instance of the really great practical effects, you know, on the film. Dude, the yeah. uh, the wetness like, of it and the steam uh, that's looks coming slick off it. and the steam. Yeah, yeah. hell, like it looks got, so good. Like it's got heat yeah. coming off coming off of it still. Uh, uh, uh. You're showing it right it. now, but there's that really, really agonizingly slow dolly shot. We just go and slowly to the left. Slow. Everybody's going. looking at it. Yeah. Everyone's like, silent. Oh. Just like, what the fuck is this? It's great. And like it, it doesn't... and the dog. There's the no. Dog is looking at him. There's no tennis ball. There's no like guys. You no. get some concept art. It's just, that's what it is. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, and yeah. you might be like, whoa, whoa, hang on, no hate. It's like no, no hate. But this is amazing. So <laughs> you can you uh, can do it other ways. Some hate. Some hate. Some hate. <laughs> the, the dog is looking at this as well, just staring at it. <laughs> yeah, my brother, yeah, yeah, my fallen one brother. One yeah. <laughs> I will avenge you, Gregory. Well, no, he, he don't give a fuck. I think that's what again what was what we could conclude pretty definitively oh i like that yeah shit about other things when the thing like detaches it, it immediately has its own self-interest well, I, I again I, I this is jumping ahead but one that feels notable is uh when norris thing when the head splits off palmer is the one who points out that it's getting away and mm -hmm. palmer is definitely a, the thing at this point and I feel but like it will help prove his. You got it. Well, more I, I, I think so. I think it, it's it's a case of like 
Because, of course, the characters make really good observations that, like, just because you've pointed out, like, the thing that you want... Like, this is jumping ahead a bit more. We'll talk about it when it happens again. But when Copper is talking about the, the blood and the sabotage and the test, Childs aptly points out, what, just because you came up with the idea for the test, that means that you're not the thing. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Just because, like, these are the kinds of things that the thing would do to make itself look more like um, one of the crew. Yeah, so, classic yeah. trouble in terrorist town. You know, give up your buddy to make you yourself seem no innocent. rags among us. That was the first game that uh, did this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I'm I'm talking about the good one. <gasps> do we do we know for sure that Palmer is the thing by that point in the movie? Yeah, because the blood test is right right after that. Is it immediately after? I'm pretty sure it's like the next scene. It I wouldn't think, be. Uh, Wait, if it wasn't, it wouldn't be quick enough. There's no way it's quick enough to where. I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't think it would work. Take some time. There's, there's no, no chance there's for no to be infected between that and then. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah. Because the, the the general thing seems to be that every person who gets infected was isolated in some way. Um, yeah. Because well, you know, I'm sure. I just can't remember could how be, much later it was. Because talking about the idea that Blair could slowly have been infected, I mean, it could just as easily, and I, I would assume the much more likely one is someone just went out there. Yeah, and infected Blair while he was on his own because there's a couple of days that pass in between, so that seems that seems likely. So yeah, I, I think it's safe to assume that Palmer is definitely the thing in that that scene, uh, and is sabotaging the other thing because he thinks it will help him, uh, which he probably would have, except for that blood test. <laughs> that that blood pesky test blood pretty, test. Uh, it's a pretty good one. I love how the 2000. Sorry. I love how the 2011 <laughs> one does like, oh, it's the teeth. Look at the teeth and see who's got fillings. It's like, this is not as cool as the blood test. But no. It's not. Open you your knew, mouth so you know. knew they had that meeting. They're like, we got to have the blood test scene, but it can't be the blood test. We got to do something else. Someone come up with the something. Thing is, is that I'd be willing to give it a little bit of credit in the sense that it doesn't definitively prove, it only definitively proves who isn't the thing, not who is. Yeah. Right? yeah. Somebody, it comes in well, he has porcelain fillings, right? He mentions or something. Yeah. Exactly, but still, it ain't as cool as a blood test. <laughs> anyway, uh, Palmer is asleep in the radio room, and Gary wakes him up. Wait, wait, wait! Uh, sorry, before we move on from yes, the reveal okay. of the the split face monstrosity, I first of all, because everyone's so talkative in this movie, I love that no one says anything. Basically, in yeah. this scene, they're all just kind of they have no, they're looking at each other, they have no idea. And there's a really interesting detail where this is kind of the first inkling we have of anything like paranoia in the movie. McCready's looking around at everyone to see how they're reacting to it. Now, he's not paranoid yet, but it's just like he's taking the time to gauge how everyone's looking at this. He saw he like they discovered it originally, so he's seen it already. But he's like looking around at everyone else, just kind of watching them and seeing how they're reacting to it. I just find it really interesting. Do you think? Yeah, because like, what is he thinking? Starting to have the no, earliest thought. Not I mean, the I fact that it has a face. Yeah. I just, I just, I'm not saying he's paranoid yet, but I just, like, well, I, think, I find I it really interesting. interesting. Remember the shot There's, that goes it's from... It's a very specific shot. It goes from the split yeah. face up to him, looking concerned. Mm -hmm. I gotta imagine the point there is, this, this, wasn't, like this wasn't a guy, right? This wasn't a... Yeah. Like, hmm. You see something like that with a, with a human-esque face, and I think it's pretty intuitive for someone who's <laughs> even mildly clever to be like, Holy then, shit, can this thing, like, look like us? To cut to the mm -hmm. dog being like, what? Yep. <laughs> what are you guys why, doing in here? Why are you looking at me? I didn't do nothing. This ain't I'm me. just a dog. I'm that's just a, the I'm power just... of editing, man. It's just yeah. a simple cut, but it's like, oh, what what the dog doing? <laughs> <laughs> you guys are up to some interesting things now that we're, in here. Yeah, we're back from the camp where the Norwegians were from, and the dog is what they're trying to get. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Palmer is a... Uh, asleep in the radio room and Gary wakes him up. Uh, he fell asleep because he was trying to contact other bases. Uh, clearly it ain't working. Um, and uh, he explains that the weather conditions are definitely going to get worse, which, you know, is just setting up how how much even more isolated they're going to get. And uh, Gary tells him to stick with it. That's basically the, the gist of what happens there. You know, something about Gary, um, I've forgotten when it happens in the film, but I think it matches his general demeanor. There wasn't much of like a hey man how are you feeling about having killed someone like um and you know they make reference to he popped his gun off at one point i, I can't remember if it's windows or palmer that says it but um he gives he gives them an expression that's not fun like i did not enjoy killing somebody 
Mm -hmm. And it's never, he's never given time or attention in any way, shape, or form by anybody for that. And I wonder if that keeps him on edge as well. The fact it's like, yeah, I, I casually took a human life, which I've probably never done before. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, like it, it feels like something again that's it's up for us to play with and think about instead of it being like cringe and explicit or, 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 or you know, like blatant in a bad way. Yeah, because yeah. he's old enough to where you could believe he's like, I mean, if, if this takes place in 82, you know, he could have been in numerous conflicts at that point he's guy with a gun he could be an ex-cop he yeah he's old enough to have had a lot of life experiences that would lead you to believe that he has processed it well but you don't know because if it was like a super young guy who did it uh you know like we had the young oh this is my i just got out of university and now i'm at the research station and boy oh boy i'm so interested in studying how snow works and then he's the one who does it, then it would be weird if it was never brought up or mentioned because he's so young. Yeah, and he deals with it well, right? Like, it's uh, to the point where I imagine none of them think that he's truly affected by it, but I just wonder if he is. He does seem relatively strung out um, in the film. Oh, yeah. We then see uh, Blair conducting his autopsy. He's concluded it on the Norwegian and, and found that there was nothing wrong with him physiologically. So he wasn't drunk or on drugs. He was a... I suppose, sound mind in a sense. Mm. Uh, and then he moves on to dissect the seemingly, seemingly dead uh, thing and uh, finds that the internal organs are, 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 as he describes them, normal, which is, is just like, huh. Creepy. I mean, that thing doesn't look very normal at all, but uh, <laughs> and it feels Dude, like having... they emphasize that by, you know, showing the look on its face. Having right such a it. beautifully constructed, you know, physical effects like that such that they can autopsy them convincingly with blood and flesh going different like some of my favorite things in a movie it's just like you didn't have to do anything else you just had to hit record well, we we notice it in modern stuff when they don't have um an, an example was do you guys remember a show called echo um uh, i don't so there was a there was a part where when her prosthetic leg gets busted oh, up yeah and the guy's holding it they had an actual prosthetic like I think, but they didn't have they didn't have one that was like damaged, so the entire damaged prosthetic leg that he's holding is CGI because they couldn't spring for just banging up a prosthetic leg, so it it was really bizarre to see the fact that this very clear prop that he's holding in his hand that has significance in the story was CGI. It wasn't actually a thing he was holding, and it's like holy shit, my immersion, what little I had at that point of Echo was like shattered. And this guy is reaching in there with his real hands, pulling out this goopy, gloopy, slimy organs and stuff, and he's cutting through the outside skin of it. And you're like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, a, that's an alien from another planet. I believe you, Jonathan Carpenter. <laughs> you have, you have <laughs> Thank convinced you, Jonathan. me. And we need, I just want to know, when will someone do something about this? Why, why are people not talking about the alien invasion in the Antarctic? Where did you get this footage, John? Night has descended upon the station. We see Palmer and Childs are watching, they're watching like TV, but they're watching, it looks like pre recorded tapes that they must have had to bring along with them. Cause, you know, I doubt that yeah. there's any signal in Antarctica. Um, and then you see in the rec room that, the, you know, uh, Clark and Fuchs are playing pool, Windows is reading, uh, Gary, Norris, and Bennings are uh, playing uh, cards. And, and the dog, he, he bites Bennings. Uh, which makes him big mad, and he, he tells Clark, like, hey, can you put him with the other dogs? Um, and Clark obliges. Uh, he, he Wait, did you say dog. that he the dog bites him? He does I, something I think to him. He, he just, just, just gives him. Or... Oh, oh, them. oh, sorry, my bad, yeah. No, yeah, of course, because if he bit him, yeah, that's right, my bad. Uh, he's startled, all right? He's startled about it, <laughs> he's okay? Very he's very, he's on edge. If I can he's just um, be a little bit of an autist again. Because I, I know it's been, it's, it gets discussed, right? Because people get obsessed, okay? There is a shot where uh, Palmer is taking, uh, taking a toke, if you will, and he passes it over to uh, Childs. This is seen as definitive evidence that Palmer cannot be the thing yet. Because uh, the saliva or, uh, and passing over a thing, that would mean Childs would get infected, and he's not by the time he hit the blood. But that's that's a bit of an autism take. It's like I said, it you can entertain it, you can not. I yeah, I guess it depends on how much. If like, it, can the transmission be that minor that it could work, or 
Does it need to be something else? They speculate that, we... that it could be that minor. Uh, we don't know for sure, ultimately. But it it's enough to discuss reasonably. Mm -hmm. But there's no, I don't think there's any clear evidence as if something that small can work. But it could. So. We're also alone to think about at, at this can point. We... Yeah. One other thing, uh, yeah. I, sometimes when you watch these old movies, it unlocks memories. Um, there is a scene where they're playing poker, and they have that poker. It's like a it's like a carrying case caddy thing, where you have the handle in the middle, all the poker chips and the cylinders around the outside, and it's like this brown plastic thing with the cards in the middle. And I'm like, oh man, we used to have an exact one of those. And it was just, it poof, awakens the memories, all the cool little random knickknacks and gadgets oh. from the old, the olden days. Racism check for me or chat. That is Childs, right? That's not normal. That's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's Lawrence Fishburne. No, it's, it's Childs. <laughs> it's Childs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys are the racists, not me. He is. Yeah, yeah, cause he he, yeah, I, 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 yeah, cause, he, cause Knowles is playing pool. Yeah, Knowles is playing pool. That's that's Childs. Yeah, yeah. Childs is he is about to he is not about to accelerate his life. All right, he's about to slow his life down. That is a Navy commercial reference. I realize will not be a global thing. <laughs> Some people are like Very you're right. Not. I am racist. <laughs> they just they just like all right, fine. You got me. Easy, the black one with hair, the black one without hair. Um, easy, the alien. Sorry. Clark uh, puts uh, the the thing dog in with uh, the other dogs, and you see all the other dogs are uh, they're sort of laying about as dogs do, and uh, thing dog just kind of like sits down in a very in a very stiff way. Yeah, it's like, it, it, John, like the way it's that so he's so, sitting, it's so, it's so it dog. really feels like the thing be like, well, I guess this is what dogs do. I, I'm doing <laughs> what dogs do. I'm sitting down. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and he just stares the head straight at the wall too. Doesn't. Uh, it's so yeah, creepy. it's just <laughs> the dog's a really good actor. It is. What's good wrong job, with you, dog? dog. You're being all He's weird. And and uh, yeah, he puts him in, and then uh, clock leaves, uh, and the thing dog begins to uh, transform in front of them, and all, all the dogs they're they're scared. They're very scared of this evil dog. Yeah. They're they're rightfully really scared. Dude, the fact yeah. they got yeah. one of them trying to tear out the metal to escape. I always feel so bad seeing that dog. He's so desperate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sad part of a movie. It's a tragedy. Mm-hmm. And I love the uh, shooting of the um like just just the way that it sits there and it stares and the the guy turns off the lights and it's just kind of left to linger and all the other dogs are resting and Creepy dog is just staring like he's just waiting. It's the it's like shooting blood. Oh, it's so a... gross because it's like, well, you're it's fucked so once you get that shot on you. I guess it's over. Yeah. Um, and how it like the vibrations and then the sound design on the thing. There's, I don't know how else to say it. It's just fucking creepy. This this monster, whatever the hell it is, and that's kind of the point. You don't know what it's gonna do next. Yeah, it's hard okay, to so discern. Here... Here's a question because you just brought it up with like the getting the blood on you. They speculate that a very small amount would be enough to cause an infection, but then also they say, and we definitely see all every um, assimilation that takes place. It's like it's consumed and digested is the word they use, and then it like brings the the foreign cells in and then changes its own cells to replicate them. Right? It's a very sort of like eating assimilating type process right mm -hmm. do we actually think that if you just got some blood on you that would be enough to transform you into the thing honestly no? it feels like that would mm. follow in the sense that it would just take Maybe? ages like if it is it's the thing yeah. seems to be the thing through and through like every cell is uh, the just thing. remember the the autopsy shows even though the outside is super fucked up the organs are human so i do wonder if it's like a inside out process or if it's piece by well, piece it duplicates or depending on what it such that it would pass a test like that i don't think it would come up as the thing uh liver or, or it would come up as a human liver yeah yeah um it's because the, the other bit of evidence would be that computer program he runs but i don't know exactly like how that simulation, like what well, it's, what's you, based well, on. Well, I, I suppose the thing is that something to consider is that Blair basically considers all the dogs to be like a lost cause. Yeah. That's yeah. what he concludes. He he kills them all. 
because uh, mm-hmm. he he figures that you know even though you know because they show a couple of the dogs getting out and those are the dogs yeah. that are sort of hanging around later that he eventually he uh, he gets. Um, so I think I think there's reason to conclude, especially with the way that that simulation plays out, that like that is the way that it works, and it's part of the reason why they don't want to the food thing, right? Yeah, is um is that that's a real concern? Is like oh well maybe if he spits in the food that's enough. Um, it all of be. their assumptions are reasonable. Oh, for sure, intuitive. Exactly. That's the thing. We don't know how much, how many of their random assumptions. Well, they're not random, but how many of the assumptions and the thoughts they have are necessarily true and accurate. But everything they think about is like, yeah, that's something you should be concerned about. The stakes are this high. This thing is a crazy monster from outer space. You need to play it safe and just assume a lot. Yeah, this is one of the moments I always remembered since I'd first seen it. I I remember seeing this and just being like. Fucking hell. What? It's so horrifying. Oh, the way yeah. it writhes, the fact that you can recognize portions, but certainly not all of it. The combination of the effects here in terms of how, again, wet it is, but also the movement is strong. Like, it, it doesn't feel um, like a weak puppet. It, uh, I oh, don't yeah. know, man. Yeah, it's got weight to it. The way that it moves, it feels like it's got... It looks like it has a lot of mass to it it's not too quick like the tentacles that are really tiny they can move around and be really quick but the the big chunky part itself it feels like it's got more weight to it in the way that it moves the lighting around. and there's well. a and, and oh, um, yeah. the flashlights yeah especially re-watching it the one thing that's interesting about kind of how the thing and what it what it is and how it works is that when it first transforms out of the dog is that the head the skin peels away from the face then you see the skull on the inside then the skull falls off and then it's got like the yeah. weird mouthy tentacle thing on it. And then when we see it later, we see that there's like an either another dog attached to the back of it, or it is turning into another creature because you still see the the you know, the where the skull of the original infected dog used this to be. About the algorithmic like horror that is the thing. Like it doesn't necessarily understand when it's panicking or when it's trying to achieve something else exactly. The the body parts are not constructed in a way that's um supposed to match any given creature it's just using information it has and it creates a new form it yeah it's definitely gives it gives you the impression that it just it does what it does whatever the genes are it grows as it goes and whatever it ends up looking like it kind of ends up looking like like it doesn't have a goal of what it's trying to end up being it's just kind of like oh we'll put some eyes over here and an arm here it's just and... expressing itself <laughs> yeah it's true it's very artistic and uh we can appreciate that yeah, okay it's so horrifying. two two little bits of um evidence for the theory that it, it wouldn't be as simple as just getting some saliva on you the one is that clark is licked in the face by the dog and it turns out that he doesn't have any thingness in his blood well and um, bennings also was getting at the beginning and he yeah. he is definitely not assimilated at that point yes I think if it was yeah i think might... if it's on the skin then it can you might be like able to get away with saying that um, Bennings wasn't actually licked, as autistic as you can get with looking at that scene. He, like, the dog doesn't quite make it, but I think Cap's right about Clark. Yeah. And then the I'm other bit of evidence that. That, it, that it's not quite this simple is that if it was that simple, wouldn't the thing just, like, be much more subtle in terms of so spreading itself? Here's the thing. Mm. <laughs> if, uh... Yeah. If it were to jump up onto the table as the dog and then do the shooter liquid in a 360 thing across the room and hit them all while they're doing random shit before they've even figured out anything that's happening, it's like you could argue that's a, that's a strategy, but... Um, it does I, have I, to I'm transform talking, a I'm bit t- before it can do that, though. Well, I, I, that's where I'm going with this. It's like you could argue maybe uh, that's too much of a risk or that it wouldn't want to necessarily... Or maybe, maybe it isn't even fully aware of all the different ways it can necessarily transmit, but... um. You you would think mm. there there are strategies it could take that seem like it would be more useful if it would truly transmit solely by a touch slash a lick of the like yeah. a bare a bare um, ankle for example. And with That's... the and, and I think there is also the element of because it has some level of intelligence it it narrowly escaped the Norwegians it was kind of, it it had luck it had a bit of luck in getting away from the Norwegians so it might be like okay I can't fuck this up yeah like. Trying to be as careful cautious, as fucking being possible. Being careful, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. It looked like the goal uh, here was to infect all the dogs, but it didn't um, manage to pull it off, at least in time. 
Well, that's the conclusion that they draw, essentially, is that they interrupted yeah. partway through, and that if yeah. they had gotten there later, they wouldn't have even known that anything had happened. Which um, which leads yeah, me to so, think if it could just lick all of them, it would then do that. Why wouldn't it just do that? Compared to what seems to be the case, which is it has to get them one at a time because it's kind of a... It's, it's not like an instant process. Yeah, yeah that's I why I'm more, inclined um... to be- I'm more inclined to believe that the... It's reasonable for them to worry that just getting a drop on you would be enough, but I don't actually think that's how it works. Uh, I'm still, I still think there's something to it, uh, especially because the line between, say, for example, a lick versus a slobber versus vomiting liquid onto you, it's like where how much material needs to be on you before it counts. Yeah, well, I, and I not think, every uh, material they... likely has to like because obviously we have our the way that we understand you know biology is not all of our cells can do all of the things. So it's very likely that it can't just lick you. It, there are particular elements of the thing's composition that do that process, not just any part of it that gets inside of you. It would have to be any point. alive cell, I think, would be the logic yes. then. And so saliva so. has Maybe, alive yeah. cells in it. Well, and uh, remember the blood. When um, when uh, Palmer's blood, right? Like, the, the blood kind of tries to run away. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to what end, right? Other than exactly. to yeah, be which... able to protect, right? And, um... If you if there isn't an explicit shot of the dog licking um, Clark, you would still be assumed it would have tried that, like uh, especially with how connected he is yeah. with the dogs. How smart it is, also. Also, how smart it is. That yeah, is, that is also that right. Maybe the dog was smart enough to go like, man, they're probably going to suspect him though, so I should go. What's for funny is, else. yeah, that is actually That's potentially possible. reasonable. That's viable. I, th- I think it is. I think I think the fact that it tried to uh, fuck over McCready and make it seem like he was the thing is indicative of a lot well, of the fact scheming. that the first person the audience and the characters would suspect would be the dog handler. It's, yeah, exactly. It's Clark, which is part of why it's such a cool subversion that it's like, no, Clark was good the whole time. But I mean, that's the thing is, is that that's kind of how it goes for the whole thing, right? Because um, like Palmer and uh, and Norris are never really like suspected ever. Obviously, they're suspected in the same way that everybody's kind of suspected, that everybody has doubts. But, like, the people who are really suspected was Clark Copper and, and Gowry um, for mm-hmm. a significant amount of the runtime. All three of, of whom were definitely not assimilated, which, again, I love that misdirection. It's so great. Oh, and there's that as well, yeah, right? Like, sabotaging the blood. The sabotaging of the blood naturally casts doubt on, um, on Norris and, uh, uh, not on Norris, on uh, Copper and uh, Gowry. Yeah. Uh, though, though, even though, you know, th- there's an incentive to sabotage it anyway because oh, the test. For reference, um, some people might not be following this conversation super well without knowing everyone's names and the events of the film, but I would say this, what we're ha- what's happening right now, I'm almost certain was hoped for by Carpenter. I think he wanted this for people yeah. to be like, it's you. No, it would have been him because of this. It's like, no, he went there and did that. Well, if it works like this and does that, but he'd be like, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be very well, happy. While we're on that, and in partial defense of what I was saying earlier, there's a little blurb off of Wikipedia I think is really interesting that I'd like to read out. It sure. says, uh, as, as part of the thing's design, it was agreed anyone assimilated by it would be a perfect imitation and would not know they were the thing. The actors spent hours during rehearsals discussing whether they would know they were the thing when taken over. Clennon, who is the actor, uh, David Clennon, I think he played Palmer, said that it did not matter because everyone acted, looked, and smelled exactly the same before or after being taken over. So I think this can be interpreted in like a production sense where like you want a good convincing performance from people and you want you tell them as an actor, like you don't know you're the thing, but your character knows you the thing. The character knows they're the thing. So yeah, like I, I think at the very least cool it's a possible avenue of interpretation. And I do, I do, I think, I think that's quite cool because it adds to the horror. Because it's like not only can you not trust the people around you, but you can't even trust yourself, right. your own autonomy. I thought you the reason I mean? that they would have told them that is you get the most authentic uh, version of their character. They're not worrying about trying to portray themselves as a thing version because the thing's version is supposed to be them. Uh, you know, right. unless they have a direction of a particular scene where they want them to act out of character, so to speak. But yeah, I'd I assume the, the, they told them that the in order thing, to get the best performance. Because right. for me, like, the big thing that makes me come to the conclusion that the thing absolutely has awareness of itself is, like, the extent to which it will fuck things up. Um, mm-hmm. Like, and sabotage things. 
I, I suppose I could see a, a way of viewing it almost like that maybe, I don't know, there's... It, it's just like the idea that yeah. the thing knows that in order to cast doubt, it would be a good idea for me to cast doubt on McCready. So I'm gonna go and, and sabotage um and, and make it look like he's he's uh he's uh I mean, it's got stuff to do. I, so can cover me. I truly believe That's like it, it has no interest in or has any function as to not knowing it's the thing. I think it, it always does and it it's always acting on that knowledge. Right. That's yeah, and I and I didn't mean to suggest that the thing doesn't have a constant consciousness and awareness yeah, right, i think right. it does but i'm wondering maybe like if if somebody gets assimilated the thing can decide when to allocate complete control to the imitation and then that imitation completely believes they're the, the person the original person and just the thing lets them act independently but then it can like come in and take over whenever it wants and whenever think, um, the thing is doing some action through that person, it can make that person later forget that they even did that. You know what I mean? I was thinking about a, a, of a quote like that, that you could think about it through the lens of like, well, what, what exactly are we talking about? Like, in terms of like, uh, almost like philosophically, the nature of, okay, well, so it's definitely like an alien that assimilates and, and has like an intent to spread. But at the same time, it has, it, it seemingly displays an awareness I, I suppose it depends because in the in the novella, um, it's it's pretty much made clear that like the thing has like telepathic capabilities of a sort that yeah. it has the ability to understand what other people are thinking. It has the ability to essentially absorb all the knowledge of the person that it assimilates. And so at that point, you're starting to get into those sorts of interesting questions of like, okay, well, if we're dealing with an entity that has a will to spread and multiply, but it has also accumulated all of the knowledge of a person such that it can imitate it perfectly. What exactly are we dealing with as an entity? Like, mm -hmm. how how accurate is it to describe it as being, uh, you know, a, a distinctly different entity or, um, you know, that person, a continuation of that person, but with more of like a malevolent uh, presence? I feel like these are all worthwhile things to be uh, talking about. Hell yeah. Yeah, the idea mm -hmm. that it can absorb from you the knowledge that you aren't the thing and that becomes a part of it so that it essentially loses that like understanding of itself as an interesting concept. Oh yeah. I'm sh again, I'm sure John Carpenter would be happy <laughs> that, that these we'll are the kind about of his movie 40 years ask later it. and I think I'll just, just be happy that people like it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um back in the uh the, the scene with the doggos, all of the guys come in when and they see this happening and uh they start blasting and um and I think I think I think McCready hits one of the dogs and Clark uh tries to stop him because of that. He uh tries to stop him from shooting. He's trying to protect his dogs, even though at this point they're they're doomed. But yeah, uh, I think the one he shoots yeah. is getting like wrapped up by tentacles yeah, or that's something right. like that. And it's so an interesting thing in. because it it plays both ways later when we're meant to suspect him. You can think back to this moment. But he's think, trying oh, to protect the other yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. When um, a much easier read is he's trying to protect his dogs. Yes, it, that's what I'm saying. It works both ways, which I like. Uh, right before this, however, like you can hear the sort of demonic moaning happening, and McCready hears that, and he's like, what the fuck is that? And then he immediately pulls the fire alarm. It's just a nice yeah. little detail. I like that he's quick on his feet. He's like, something is wrong. I don't know what it is. Let's pull the fire alarm. He's a, he's yeah. a man of action, and I quite like all his decision-making. Yeah. He's very much, uh, he accepts leadership that is thrust upon him, as kind of becomes the, basically the case later on in the film. He's a doer, uh, yeah. yeah. He's a man of action. Right. Uh, they, uh, they, they, uh, they, they blast the thing when, it, when it's like trying to jump up on the wall and it's continuing to transform, but Childs has come in with a flamethrower, which McCready told him to get. And uh, they blast it with the flamethrower, which uh, that that kills it. All of the shooting didn't really do anything, but the flamethrower seems to have been very effective, establishing their uh, their weapon going forward, their weapon of choice, flamethrower. Yeah, Fire. you do yeah. wonder, like, what would a bullet do to a creature that does this? Like, it <laughs> it just transform and rearrange its cells and everything. I think it like, really oh, is the well. idea of the fire is like a total destruction, right? It's like yeah, the fire roasts is, uh, it consumed. destroys yeah, the as cells. As opposed to the notion of, yeah, especially if, if the viewers, that all of the individual cells, in a sense, kind of have their own um, 
existence of their own then would shooting the thing in the head would that even do anything necessarily whereas fire just feels like yeah it's pretty this definitive is, um, and brockman said fire is man's oldest foe it is remorseless insatiable unquenchable and they put it out mm -hmm. in the background he's like <laughs> now i'm thinking about the the, the the thing where there was the uh the ride in like springfield and then ken brockman to arty pie what everybody wants to know is my house okay you mean is your giant castle okay kent <laughs> arty don't hate me because i bought at the right time when's my right time <laughs> kent when's my right time uh well, arty pie a... <laughs> contributing to the sort of symbolic cohesion of this movie this like weird shape-shifting demonic monster thing from the depths this foreign strange chaotic demon creature and that they destroy it with fire that fire works against it that's that's a nice little touch you know the sort of purifying yeah. cleansing fire type idea you know mm -hmm. man's first major accomplishment as a as a being fire changed yeah, so everything we, we unlock the technology tree with fire at the core pretty much yeah Oh, you think um, you're a clever little machine? Well, what if I just pour some beer on you? <laughs> ah, who's so clever now? Beer, our second most important invention. So hey, a drunk man with a flamethrower is a force to be reckoned with. The following morning, Blair has taken apart the dog thing, which at this point is barely recognizable as a dog. And uh, Blair starts to essentially relay the first, like, exposition of, of, of the characters essentially having, like, something of an understanding of what this entity is. He says that they're dealing with an organism capable of assimilating and perfectly imitating other life forms. Um, and he believes that they managed to kill it before it could imitate the dogs. And basically that if, if they'd been too late and uh, had succeeded, they wouldn't have even known what had happened, which uh, already at this point, it, it, you know, they've all got to be thinking, right? <laughs> they've all got to mm -hmm. be sort of wondering, hmm, okay, okay. You know, can we talk about the little the I, I it's just another thing like at the end of the pencil. There's that you know those things when when people used used to use pencils. Um, for those for the young people, a pencil is like it's like a little cylinder of wood with like a, a graphite core, and you'd use it to make scribbles and markings. It's a long lost old technology, but in order to erase it, you'd you'd stick on the little the big uh, like eraser tips that would go on the end of the pencils. You guys ever use those? And he's got one on his pencil, and I'm like, yeah. oh, I remember my my <laughs> young days when we would stick those on the end of our pencils because we'd run out of eraser or whatever. They'd break off. Oh, those memories. Sorry, oh, pencil. Yeah. I've never heard of this weapon. How does it work? Pencil. Oh, <laughs> so they used to. So trees, they would like like mulch them down and flatten them into these thin sheets of paper, and you would use the pencil to make like markings on it like like in olden times like the egyptians and stuff and you could like use this to communicate with symbols with other human beings and you could like give them to people and read the writing and you could preserve them in like volumes that they'd call books and it was it it's a shame that the that people don't use that anymore but it was it was really cool it was a really cool old technology very very analog very you know tactile there is a fan theory, by the way, that this is where Blair gets infected. It's just, I'm just th throwing it in for fun, um, um, not for uh, I, <laughs> no. Man, the thing is, is that I, I feel like him destroying the radio room like clears him in a sense. It absolutely oh, does. Yeah, yeah. That, that, see, look at this. This what happens when you don't even hear it out. You don't think the, the theory that. accounts for that, you fools? I, I'm you sure fools. that the theory it's accounts fools. for it in the sense that he could be doing that to make himself nope. appear as not being oh all right yeah so, there you go sit and go down. for it okay, yeah let's let's listen it. to the wonderful yeah, fan theory so all as right. you can see gentle viewers he taps the creature with his pencil and then he moves the pencil to his lips oh my god he's done so mm -hmm. the particles have moved the cells the flisms and so now it's moving through his body developing changing and uh, he all too late realizes the nature of this entire situation, goes nuts, and then they put him in the uh, the shack, and then it overtakes him while he's in there. Fully. I mean, that's an idea, but I feel like the way the way more straightforward one is he is actively working against the thing because he's a human, and then later on when we see him, somebody got to him. That's the regular theory. That's the regular theory, and that's the one I believe. I, that's it's still what I think okay. is okay. I was just yeah. presenting a fun little fan theory. Good I for you. Good I didn't for mean you. to make you so mad. I'm sorry.
This is the moment he got diabetes. Um, oh. It's, it's, fun, it's, it's fun that that pencil thing's there because it could be interpreted yeah, as yeah, a calculated yeah. production move where it's like that's how the cells get transferred or it could be just a quirky actor thing where the guy was just... He, he just probably wanted a prop yeah. to help him like act better or something. I, I need know. something to point with. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and in this scene, Blair is extracting blood from the, the remaining dogs, the, the ones that are still alive. And uh, he asks Clark if he noticed anything strange about the dog... And Clark responds, no, I mean, just, you know, he was just wandering around the camp all day. <laughs> and then Blair, Blair is, is, he's just giving him a look, right? Because Blair, Blair is immediately suspecting what we're all thinking, which, well, I mean, of course, we, we, we know at this point, pretty much. But he's now sort of catching on, like, the dog thing may have infected somebody. And there, there's really, like, no way to know exactly who that could have been. Uh, it feels like the explicit beginning of the... I don't know if I can trust any of you fuckers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> He's definitely looking at him sus, you know? Mm. And it's there's just something, like, yeah. There's, there's something interesting about Clark's performance because, you know, re reading it one way, he's just a little weird and antisocial in some ways. Like, the way he responds to his questions is kind of stilted. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then you can read it another way, obviously, that he's lying and that he's like, uh, you know, a thing pretending to be Clark. But there's just something off yeah. about his performance here that the first time around, it's very easy to suspect him. It's very subtle. Yeah, I do like that. Isn't it yeah, enough for you to believe that that's just how people are. Some people are just like that. <laughs> and uh, now the whole crew is examining the tapes that Copper retrieved from the base. And it looks like the Norwegians found something buried beneath the ice near their, spa uh, their station. Uh, and then Norris figures out where it is on, on a map, and McCready, it was mentioned before, this time, even though the weather is even worse, McCready heads straight out, um, even though the conditions are not great. And they fly out, and when they get there, they discover an enormous alien spacecraft that uh, <laughs> the, the Norwegians were excavating from, from the ice. It is huge. It is very, very large. You've got to show them all. I know, I know everybody knows what it looks like, but still, you've got to so show neat. them how big it is. It's really cool. It's uh, it's a really neat look, and it looks cooler with all of the ice and snow on it than in the 2011 one, where it's all pristine. Even though we've, I don't even know why it would be <laughs> when it was under the ice and covered in ice for so long. But yeah. anyway, the big white shot's um, a really cool map painting. The, I like yeah. that. Honestly, it's a beautiful uh, map painting. Yeah, and it, they, like it looks so good still. When they yep, go right. into it in the 2011, and you're gonna have to help me out on this because I didn't rewatch it. Um, isn't there some kind yeah. of crazy machine in there that's like a bunch of cubes or something? Yeah, it's a bunch of like cubes, yeah. A bunch of little cubes. I remember and seeing that and being like, yeah. CG mess, no, well, sci-fi yeah, bullshit. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. the thing the thing 2011 has aged a lot worse than uh, than the actual thing. <laughs> it's it's not canon. I'm look, sorry, it's Matt's it's painting. <laughs> yeah. Matt, Matt did a good is, job. Yeah. Matt does a good yeah. job. He does good yeah. work. This good Matt job, guy. Man. And yeah, this this is where they say they conclude that that, that must have been under the ice for like at least a hundred thousand years. Um, and then they also uh find the 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 carve the ice you know carved out in a in a rectangle. Which uh, um, that confirms well, the thing was doing a Sauron impression from Rings of Power, and he flopped out onto the snow, and then he <laughs> got all frozen. <laughs> Okay. Oh no! <laughs> God damn! Don't remind me of stupid show. Are you, are you the thing? We gotta. I have had many names. <laughs> Two year fucking grace period. Okay. <laughs> we don't yeah, have to think the, about rings of power. But more people really are cool, talking like, about the thing than are talking about rings of power. <laughs> it's really cool, like staggering this because you know at this point you pre we're pretty decent way into the film, not like halfway, but you know it's it's taken a while it's before to... we even mm -hmm. realize like the true nature of what's going on, and we and we don't. We haven't really learned the true nature of what's going on yet. Uh, there's still a lot more to be uncovered. I just like that it's all, you know, staggered very deliberately. So, um, on the scene where they are roping up to um, start descending into to to go down towards the spaceship, um, there is by having it in the Antarctic, you get a really good built-in reason and forgive me if someone's mentioned this um before we've talked a lot but it gives you a good reason to have a lot of people's faces covered 
yes. um, mm-hmm. in a way that is yeah. not suspicious. Yeah. Because yeah. like you're outside, of course you're going to cover up your eyes, the windows to the soul, as we all know, and you're the mouths and the heads. Everyone's wearing hats and hoodies, and they're kind of it, and it kind of gives them this hidden kind of quality. Yeah, McCready's wearing his hat. He's well, wearing yeah, his he's, uh, big old hat. He's got the hat, and it's like a cowboy hat with the four. Yeah, it's like a goofy yeah. hat, but that's his hat, and you're gonna wear right. your hat. God damn it! Um, correct me if I'm wrong. One of these is the thing, right? Right now. Yeah, Norris. Yeah, Norris yeah. is here, and he's the thing. So yeah, that's so right. fucking interesting, isn't it? That he's like, yeah. oh gee, what's that? <laughs> what's that? <laughs> yeah, oh wow, how crazy! That. <laughs> that'd be funny if it was so obvious and deadpan like that yeah <laughs> he's like, oh my god you guys look it's he fucking pushes one of them off and then the other one goes what the hell and he goes oh my god he slipped oh my god that's crazy oh, oh <laughs> damn my goodness this shit must have oh. been here for nine ninety thousand years it's like actually it's a hundred thousand uh, wow but what's that to, noise? Uh, yeah. rags's point um is, this is especially True for like there's a nighttime scene later before you know before they do the main test where McCready's talking to them all and he's like it could be any one of us and we're doing this slow pan across the group and they all have like you know they're all outside at night so they're all covered up and it's like mm. wait which one is that is that Norris or is that yeah that's right Doc, that, 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 that's after Bennings and it's, yeah. it's it's very much that they've got a whole bunch of things obscured which again. It, it makes sense for the environment that they're in, but you also get the sense, well, this has to be deliberate, right? Because it's making it harder for us to even discern who they actually are, let alone whether or not they're the thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, an yeah, extra layer. When you're, watching it, you're actually like, I'm like, wait, is that Fuchs or is that, like, I, like, I can't tell well, sometimes. So, yeah. um, this is something I was going to bring up once we had hit a certain point, this feels good enough. I have a, I have a feeling plenty of people would have saw this and been like, man, when's something going to happen? You know, like we've got we've got the one scene with the dog going blah blah blah, but like I feel you know, you know it's just a bit slow. And it would be like Damn. that dog scene was fucking. I don't know how you're not wowed already by that. Like exactly, but like so much is always happening, so much information, yeah. and uh, if you can't see kind of where the the movie is going, you know, all this information will be hyper relevant the more we progress as well. Anyway, is kind of what's going. On. Just, uh, yeah, well, some people only count plot beats as like gory, slimy things happening. Which well, is, yeah, yeah, only yeah, action which scenes, any monster scenes. Happen. Yeah, yeah, annoying because now we got another talky scene that's no. good and important, like all of them. <laughs> so they're back at the base, and Childs thinks McCready's story about an alien landing on Earth and getting frozen in the ice like absurd. He th- he thinks it's ridiculous. Specifically, um, anyway. voodoo bullshit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then he, you know, Palmer's like, yeah, it happens all the time, though, and the government knows about it. Uh, which I, again, I find funny that he's saying this when uh, he might be the thing right now. <laughs> like, in fact, it's, it, it seems like he, he he may well actually be because this is where our Knowles comes in asking, you know, like who left their their dirty clothes like in the kitchen trash can. Which um, th- it, it, this is this is before. Um, McCready comes to the conclusion after what happened with Bennings, like, oh, I think the thing, like, destroys the clothes of whoever it attacks. Which is, of course, like, the clue for how they can figure out who's been assimilated. So, like, at this point, I, th- I think we, I think it's safe to conclude, it's like, yeah, a second person has probably been infected right now. Mm-hmm. Unless that was, like, Norris's shirt that he was that's wearing. What I, that's what I initially assumed, that it was Norris's uh, uh, okay. long pants. Right. So I don't know. It's it possible. Could be Palmer, a bit, yeah. yeah. There's a it decent chunk of the movie that we're going to get to in a bit where, like, so many things could have happened. <laughs> you know? And, uh, yeah, a sufficient amount of time passes because, uh, you know, a couple of days go by. So it's possible that this is from Norris. It is possible. But that's that's the thing, right? It's like, yeah, you can never truly know. It's good shit. I like um, I like uh, Palmer being the sort of conspiracy guy who's like, no man, like this happens all the time. The government knows about it. I think there's just something being added there in like the distrust of like institutions that is sort mm-hmm. of on theme with the general sense of paranoia and distrust in the rest of the movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, speaking of which, Childs asks Blair if he believes what McCready is is saying and. And Blair just kind of looks. He doesn't answer. He's uh he's got a lot on his mind right he's, now. As well, he's what you could we'll say be. way ahead of everyone right now. Yeah, pretty much. He he he's already he's already reached the end point. Um, as as we'll see uh in the in the following scene, Blair is in his office and he's running a simulation of the thing, 
Uh, again, this is this is where they play my favorite song in, from the movie. The the song um, in Take this on scene. Me? No, no. Superstition it's, by Stevie Wonder. Oh, it's, it's, uh, oh. He's sitting there and, and he's running a, a a simulation of the thing, assimilating and imitating the cells of uh, organic beings, other organic beings. In this case, the dog. And um, he's just sort of watching. I think I think he's got a, a clock, like a stopwatch, in his hand so that he can like time how long it takes for the assimilation to take place. I think. Am I mistaken? It looks like he's got a stopwatch in his in a in his hand. It's like a pocket oh, watch, stopwatch. Yeah, um, something like that. Yeah, he's got it. A- some because he drops his pen after he sees it, and, and it seems like a fuck that was quick, right? Like, that's kind of the sense I get. I love how it's possibly the lowest graphics we're probably going to get, but it's so effective at translating what, what's happening very, very clear. Exactly. It kind of reminds me of um, through expendable this section, like, it's just this sterile delivery of information from a source that, for, for all we can say, wouldn't you know be completely believed. But in a sense of just like you've just been told it's the end of the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, so here's this is one of the scenes that I is my least one of my least favorite in the movie because I don't feel like it actually adds anything and it really just makes me think like what is this simulation? How do you have enough information to run this simulation such that it can spit out a percentage chance that someone's been infected? Like you don't have all the variables to make that sort of prediction i don't understand that's fair i'm pretty it's... i'm pretty on board with you there i think that this scene if it was just uh if they just went by it can look like people assimilate people it can blend in as one of us then it doesn't it doesn't take a rocket's uh a rocket surgeon will combine the two to make a super smart profession <laughs> oh. but it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to be able to imagine what will happen if it gets back to you know the mainland so to speak yeah, it's, it's the it feels like it's... That it's him doing the work of him of him sitting down and actually trying to figure it out because that's like the yeah. task that he's been doing the whole time. But he could, and he could be the one to like present this concern or worry. Well, um... so I think that this is done to make sure the audience understand why he's going to be doing everything he's about to do. While I think it would be really cool to have had the scene be that he's still staring at the photo and then he gets the gun because we can obviously assume almost all of this. Mm-hmm. It's uh, pretty yeah. straightforward. And then, of course, there's the character himself. If he's concluded it's basically over, and that even if it isn't over, it's going to be really impossible for it to not be over, then uh, there's no point in sharing the information with everybody in a sense of, like, let's figure out this situation. It's more so just, I've got to do everything I can to make sure it does not get to... I was about to say get to Earth, but you know what I mean. you got to show you got to show his face, Blair's face, when he's staring at the computer. It's uh, this very refined very resigned sort of look uh, very much a case of yeah it's over you could uh <laughs> it's definitely a brimleyism that's for sure mm. and the, see, the problem the problem i have because i saw someone in chat say that like this is how we know that like on the cellular level that's how it works and i'm like is he watching something or is this a computer simulation and how is he putting this together exactly i'm that's what i'm sort of confused by I thought it'd be safe to assume that this was something happening on a cellular. I would have level, thought you'd assume that right? anyway. Based yeah. off of the way, I mean, not to be not to be a luddite or anything, but you could tell by the way it looks. Oh my god! What? Wait, what do you I'm, mean? I wait. I think this. No, I think. Sorry, go ahead. Wait, uh, what do you? No, I'm saying that. Okay, so is this is what's happening on screen that sort of technological? You know that. A visualiz- visualization of cells attacking each other. Is that something being recorded or is that something that he's running on a simulation? Um, I guess the answer to that question is I have no clue exactly what the nature of this program is. What it, I don't know either. It could be either from my is view. Is this proof that that's how it works? It's enough to get him to believe it's the case. I think we're meant to conclude that it is. That's the thing. This 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 is what it's well, doing. So this is a like, result it, of him it, with the blood samples, correct? Yes, I think so. The samples, like, from the dog. So we'd have to assume, cells, then, yeah. information has passed through something scientific, and then the computer has generated a simulation to present the information. Based on it. Which in is which case, it would, yeah. That, far that beyond any be. tech they would have there. Look, all right. <laughs> we see it, though. Look at this. Computer, well, no, I'm, go. I'm, I'm <laughs> interested in the critique from a storytelling standpoint, not a technological one. Mm-hmm. 
because yeah. I agree. I think I'm, that this is I'm, unnecessary, but I still I, I don't hate it or anything. I like the visuals though. I like the uh, I like I the visuals like as well. I am um... for the low the low resolution. You know, there's something about it that's quite effective. Yeah, I th I think I liked Mahler's idea of like the idea of playing this off of the guy just staring at the photo for a huge yeah. length of time and then grabbing the gun because it seems clear to me the obvious reason this is here is to bridge the gap between him sitting staring at the photo and then going ape shit, you know, breaking everything. I think it's for the audience as well. I, I just, make sure like, just make sure. Like, but like, I, I like the he's yeah doing this yeah taking that step for the audience. I like the visual clarity of the simulation indicating what's going on at a cellular level yeah. and also the fact that he is explicitly considering the planetary scale of this thing they're not he's not just worried about him and his team in the antarctic i mean you yeah, could, that's what, you could like um, mola said he's well ahead of everybody else yeah like while yeah. everybody's realizing it can even do things to humans and then that we can't trust anyone and then that will this lead to all of us dying he's already ahead to what if it gets out of here yeah. McCready basically mm -hmm. arrives at the same position as Blair, but that's like right at the end yeah. of the film after the generator gets killed. Well, and it's uh, so fascinating as they like, when you get that far, how much do you say to other people? How can you know? What can you do? You know, because well, like, if you tell them, they might work against you. Absolutely isolating to learn all of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, hence, hence he loses his shit quicker than everybody else. But at mm -hmm. the same time, he hasn't really lost his shit. Like he, he's got a point, right? Like, you know, if, if the thing gets out, then they're, they're fucked. So, you know, maybe he needs mm -hmm. to take that decisive action. Which, I mean, he basically goes about it very quickly and, and very mm -hmm. methodically as well. You know, sabotaging the helicopter, destroying the radio room and everything. Yeah. We see uh, McCready in uh, elsewhere examining the tattered clothes that Knowles found in the kitchen. Uh, and then he he gets called over the radio. Copper wants him to collect his stuff because they're moving the dead thing into the uh, storeroom. And so he heads there, Bennings and Windows are moving the dead thing in there where they're going to lock it up. Uh, but then Fuchs approaches McCready and says he wants to speak with him alone, um, as we'll find out as, about uh, about Blair. But uh, they leave, and uh, Windows he says, you know, maybe we should we should burn that dead thing. But um, Bennings reckons that one of them's going to win a Nobel Prize. For having found it, which is um, fair. It feels like famous it's last words, fair. though, because yeah. as soon as Windows leaves, you can sort of see the uh, the 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 blanket, the top over the thing. It kind of like moves a little bit, and then you see it bleeding onto the floor, which is very neat. It really doesn't move much at all. But like, oh, I love that the, shot. It's so good. Yeah, very you subtle. Yeah, you gotta show it. Do it. Oh yeah, they once oh, again yeah. we're playing with the uh, depth of field to it just a little bit. Yeah moving around a little bit and this, uh, this like... comes across as it waiting for the right opportunity to attack right he's sort of been dormant for a while yeah i i like that uh there's certain things you don't see and it's like for betterment of the film like it's very in your face in some ways with like the creatures like there's some shots where it's just like you see the thing full on but there's certain things where it's like um you'll you, you, like you, if you saw Bennings like actually like a tentacle comes at him and then it's like oh and he's struggling with it that would have been less effective. I like that it's so jarring that when you come back into this room, you see him yeah. in such a horrifying state. It's like yeah. jarring. I love the cutting back and forth rather than showing you every single step of like what happens to somebody. Well, there's a lot of horror in what you don't see, which feels like the emphasis of this film. Obviously, seeing the monsters, you know, seeing, like, the thing begin to transform into these horrific forms is um, very startling. A lot of, like, the horror comes from just the general sort of distrust and not knowing what's going on and, and the things that you don't see. The the lack of knowledge is very um, disempowering. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, and it's literally the best of both worlds. When you do see it, it's the scariest shit you've ever seen in your life. And when you don't see it, it's the scariest shit you've ever yes, seen in your life. It's right. top notch. <laughs> what can you say? Full box. Yes, Good is. job. Even when it's in a, a single scene, like the cutting back and forth, like when the guy's in the chair, for instance, you see him just sort of writhing around at first. There's no effects. Cuts to someone else, cut back to him, and it's like grotesque. Mm -hmm. I love that there's like that little gap of not seeing. Because I feel like nowadays, it would just be all done VFX one shot where you just see this gross transformation. Well, like in the thing like, 2011, you know, it, it'd be yeah, one that where direct comparisons of 
like a, a an entity splitting into two from this film to the remake is so sad. Like it's it's just sad. The, mm. the yeah. fucking CG versions suck. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so uh, outside, Fuchs tells McCready that ba uh, Blair locked himself in in his room and refuses to answer. And um, he, he then reads Blair's notes uh, where he wrote that the thing wants to assimilate uh, life forms on Earth and that it needs to be alone with another life form to assimilate it. And he also notes that there was still cellular activity in the burned remains of the dead thing, to which both McCready and Fuchs seem to immediately recognize, wait, shit. <laughs> like, That's not good. Oh, That's shit. less than ideal. Yeah. And then we, we see Windows, he's inside, and he sees Bennings on the ground getting assimilated by the dead thing, which uh, is, is very spooky. It's like, oh shit, um, because yeah. Bennings was in there alone for a while. And, and I mean, it says something, right, that the dead thing knew to wait until uh, it was alone. Like, the, even the dead, seemingly it, unable to move, you know, barely functional one is still sort of clever enough to, to wait, lie in wait, like an ambush, um, and set the ambush. But yeah, uh, Windows sees it, runs outside and tells McCready and Fuchs, but when they go back to the storeroom, Bettings is gone and the window has been smashed. And in <gasps> the shock, the panic, Windows drops the keys. And then, uh, and then they, they run outside because Bettings, they see him, he's, he's shuffling outside and, um, and 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 they all they all circle around him, and and then we see he he turns he turns around and his hands are all floopy, and he <laughs> lets out a guttural howl. Look at him! Oh, it's so is. good. It's like you caught me yeah. right before <laughs> you yeah. fuckers. Now, now I'm gonna scream at you, and then uh and then yeah, McCready sets him on fire, uh, knocks over the 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 barrel and then throws the flare at him and he goes up in flames and they're all watching because because now it's like oh well shit now everybody understands yeah. everybody gets it now everybody's on the same page they know what's going on yeah and i love the colors in this sequence there's like it's just so vibrant you know even for something that takes you know, place time yeah it's nighttime it's such a bleak setting but you can see what's happening movies used to be able you know you could see what was happening in movies at night it was fun i remember movies yeah. yeah. <laughs> and up he goes. And then McCready uh, grabs a, a flamethrower as he explains to Gary that the thing was attempting to imitate Bennings. And, and Gary, he falls silent for a, a bit. And then, and then he says, like, well, no, but ben Bennings is my friend. Uh, and yeah, this is like, them, I like, for 10 years. To, to continue, like, destroying him. But McCready, McCready is, like, unmoved. He says they got to incinerate him. Yeah, and 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 that's what they do. They go outside. They they dig like a, a a trench, and they put him there. They put the dead thing there, and then set it ablaze. Um, and while while that's happening, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, Blair's not here, uh, because he's still locked in 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 his room at this point. But and then, there's a nice wait, yeah. really quick. There's a nice detail yeah, when they're perfect. burning everything else. And um, McCready asks if that was all of them, and Norris says, "There's nothing left." <laughs> Norris, though. Norris, you sneaky little <laughs> sneaky little hole. <laughs> Norris, he is, yeah. So, uh, they're still outside, and Fuchs says that uh, to McCready that he can't find Blair, uh, and that Windows is still trying to contact other stations, and the rest of the crew is in the rec room, and and then they 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 turn around and they they see they see Blair, um, like the, the, uh dismount from the helicopter and run away. Uh, and then when they go up to the helicopter, they realize he's destroyed it. Like all of the all of the gear and equipment, like the dashboard and everything, is uh is uh fucked up. So it's it's like oh shit. And then they hear a gunshot coming from inside the station. They run back in, and um they find Blair rambling as he's taking an axe to all of the radio equipment and destroying the crew's means of contacting the outside world. And then Childs lets him know as well, the tractor has been sabotaged, so he's been a busy bee. Yep. Like, while all of this has been going on, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's screwed them all over, basically, but saved the world almost certainly in the process. I suppose what's interesting is that I think, I think we have to conclude, like, that the thing would need to get to McCready in order to fly the helicopter. Mm-hmm. 
So I mean, it's kind of a case of, like it wasn't in a position to escape yet, but now it's it's fucked. I like the idea that the thing knew it needed to be pretty careful as a result of it probably went a bit nuts with the prior team, and but mm. the, with this one, and it's just like fuck. One guy has already concluded what is very logically going to happen, and so. But well, like, I guess the skipped. problem is that the the thing the thing can't cooperate with other things, right? Bennings, like that was not good for him, but yeah. I mean he can't tell the dead one, hey, don't do that. Because they can't work together, really. Or, or maybe Where... it's that they they could, but like they don't seem to. We don't see much of like a. There's no. There's no evidence even of a scene where they like plan things. No. I'd be well, curious if the humanity. thing, generally speaking, <laughs> wants to be as much of a single entity as it can be. Like that's the preference. Which is interesting, considering which is ironic. Nature is creating multiple yeah. entities. That's an interesting dynamic. If that's the only reason I, um, I bring that up is the ending where it seems to put uh, Knowles and Gary and Blair all into one entity. Yeah. Seems where you like think, it. like, wouldn't it be more strategic to split them up? But would it be strategic to split them up if they all have different self preservation instincts? Yeah, exactly. And they have different agendas and different goals, mm. uh, which it seems like they do. Especially if you conclude that Childs was uh, the thing at the end, because in that case, he has a very different agenda to Blair at that moment. We can talk about that later, though. We'll get there. Oh, and so, apparently uh, I was wrong. It was Cooper who says there was nothing I left. Was, uh, well, then I was wrong. Wow, you yeah. lied? Does John Carmenton uh, do know. this? Are you the thing? Not. Are you, are you <laughs> thinging <laughs> us? Are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Childs <laughs> lets him know. Oh, sorry. No, I was just saying, no, it doesn't matter. Child, uh, he lets him know that the, the tractor has been sabotaged and all the dogs are dead. Um, which, uh, Clark, like, he, he runs off to, to find out, basically. That's, like, the number one priority for him right now is finding that out. And, um, but while that's happening, Blair is screaming, the thing wants to be human so that it can escape and assimilate the entire planet. Uh, and then McCready and crew jump in and subdue Blair. Uh, before attending to Windows, who himself got wounded by uh, by Blair during this whole encounter. So, yeah. they got him, but, like, he's already fucked up all their equipment, so, you He know. does a really good <laughs> job, too. Like, not only of fucking everything up, but also put it up with, like, a team of guys coming to get him. Getting him, yeah, he's still doing I... it. He's, uh, he's determined. Well, one of the things I really like about this scene is that, like, yeah, this is how kind of, like, clumsy and dangerous a real fight is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There's there's yeah. like chaos and it's not organized and um, I actually was thinking there's um there's that part where he takes the fire axe to the table because when he throws the gun and he's out of bullets which always fun yeah. when he throw the gun um, yeah he uh, McCready comes in with that table as a shield and the axe goes through it through it and I'm like thinking oh shit like Mel Gibson might he could have died <laughs> like, <No>. holy shit <laughs> that's oh, like good damn thing. good thing Mel Gibson didn't die guys. <laughs> I'm really glad Mel Gibson didn't die <laughs> when dangerous. they were shooting yeah. cuz cuz when you see it go through it's like oh yeah that's real they actually did that that's like a good thing they really did so yeah. it's just uh Are, yeah did you mean me rags do you know that, that you, you do know this is Kurt Russell right Oh is that oh yeah Kurt Russell <laughs> I get him I listen listen How the fuck do you mix I actually those two get the two the I I actually well, you get the two. You actually weren't me. You mixed up how? <laughs> I just mix up the names. I just mix up Kurt Russell, Mel Gibson. I just constantly mix up the <laughs> names. I don't, I don't know why. They don't even look remotely the same. Yeah, I, I know. too mix it's up just, Morgan Freeman do. and Christopher Lee. They, uh, oh my god! They're just too similar. Oh, well, that one's pretty understandable. But mine right. is mine's <laughs> odd. I just for I, I just I mix up their names. I just mix up their names. <laughs> All right. Holy shit! <laughs> Mel Gibson. <laughs> Mel Gibson almost died in the well, Antarctic. That's how dangerous the scene was. Yeah, it, I know oh, it yeah. almost killed Mel Gibson. To be to be clear, if this if the thing escaped and infected humanity, Mel Gibson would have been killed. Yes. Uh, now now I'm just thinking of Kurt Russell and Mel Gibson movies like Braveheart, like him as William Wallace and stuff. You know what? You well, probably would have done a good job. Kurt Russell's yeah. great. I I mean, look at him. Yeah, you see him here. He's got the beard Kurt and the Russell hair. And... Yeah, yeah. Ooh, actually, hey. Listen. Sounds Kurt good to Russell me. Let's give it a try. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember his name. The guy, yeah. Who knows? That, that's his name, Patriot. Um, <laughs> Benjamin Button. In any case, Clark, uh, <laughs> Clark finds what? out that the dog goes, uh, what, what? Huh? 
Benjamin Franklin. You're in the, no, that's the why clock. I said Benjamin. You, you found out about the doggos. <laughs> that's sad, and you're here laughing. Uh, Benjamin true. Franklin and Benjamin Button, I get them mixed up a lot. Also, <laughs> ah. Breaking Benjamin. I get the three of them confused a bunch. <laughs> Shut up, Mel Gibson. But, uh, yeah, the, the, the doggos, Black killed him. Clark is horrified by this discovery. It's, it's, I mean, understandably it's so. What I find yeah. it's, uh, interesting, too, is that um, an axe to the head of a dog thing wouldn't actually kill it, from what we understand. Uh, no, it point seems being, like the dogs were actually fine. Yeah, um, but I would still yeah. defend that probably was an okay choice from him, because one, they could always turn into the thing, they're ready to go if you don't kill them, and two, at least that would tell you. As in, like, you hit them and oh. it goes, blah, 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 blah. you'd be like, oh, well, that's a three, thing. They're, three, they're sled dogs. So that's, oh, that's a good transportation point too. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Yeah, that's true. That's true look at actually. that. That's look at point, look at yeah. look at this film. Look at it go. Wow, yeah. this movie isn't shit after all. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah, Roger Ebert. God damn it. Well, he, <laughs> he didn't say it was shit. He said it was two and a half out of four. Same as the thing the way, in 2011. The unlike four star a rated for system, dying this. feels so odd to me. That is strange. Yeah, that when four, someone says to you, "I'm rated," I, I gave it two and a half stars. You're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" You're out of four. You're like, "Oh." Oh, is so it like, that's, you trying to right. so that's like a you trying to have like your own or... fun little system? Because everybody uses five or ten. Yeah, because five is what everyone some... uses. So... Cap, I but feel like you know the answer weird. to this. What does Letterboxd use? Is that four or is it five? That's five. Five. Everybody five and ten seems five. like the way everyone yeah. does it. Um, except for I hotels. Mean... Hotels are four stars. Right. No, no. hotels are five stars. I thought, Forbes, I thought hotels could be five stars. Yeah. Are you that's sure? true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah five I'm, star I'm very hotel. Sure. Yes. I was about to say five star thing. hotel yeah. feels like a As, thing, doesn't it? Well, here, I yeah. my first my first gig was in a Forbes four star hotel, and five stars is an option, but the higher you, you go, it's that? just. I am one hundred yes, fucking I percent <laughs> sure. I'm as someone who worked in the job. hotels. Yeah, oh, they, well, they I gave me the reasons why they don't for it. Five star hotel is just a colloquialism for a very, 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 very nice hotel. Yes, that's it's definitely like a five star a, a Forbes rated hotel. Is there is a reason why they're so rare? Because of all the amenities and services and things that you have to provide to keep up. Do they have standards? their own Michelin it's... guide to establish, you know, a hotel as being yes. five star. Yeah, yeah, the Forbes, uh, the Forbes standards, and I think there's one ah. for Europe, like the Condé Nast Johansson something. But um, that's not. Yeah, right. Forbes is in with typically the one. That's detailed used. knowledge of the hotel. Hell yeah! You know, Why do you think we have I them around? It's not for the Mel Gibson yeah. references. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> Because when I asked that once when I was there, I was like, so why don't we go and try to be a five-star hotel? Oh, we're, God, we were the only... Sorry. Someone in chat has just said something that feels like it has to be said. Have you never heard of the colloquialism? <laughs> you fucking <laughs> Google man! <laughs> You're a liar. Sorry, Rex, go ahead. <laughs> oh, it's it, the, when I asked why we don't become a five-star, the answer was essentially twofold, being that one, we were the only four-star hotel in Arkansas at the time. And in order to go from four star to five star, it would cost so much money. You need so much stuff and expenses to keep up the standards that it just was not feasible and it wasn't worth it. Because what's the point of being a five star if you're already the only four star? And four star hotels are really nice, but it just wasn't worth it. So All right. five stars All are right. real. They're out there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so the next day, the crew lock Blair up in the, cho in the tool shed. Um, Blair says he doesn't know who he can trust, which McCready very much uh, gets. And then, um, and then McCready tells uh, Blair to trust in the Lord, and then Blair tells McCready to keep an eye on Clark, which, of course, at this point, you would already understand that that's something that he was wondering, but now it's being made explicit, you know, all eyes are on Clark yeah. as being the a dogs, uh, yeah. likely candidate Dog because man. of the dogs. Yep, he went and killed the dogs. Who watches the dogs? Clark, he has the most contact. Pretty intuitive, but smart. Yep. And he's concerned enough to tell McCready. And I guess that means at this point, he, like I said, like, eventually he trusts McCready, I guess, enough to tell him that. I, I suppose, yeah. It might as well say it if, if he thinks that... I, I think the reason would be that you have to assume that there are some humans still in the uh in the group right so like yeah. you tell one of them it's likely that that's going to be a thing that gets around to all of them since obviously at this point now that he's trapped he he now has to pass that responsibility on to someone else to uh to keep an eye on things but that's uh that's the last scene that we see with blair where again it seems like from cap and, and my opinion that he is a human at this point this is the last time that we 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 know that for well, sure with that fan theory he would be human here as well 
Right, sure. That's true. That is true. But that's the last time that we see Blair as a human, and they walk outside, and this feels like another shot to emphasize how much they, they've obscured all of their identities, even when, you know, it's just them having a conversation with each other, because they're all wearing goggles, and they've got their hoods on, or beanies. It's very hard to tell who's who. I keep mixing up uh, Dr. Copper and Norris sometimes. They, I feel like they look the most similar in my head. Um, Copper and Norris? Well, so, that's interesting that you say that. I'd say it's easier to confuse Copper with Blair. Blair and yeah. I'd still say it's not super easy to do that. But it depends on what they're wearing. Because in this scene, I'm pretty sure it's we've got uh, we've got McCready, obviously. Uh, Fuchs. I think it's Childs in the middle there. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's Copper and it Gary. Is. That's the that's all of the the guys here. And so they're having a conversation about it, um, essentially laying out kind of like their predicament that they have to deal with. That their only option is to hunker down and wait until they're rescued in spring. But um, McCready retorts that at least one member of the crew must be infected. Uh, and then Childs raises the kind of pertinent question: Well, how could we know who's human when the thing is capable of perfectly imitating them? And McCready asks if there is some kind of test that they could conduct. And Copper mm. says, we could take a sample of everybody's blood, mix it with uncontaminated blood, and see if there's a reaction. And then Fuchs says, I've got a lot of blood in storage. And McCready says, all right, keep an eye on Clark. He was, he was close to the dog thing. Um, and as they're sort of breaking up, Fuchs says, well, we need Blair's help to do this. But McCready says, no way, he's too far gone. We can't... Uh, we can't, we can't let him out, which I think is a fair response. You let him out, he's going to attack you straight away. It's, um, he, he kind of is, if, if they all have an interest in surviving, they can't let Blair out. And it's just all very logical, right? Mm -hmm. Like, everybody's asking all the right questions and... Well, if everybody wasn't retarded, we wouldn't have a plot, so it's okay that uh, they're yeah, stupid. I mean, in this case, they're all really smart, but the problem is that they're finding things out later than, like, they don't, they're not omniscient. They don't see everything that we see. Part of yeah. what makes things difficult for them is that it's already kind of a bit too late because I've already got one person so who's been infected. The the thing in Predator is that these enemies are real tough to deal with. These exactly. are not easy. Well, it's, you know, de developing the test, right, as well as the thing having an awareness of that being viable, as we see, because they find out that somebody has sabotaged their uncontaminated blood. They open the door and, and, and all the, the blood bags have been destroyed. All mm. of the blood is, is, is uh, out. And everybody comes in. And uh, something that they notice is that the lock is undamaged. To which Copper says, well, he's the only one who has access. And Gary says he's the, he has the key. Um, and, and they ask, like, well, would the test have worked? And Copper is uh, he's quite sure... Um, that it would, and then Gary says that somebody could have stolen the key from him, which prompts an argument between the crew, which I'd like to sort of break down the things that are said and, and done uh, before we sort of talk through it, because a lot of things happen really quickly, but all of it's really interesting. Like, Gary gets very defensive when Childs is like, oh, come on, someone stole the key from you, get real. Like, he gets really, really mad at that, which, uh, of course he would, because he's a human, and uh, and even if he wasn't, he would get mad about that, because... That's like the best argument that can be made is that someone took it from him, which we have to conclude is definitely what happened. And there's, uh, a, desper would... there's a desperation in his eyes too, because yes. he he realizes that that's not playing very well. No, but that exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and Windows is backing up while this is happening. Like he's very, he's like, oh shit. Uh, and then Clark, the second he says anything, uh, multiple people jump on him. Like Childs runs up to him and and lunges at him. He barely even gets to finish his uh his thought before everybody's on him because they all suspect that he's he's the yep. thing. Um, and then uh, Gary says that Copper is the only one who had any business with the blood. Uh, but then Copper's like, well, yeah, but Gary, you could have done it. You had the key, which of course is a really valid point. And then probably my favorite point that gets made is that Childs, he, he says like, just because Copper thought of the test doesn't prove anything. Like that doesn't prove anything. Um, which feels like already getting well ahead. A dumber writer would have that be compelling to people, but like a real storyteller would go, well, wait, somebody would be smart enough to know that just because he said that doesn't prove anything. The thing right. could say that. Yeah, but, or someone might even, someone in the group might be convinced by that and mention it, but it doesn't have to be a unanimous, unanimously exactly. agreed upon thing. Well, yeah, it's, it's a good strategy. Yeah. It's a good strategy for the thing because 
even though Charles points out, like, well, yeah, just because he said that doesn't prove anything. Like, on a subconscious level, you'd be like, yeah, yeah but like, would he do that? Like, you're would the buying thing do time. That? Yeah, if, if you're the thing and you if you are instrumental in coming up with a process, it buys you time to be kind of, quote unquote, safer to do stuff later. Exactly. It's uh, and of, and of course, it's really cool that the thing, because the thing doing this, um, either Norris or or Palmer, I think it's safe to assume at this point. I mean, or, or at least Norris, um, like this is you want to sabotage the blood anyway because the test is probably going to work. But then also, you've just got that. Yeah, I mean, this cast out on Copper and Gary, both of whom we later learn are definitely not assimilated. There's uh. A lot of interesting things are happening here because, like, you can't help but feel bad for Gary this sequence because uh, it's so sus. Like for him, but we, so we know sus. he's actually clear. And then yeah. the the story of the keys is that Gary would have had them. Um, Windows would have got them off him. He would have seen the thing, dropped them, and someone would have picked them up at some point. And then it would have been moved again back to Gary finding them slash not. It, the, the one thing that's curious about this scene is he doesn't reference giving the keys to Windows. Yeah, that's what no. I was about to ask. How does he get them? Because he, it, it was said that he, he would have gotten them from him. So either he forgot, and, and that actually explains Windows panicking, because he's realizing they might turn on me in a second, because I was one of the last people to yeah. have the keys. Mm. Um, oh, that does make sense, actually. I didn't think yeah, that. that's right. And, and then he does the logical next step, I suppose, with the panic in mind, which is he runs over to grab a gun. I mean, it's so... Um, it's just like, I want to feel safe. I want to have a gun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't. But, uh, unfortunately, he's not quick enough because Gary gets there with his gun and, and stops him. Uh, but the whole thing is... It's, I mean, it's it's really tense because, like, Windows is so reluctant to, uh, to um, you know, like disarm himself well, it's just, um, and then even we have yeah. the benefit of the foreknowledge of, of what what's going to transpire but at this point it's like holy shit is windows is is that guy is gary is it, and, and we're getting the same experience yeah. all the characters are i don't fucking know who the thing exactly. is yep you are so it's it's one of the great accomplishments of this movie is really getting you into the same mindset as all the characters discovering things as they are having the same paranoia as them not knowing who's who sharing in that distrust it is something that so many films and shows completely fail at, and this one mm -hmm. does a great job in. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's it's a difficult thing to write. Like when you have a small space with so many characters, and they're all in intelligent, and they're all they all have different uh, goals. Um, well, I mean, not not they all have different like personalities and stuff and you have to anytime any one person says a thing you have to factor everybody's reaction to that one thing and then as soon as another line gets said it's like you've got to consider it from all those different perspectives like just because it all takes place in a single location that doesn't mean that it's easy to write you know it's a lot of and factors also, a lot of angles yeah it's also one of the few scenes so far where everyone's been in the same place um, mm -hmm. There's this one, and then there's when everyone sees the body on the, like, the weird, mis deformed body on the table. For the most part, as in the whole first half of the movie, they're not all together in one spot. But this is when everything kind of comes together, and this is where the sort of drama boils over for the first time. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. The one in the uh, chat as well, I just think it's kind of interesting. They said, the, the movie has key people lose their purpose in their roles. Gary relinquishes leadership. Windows removed from communication. Blair loses his sanity and rationale. And Clark loses his dogs. Like all of their oh, that's really interesting. purpose yeah. and roles yeah. in the camp are all just getting stripped away and destroyed. And thought, that's... Huh. That is an interesting mm. observation. In terms of summarizing it, yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, it, McCready... It, it's it's like McCready is sort of naturally showing his leadership qualities, right? Because he's trying to defuse the confrontation. Gary doesn't want to disarm himself, but which, recognizing, um, yeah. Which, by the way, is a it's a very natural kind of thing. A lot of the times, leaders just sort of that that is a personality trait that sort of emerges under stress. That's something that just kind of comes out in people when it needs to happen. A lot of people don't consider themselves leaders. They don't consider themselves like you know, affirmative go-getter doers, but then when the chips are down, or even, even in casual settings, even when you're playing a video game, you have that one person who starts to, you know, call the shots is what the team should do. 
is like it just kind of happens mm. there's that part in people and the fact that mccready who's kind of the loner um that just it just is natural of his personality to do things to take action he steps up maybe without even realizing that he's doing it in a way i think i think it's just... that he realizes after it's happened because you know, know. gary's like yeah you probably feel better if someone's in charge Gary says Norris, which is pretty funny when he's definitely the thin thing here at this point, almost certainly. <laughs> um, that like he's totally he's yeah. flown under the radar so successfully that like it's actually suggested that he be in charge when he's he's definitely assimilated. Um, and then Childs is like, "Yeah, I'll be in charge." Wait, oh, well, you're missing, immediately. A, sorry, you're yeah. missing a great detail: is yeah. that Norris declines. He does. He says, I'm, yeah, he says, I, I'm not I ready for that. But if you think about his strategy, he's like, no, things are going well when I'm flying under the radar and <laughs> yeah. no one's paying attention to me. That's, if I'm in charge, yeah. it's harder to like slink away and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, that's It is. And then Charles is like, all right, I'll be in charge. And then fucking Clark just jumps in front of him with a knife like, nah, bro, you're not in charge. And McCready as well, like immediately goes and grabs a gun, which I find very interesting. That, that their conclusion, like multiple people, like you are definitely not going to be in charge, right? And and it's like how much that has to surely stem from like their perception of his character, right? Rather than whether or not he's actually being assimilated. Yeah, yeah, because it was um when uh uh, uh Blair when Blair said to look out for Clark, it was because of not because of his personality or anything. It's because of his proximity to the dogs and their exactly. infection with everyone else. It's just like yeah, it's Clark. You know, he's kind of weird. Yeah. So the different reasons why people do it and kind of talking about the McCready thing, how he kind of steps up to the plate here and assumes kind of that leadership uh, role that is very emergent naturally of a personality in people. But it's also a reason why people would be suspicious of him. Yeah, it's interesting that they don't immediately put him forward. You know, no, that's no right. one thinks of him immediately. But he, I think he sort of he's off on his own. Him. They're maybe not sure how much they can trust him, but then it's sort of like a default, like, well, he is a pretty good leader. He's good under pressure and all that sort of stuff. Well, most people aren't leaders. It is, there is an element of, you know, the human psyche, which is like, <laughs> oh, someone's taking up the responsibility and doing it and calling the shots and everything. Like, oh, that's, that's good. It's, it's good. It's a good thing. It alleviates feeling to have your sense of responsibility. Kind so, of, yeah. It's a push and pull, really right? Yeah. More power, but more yeah. responsibility. Not to Spider Man, exactly. but that's kind that's of how right. it works. Well, yes. That's, yeah. I mean, that's how it works. It is. Um, but yeah, McCready is in charge. And it's pretty clear without anybody saying a word that he's, he's in charge. And uh, so they go outside and they, they, they burn the sabotage blood bags, which is a good idea, I would say. <laughs> a pretty good idea to do that. And um, McCready is explaining, you know, well, I know I'm a human. Some of you must be humans because if you're all the thing, you'd attack uh, me. Which I guess is interesting as an observation that the things won't work together necessarily, but like the thing seems to be able to tell who's the thing. I think. I think it's. I think. I think there's reason to assume that that's the case. That the thing knows who's. A human I think that's reasonable, not. but I don't think we get Probably. any explicit reference. We would just assume that's the case. Yeah, the, and and the idea being, well, if everybody had been assimilated and McCready knows that he's, you know, not assimilated, it probably is reasonable to assume that they would all just attack him at this point because, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what's That's... interesting? If they were all the thing and then they got McCready, it would, you'd have a whole different film of, all right, guys, we did it. So how are we getting to, uh, how yeah. we getting to Earth? How are we getting <laughs> to the population? How are we going to do this? It's like, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tough. It's... And, uh, well, it's still it is... <laughs> It is unironically interesting to see, like, I know it's a bit of a meme I mentioned, like, Among Us, Trouble in Terrorist Town, mm. and, you know, games like that, and then you watch this movie, and you're like, oh, like, when you see it out, you know, quote-unquote, out in the wild when people are playing games with imposters and traitors and things, a lot of the things that people do to win those games are just naturally emergent from this stuff that you see in this movie and how people play out. Um, like, obviously, if you're McCready and you know that you're you're good to go, you're innocent, you're not the traitor, blah, blah, blah. And you know that of the other people, that, that, that that'll influence your decisions, which can make you more suspicious. But I recall instances where, like, if I was, if, like, if there's three people in a TTT game or whatever, and you know that you're innocent, and there's one traitor left, and there's two other people, you could be like, whichever one of you isn't the traitor, if you kill the other one, we win the game. Just to be clear, I'm telling you right now, that's what will happen. And sometimes it wins games or not, but... Um, it's it's cool to see that human element that comes through even in video yeah. games uh, well, like, of a similar you know style. The other thing I like about it, which this film acknowledges, is the you can take references for certain actions as like evidence of a motivation, but then you can take it as evidence of a bluff of that motivation, 
or a double exactly. bluff. And it's like, fuck. It's what makes it impossible to figure out who who's who because, like, you know, there's a reason. It's like, oh, well, Gary had the key, so he could have done it. But it's like, yeah, but the thing could have done it and made it look like it was him. You know, or like, well, Copper suggested the blood test. It's like, yeah, but I mean, you know, if if, if the thing had assimilated Copper, that would be pretty good to do, right? To make it seem like you're trying to help. Um, and hell, you could even apply it to even in a, even wow Blair would probably be pushing it too far if you were trying to make that argument because he is like really sabotaging himself if he's the thing you know yeah so to what it end seems unlikely when, not impossible but unlikely. not impossible but highly unlikely um so. it just doesn't yeah, yeah doesn't what really is the go. possible advantage he could have got from that yeah because like all it does is make it harder for him when you know enough time passes he can become suspect again you know, a day or two mm -hmm. is enough where it's like, well, that action means nothing now because you could have been assimilated. So, yeah, you know, one, it's, it's something to think about. One little piece of evidence that maybe Palmer is the thing by this point is the fact that in all this, he says absolutely nothing. Mm. Yeah, same same strategy as Norris. Yeah. Flying under the radar. And he's a he was a chatty Cathy in a lot of the other scenes. So, <laughs> yes, he was. Thank you. Yeah. Uh... The the idea of the thing being able to identify other things is interesting because I would think that uh, there is some collective consciousness at play where if you just had two things alone in the room, they'd both look at each other and be like, we we know what's up. We, we both know what's yeah. thing. But uh, <laughs> no, it'd be I much funnier. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if they both shot out their tentacles and like, oh wait, <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh, what? oh, you're oh, this whole time, oh my god, dude, I had no win. idea. What? No, I didn't know either. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what, on, on that point, I think one of the initial endings that was considered is that Childs and um, McCready are both the thing. Yes. Which, which would make that last scene not work, right? Because if they were both the thing, then there would be no need for them to talk to each other. So it's interesting to think about what they, the cast I mean, and crew, thought about how all this worked. And I think it was it, like a process throughout the entire... You it's know, interesting that you say that, movie. John. Because I think that some people do speculate that both of them could be the thing at the end. Well, hmm. like, we should we that, should just wait, possible. but both, neither, and yeah. one of they're all good theories. Yes. Uh, in any case, in this scene, um, the conclusion that that McCready has come to is that the thing uh, doesn't want to show itself, but it would rather hide in its imitation because it's vulnerable out in the open, which... By the way, again, I'm sorry to compare it again to the thing 2011. This Do is it. like such an important thing in terms of like nerfing the mm -hmm. thing. It's like it can be killed. Um, and it's kind of like not too hard for humans to do that if they have weapons. Um, whereas the thing in that movie is like super duper strong and fast. Um, yeah. To where it makes you wonder why it would even hide. Like it's, it seems like it should be pretty easy yep. for it to win. Um, unlike Absolutely. this one, where it's a lot slower and harder for it to uh, to enact any action. Yeah, in the 2011 one, like it just like stabs people and kills them like pretty yeah. instantly, and quickly. Around. It's yeah. like so like it, you can't help but think like, oh, why didn't it just do this to everybody exactly. in the John Carpenter one? That's kind of weird. Maybe it's it the got... reason why I find oh, it very oh. easy to treat that film as non-canonical, which I yeah, do. Yeah, it just doesn't act like it's the same <laughs> creature. Uh... <laughs> that didn't happen. Um. And now, now they say, if the thing takes over the crew, it'll have no enemies, and it'll be free to take over the world. But uh, in six hours, the storm is a storm is going to hit the base, and the crew will have to figure out who is still human. And uh, McCready makes the choice to separate Copper, Gary, and Clark from the group, uh, since he suspects them most of being infected, which of course is very interesting when none of them are infected. And, like, act absolutely none of them are. They're all mm -hmm. humans. Which is like, man, talk about a misdirect. <laughs> like, yeah. how wrong they got it. <laughs> really successful um, misdirection. In this yeah, movie. as long as it's reasonable for him to think that, then it's, well, it's, it's just the there's, there's you know? good evidence against all of them. Clark spent the most time alone with the dog. Um, mm -hmm. Copper and Gary were the ones who had the easiest access and means to destroy the blood. So, that, what you're saying is the thing is real fucking happy right now. He's oh, thrilled. Yeah. yeah, he's pretty happy. I mean, I guess he's still big mad that Blair destroyed the, the, the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's like he said, if they patient, they can wait until spring, and then they'll be good to go. Um, and then uh, Fuchs says, well, I need Copper's help, and McCready says, like, nah, no way. And uh, they get brought inside, and um, Copper, Gary, and Clark are injected with morphine to subdue them before they're tied to the couch. 
and then uh, and then we have a a time jump. Um, McCready is sitting in his uh in his in his room, and he, he says it's, it's been about forty eight hours since the storm struck. So that means from that last scene to now, you know, like two days and a little bit. Um, it's been two days, and the thing he he notes because he's holding the uh, destroyed clothes, it appears to destroy the clothes of whoever it assimilates. But the name tag is missing, probably on purpose. So nobody knows who's been infected, and consequently, nobody trusts anybody. And McCready recognizes he uh, can do nothing but wait. Yep. Very, uh, very much a case he, of we have cropped um, into a new territory now. The aspect of this that I love that, that is also reflected on those games, like uh, Rags is mentioning, is there is that fundamental knowledge that everyone knows everyone has, as you know, if you're human. But that doesn't help a lot, else, does it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, exactly. I'm human, damn it. You're like, I assure you are. You're like, yeah, no, shut the fuck up, I am. That, <laughs> I, um, I really like this, uh, this, this scene, like this sequence uh, where Fuchs is in a lab and McCready walks past and like he walks in and Fuchs, like he's startled. He turns around like, oh shit. It's very much a case like, man, the paranoia, huh? Like you're, you're like scared that somebody's even just come in to talk to you. That's how bad it's gotten, you know. Look at him. He goes Look to grab um, that. I wonder what that is. I, I wonder if it's like it could be used defensively. Or whatever he's about to grab there, maybe more yeah. than just, I just to smash it. it, you know. Like it's uh, one of those uh, dual focus shots too that they, that gets spliced. So like, like uh, yeah, uh, and it adds oh, yeah, to yeah, like the sort of unease to the the scene. I think. Yeah. Yeah, there's a few of them in the movie, and they don't come in until pretty late. I think this is one of the first ones. If I don't know if it's the first one, but uh, split diopter shots, they're called. Yeah, split right. Because they've, they've taken advantage of the depth of field before. Um, both of the times that it comes to mind are when the human characters are in the back and in focus, but up closer is the blurry thing. Mm -hmm. either alive or dead. So, Cap, because I feel like you'd have a better uh, knowledge of this. When you do the split diopter in a lot of movies, you'll often notice a very obvious blur. Yeah. Um, yes, the line yeah, between I the think two. That, yeah, there's a deliberate move in a lot of this film's ones to have a darkness between the two to mm -hmm. make it so you can't see that fuzz, which I think is a really good yeah, choice. Yeah, very smart. Because it can be really disorienting. It, it, it's a shot that draws a lot of attention well, so to it's itself. So not common that when I've watched films with people before, they'll be like, "What the fuck's happened to the camera?" And you'll be like, "No, no, no, that is <laughs> that's on purpose. Like that, they it's a thing." <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you you immediately notice it as a bit odd because it's the human eye and cameras do not behave in this way where you can have something in the background, the foreground, and focus at the same time. Mm. So you're you, I, I, it's, you can't get rid of that seam because you're always going to be in the process of splicing. You're going to have some. There's going to be a point where the blurred meets the non-blurred. So putting it in in the sort of dark, underlit background, that's he was very smart. It's very clever. Helps a bit. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Nice one, John. Carpenter. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> Carpenter. I also, I also quite like so his initial reaction is genuine fear and paranoia, but then he kinda it's all internal, but there's some sort of like, uh, but he wants to trust Mac. He wants to be able to trust him, and so he kind of softens a little bit. Like after that immediate mm. sort of fear reaction, you can see him. He kind of like, yeah. I don't yeah, know. He, I don't he, know how... he chills out a little bit and and talks to him like he's on his side because he suggests that the crew. This is where he says they should make their own meals, eat out of cans, so the thing can't infect any of them that way. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's the kind of thing you share with someone who you assume is probably a human. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and and of course, even yeah, McCready's kind of looking at him sus as well. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's looking at everybody sus. Nobody trusts each other. It's uh really bad. But he's uh he's working in the lab for a while, and then night comes, and the no lights on. He he lights uh a, a lighter, a cigarette cigarette lighter, walks up to the door, and uh, somebody walks past. And it's like, and he and he asks them to identify themselves, like who are who is that, and they don't say anything, and it's like. Man, that is nice and spooky, isn't it? That's very it really spooky. is. It's <laughs> really like, creepy. Just somebody walks past and they don't say who they are, and you don't know who they are. It's like fucking hell. Imagine being there, like Jesus, yeah, that would terrifying. be terrifying. Um, so and then we he, he ventures out. That would be. Ah, uh, I don't know. My bet would <laughs> likely be Blair. Honestly, uh, he's figured out how to get out through the bottom and the. 
he needs to be a, uh, the thing sooner rather than later to justify making that ship. That's true. That is true. He could have been assimilated very early in this period. That's a that's a good guess. I I want to say it could be any of them <laughs> at this point. Sure, no, I, it could. Be the boring like, answer, but I, I I can't think of anything that would make it clear. I guess the interesting thing is that um, if it, if it was Blair, Blair would have to not say anything. You know, Norris could be like, "Dude, it's, it's me. Like, calm down." Uh, whereas Blair can't be here. So, mm -hmm. like, Blair can't identify himself if he's here, you know? That's a decent point, yeah. So, I think Blair makes a lot of sense. Um, and he's, he's I, slinking around getting all the parts for the UFO. That's right. So, that's a good point. Um, and then Fuchs, uh, he leaves, he, he ventures outside, lights a flare, looks around, and discovers a tattered jacket belonging to McCready, which, yeah, this is the point where, like, shit, the thing is actually, like, because, you know, like... The thing is, is that you you could at this point conclude that uh, McCready, you know, there's there's no reason to assume that just because he's the main character that like he could not be assimilated. But mm -hmm. of course, we later learn that he definitely isn't. So like, this is the thing sabotaging McCready. Yeah. Yep. And it's already Talk shown. Well, and this plays really well with the next sequence as well, right? With, with what happens with McCready and uh, and Norton. That's and right. Everyone. Like for the audience, yeah. I mean, as well as the yeah. characters. And I want to talk about the meta of this because I feel like if this movie was a movie, like if they made a movie like this today, it would it would be so reasonable to assume they would never do that with the main character. But oh, like with the a movie from the... right? Where it's yeah. definitively the main character, Kate, is definitely not the thing ever. And you know that for sure. Yeah. It, but like a movie from the 70s, the 80s, even the 90s, I feel like it's much more likely that if you're watching this for the first time, it could be him. You know what I mean? Like, that seems reasonable. Yeah, but there's be. something that's been changed in storytelling <laughs> where it, it's, it feels so obvious that they wouldn't do that today. It's also... No, not, no, like, twists right, feel so much right. more obvious, too, because in the 2011 one, when, when it, quote-unquote, it's all over and they had him back, I think everyone in the audience was like, the guy is going to be the thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, yeah, the ending. Going. Yeah. Whereas here, exactly. That There's no reason to... When you see that, I think I think the first read is, oh shit, is McCready has he been assimilated? I think that's what you're meant to conclude. The reveal is actually no, he's innocent, and the thing is is deliberately framing him, mm -hmm. which is it's just like ah, oh, so interesting. Um, and also at this point, uh, uh, Fuchs he disappears because McCready asks, like, uh, anybody seen Fuchs? Um, any anybody could have gotten to him because a fuse in the lab got blown out, disabling the lights for an hour. Um, and they're all going to go looking, and Palmer's like, you know, he says, hey, Palmer, you go with Windows, and Palmer's like, I don't want to go with Windows, I'm, I'm not going with him. <laughs> like, and then that prompts an argument between them that McCready has to shut down. I, I do love that, especially considering that, yeah, Palmer at this point is almost certainly uh, assimilated. That he's like, no, nah, I don't want to so... go with Windows when he actually has nothing to fear. I get it. Evokes, he like, does. For anybody who's played those games, when you are the imposter and you're like, <laughs> that fucker over there is so obviously the imposter, you know, that sort of thing. And it's just yeah. like, oh, you lying little shit. <laughs> like, That's right. Yeah, you don't want, right. you got to straddle that Thank line you. of you, you can't seem too trusting, you can't be too accusatory. Yeah. So you yeah. just kind of go along. You just, you, a lot of the times it's just you just play the vibes of everyone around you. And then, um, McCready well, there's an just, interesting yeah. thing that, like, as a result, so what he in initially instructs them to do is Palmer and Windows go together, and then Mac and Nalls are going to go together. And then, when Palmer's like, fuck that, I'm not doing that, what ends up happening instead is that Windows goes with Mac and Nalls, and then Palmer and Norris both stay behind, which is very interesting. Mm. Yeah, isn't it? Palmer and Norris <laughs> are both, uh, they're both the thing. But they've still got, you know, it's it's three guys tied to a chair, right? So it's probably it's it's probably not an opportune enough moment. I would think not. It's too risky. Especially but you, but you hope there was that yeah. scene where they were like, "Man, isn't this crazy?" Yeah, this is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and then uh, uh, McCready goes to the tool shed uh, to speak with Blair, whose temperament has completely changed. He's like, ah, oh, you know, so I'm, I'm much better, you know, and yeah. I'm not going to hurt anybody. He's like, ah, oh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking noose, dude. Yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. It's very yeah. funny. It's, um, it's... There's it's, nothing uh, wrong with me, and if there was, then I'm all better now. Yeah. <laughs> 
Such a crazy. And an interesting thing is he also insists he insists, yeah, that Fuchs isn't infected, which is interesting because like Blank could have gotten him, you know? Like Blank yeah. could have been one who got him. Uh as as we soon well, not got him, but was gonna get him. Uh because I, I think we are to conclude that he burned himself so that he, yeah. he could the thing couldn't get him. What could have happened, of course, is Blair does a move on him, like infects him, does something, and then Fuchs is like, fuck, and, and just decides, nah, this ain't happening to me. I'm going to burn myself yeah. before it's too late. Or he's yeah. just that terrified that he sees Blair or he sees anything and he's just like, fuck this. <laughs> I'm out. I don't want to be yeah, in this I world think anymore. That's and that's something I think about as well as like, dude, that, that, like, could you imagine the scene of like, Fuke steady out there, and then Blair just looks at him. You know, Blair pops out and looks at him. That would be terrifying. Yeah, man. I think like it, it's 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 honestly like more terrifying the blank stare of somebody who you now realize is not a human, even more so than them like transforming into a also, monstrosity. Or something mm -hmm. about that. You could also have him, you know, meet up with it, it catch him basically, be like Blair. Yeah. It's just like gradually the conversation yeah. just gets to a point where it's, Blair knows he knows, and they're just like, why are we even bothering? You know, like, exactly. that could be really creepy. <laughs> and then, of course, yeah, if he does do some kind of vomit attack or stabs him or grabs him or does some anything that gives uh, Fuchs a sense that it's like, well, I'm done. It's over. I'm so. done, yeah. Because, yeah, basically, uh, McCready, Knowles, and Windows discover Fuchs' charred remains. And Windows uh, Windows thinks that Fuchs may have been trying to burn the thing, but McCready says maybe he, he burned himself so before it could get to him. Um... And uh, and then uh, McCready wants to investigate his shack because the lights are inexplicably on, mm. and um, and so he and Knowles go up to the shack, and you see Childs watching from inside the station, uh, and there's been forty five minutes, uh, about forty five minutes since they went in, uh, and Childs suggests that they start barricading the doors. Obviously, the assumption being. Uh, either McCready or Knowles might have been the thing and got the other one, and so now now they're both a lost cause. Which is it, it's, uh, it's just like, oh shit, yeah. You know, as a reminder, this, is, this feels like an important thing in, ter in terms of storytelling, of a reminder, like, McCready's the main character, but, like, every character's got an agenda of their own. Yeah, and he you feels know, no like, more... Uh, uh, this is such a weird way to put special? it. He doesn't feel no more main than anyone else, even though he is. Even though he is the main, yeah. yeah. Um, because Child's doing this, is, he's taking the initiative here. Um, and, and, I mean, it's a fair assumption. They were, they were up there for a while, and of course, we learn the reason why why they've been gone for a while, right? Like we figure out what exactly has happened, because as they start barricading the doors, um, though, though something worth noting is Norris it seems to his heart it ain't it ain't doing so well. He's uh he's kind of like going ah oh, he's I oh find boy. to be a very super interesting thing to think about as does the thing copy you so well it'll copy your actual like ana anatomical flaws no problems yeah. I think that's. I think it might not like, even know their flaws if it's if it's yeah. not familiar with human yeah. anatomy. It might just be like. I don't see why it wouldn't, right? Like copy it because... one to one, and so if he had heart issues, the thing may very well have copied them. Yeah, like it's supposed to be a perfect imitation. So I exactly. think that is how, how cool it is that yeah. as like a sort of backdoor. Think, um, well, I think I think a way to think about it is um, Norris like having the heart attack is not not very good for him. It's, it seems no. like the initiation of the attack on Copper is like one well, fucked. Like I gotta, I gotta go for it, right? That this is not ideal. Um, so I think there's good reason to conclude that that's the case, which is super interesting. As kind of almost a nerf for the thing, it's like it yeah, you, you can't well. be them add the flaws. Which is like, like I mentioned earlier, the idea of it becoming a perfect imitation to the point of the perfect, the the real thing doesn't, you know, the real thing believes it's not the thing. So when the thing assimilates it and copies it, does it copy the knowledge that it isn't the thing as part of that process? It's, it's an interesting well, thought. I think to uh, because someone's just kind of brought it up in chat, but what about copying mental illness? That's that's an interesting. Yeah. Thought. I mean, yeah, I like your complicated. Well, it, we know like... it can copy memories, so I guess a lot of that stuff would come along with it. So. Mm. What if it copied your retardation? Exactly. And it was just really stupid now. <laughs> what if it, like, copied someone who oh, was yeah, just... It became a really shitty thing. Like, like <laughs> one of us super into movies, and so that it just, like, you know what? I actually kind of just want to watch movies. I, I don't even want to kill I people. I like being a human. <laughs> being yeah, a human is actually great. I get to have friends and talk about art and stuff. 
Uh, so Knowles stumbles back into the base and he says that he cut McCready loose because he found his shredded jacket uh, and it looked like it was it was trying to be destroyed, which that's, you know, it's like, okay, so Fuchs found the shredded dra- jacket outside, he found it, and then he died, and then whichever thing went to get him must have gone into McCready's uh, watchtower and then and then done that, which is interesting. It's almost like, he he wanted to instill that in Fuchs, but it fucked up, and so now he had to move on to a new strategy. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And that's yeah. so cool. <laughs> like, goddamn, that's super interesting. Um, and I mean, so now dude, we the fact that we have yeah. Doris and uh, uh, Palmer actually like discussing what's happening with each other when they're both yeah. the thing is so cool. Both the thing. And so, um, and again, when you talk about how smart the characters are. Knowles is like, yeah, McCready's infected. And so then everybody's looking at him like, so you could be then. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, yeah. 45 minutes annoying. is a long time. The, yeah. the, the long it just time leads you to think something. And, um, but, uh, but, but then as they're all having this argument of fighting, they start seeing the door, the doorknob is, is turning. McCready's trying to get back inside. And, Dude, uh, I love it's, it's, uh, this conversation because I had multiple thoughts at this point of like, don't let him in, obviously. And then I was like, well, yeah, but if you let him in, that, at least we know where he is right now, you know? And it's like, well, yeah, but yeah. that is risky to do something like that. What, what if something happens we can't control? And it's like, yeah, but we can kill him now. And, like, that whole conversation happens. All the characters go through all those little... Thing. Yeah. pretty is busting through the window. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. And, um, yeah. I, I think it's Ma- cool Maintaining the... Sorry for you. No, 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 no. Ma- maintaining the integrity of lo- of the logic is integral to um, keeping it scary. I mean, if if this movie had all the creature effects and slimy stuff and everything, like if it excelled at all of that, but then you had characters making fucking dumb fuck decisions constantly, going like, "Oh, why are you doing that?" Oh, well, I get it. I get it on a screenplay level because you're trying to force this gross set piece to happen. Like it wouldn't be as good, right? You you'd get turned off. So the reason yeah. it all works is because everybody's behaving intelligently and and exactly. in an understandable way. And I hate this idea that if you make your characters characters dumb or if you make them smart, then you can't do like the creepy gory stuff. Insane. You know, it's like the, the idea that you lock yourself out of that if you have competent it's characters out of a hack. You know? That's what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. the loser writer who doesn't want to work hard. So it's, he says, well, no, I'm not even obliged to work hard. Yeah. So True. the right approach is that you have characters do smart things, other characters do smart things in response, and then it's like, then what happens? Like, you can find creative ways, despite everybody behaving intelligently, you can still find ways to be like, oh, like, what if the creature came in and did this thing here? You know? Like, yeah. this, just because it's everybody's well, smart uh, doesn't mean you can't have those creature out, moments. Right? They're all intelligent and still losing. Yes. It's like, yeah, that that makes the thing right. even scarier. That that um that they're all really smart and they're doing smart things, but they're still struggling to counter it. You know, it's like think of it in a video game, right? If the boss is piss easy, then it's like, oh damn. But if the boss is really hard, like beating Armstrong feels good because Armstrong is a hard boss to beat. You know, in Metal yeah. Gear Rising, I don't know how many anybody here has played Metal Gear Rising. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. Example, <laughs> well, I don't know, like Gwyn or whatever from Dark Souls, like. The being harder contributes Aww. to the sense of accomplishment. Or that's is like, not hard? Yeah, that's like a that that's like a Han Solo is my favorite Star Wars character. It's like, oh, you know something, but you don't know much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, look, I don't know. Right. Gwyn is like notoriously I... too easy. Oh, is he? Oh, I see. Who's the hardest one? Is it? Is it? Uh, the the two guys, the fat guy and the 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 other Old guy. Seen and Smo probably is considered one of the hardest. Sure. Right. Who is Frank the hardest? The thing. Wait, what about the thing? Frank is the no, thing. I'm saying, I'm saying who is the <laughs> hardest thing in your, in your opinion. In my, oh, well, um, I, I might vote for them, actually. I mean, the thing is, I love fighting them. It's, it's like a weird mindset of artist versus... Uh, you know, like how in um, Bloodborne, uh, I'd probably say Lawrence is the hardest, even though Orphan of Cost is the one... That is like known well, to well, be. Well, obviously, I think he's the hardest because <laughs> I never beat him. Well, <laughs> like the, 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 you would have more trouble on Lawrence. He's got fucking like double the health, and he can like instig or at least come close. It, we, we should talk about the thing. <laughs> like, no, well, no, it's uh, 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 yeah, sure. That that's true. We can. We oh, can including the on. DLC, it probably is madness. Actually, that's fair. 
for Dark Souls one. Um, so uh, yeah, they they found out where McCready is, and then uh, Charles grabs an axe and starts busting through the door. And meanwhile, McCready is stumbling to get a stick of dynamite and get a uh, and get a flare and light it because this is, of course, his best defense right now. Is um, um really you, quick, you there's a, but, yeah. There's a great line um, before he goes in the supply window where Windows asks, "What if we're wrong about him?" And Charles is like, "Well, then we're wrong." Yes, yeah. it is actually a, a a better line. It has any right to be because it sounds so simple, but it's like, well, but it really captures a mindset of that I think is actually Fuck pretty it. good leadership in the sense yeah. of we're doing the best we can with the information we can. That is the case. The idea that mm -hmm. we're like, oh yeah. no, what if we're doing it wrong? It's like we don't want to lead to not doing anything and just fucking dying. We got to actually make a decision. Yeah. If it's the wrong one, it's the wrong one. Exactly. It's really, really interesting, like seeing their personalities through action. That he is one of the final people that survives. Yeah, because he's a go-getter too. He's a bit more of a hothead than McCready, as has been mentioned in the story. But he's, you know, he's a man of action too. And it's just kind of interesting that they both make it to the end, allegedly. True. Wow. Allegedly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, McCready. McCready's like, yeah, you you attack me, I'm a I'm a blow this whole place up. He's uh, which again is this is a, this is probably the best that he could do because totally the is. only it's... thing he can do now is, yeah. is say like you can't kill me otherwise we all die that's my best defense it's kind of genius because it disarms everybody it's like fuck I mean the <sighs> fuck it's <laughs> like, the this, nuclear this no... option yeah. essentially yeah exactly and and of course because McCready recognizes right the fact that they didn't let him in it's like right you all think I'm the thing so you which is great me, again so... because he knows he's not you know what I mean like, it's like exactly yeah yeah. So he's like, you fuckers. <laughs> like he's he's in a really me. rough position. No one trusts him. He knows he's innocent. Well, he calls Childs an asshole, and Giles like, you would have done the same you thing. You'd done the same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he does. Well, he would have. He absolutely would have. Childs mm -hmm. was right. He pretty would have done the same thing. And then uh, Knowles and, and, and Norris uh, attack him, and uh, Norris looks like he's having a heart attack. Like, he's he he fell wrong, and, and he's, uh, yeah, he's... he's he landed uh, on his really heart, cool. yeah. <laughs> and and it's at this point that's like oh shit I, I guess we gotta get copper it, you know even though he's suspected he's the only person who can help him right now I, of and course, it's um, McCready, McCready who says that yeah I think McCready is the one who says to go get copper right go well I guess what I was getting at is that Norris getting hurt like this is bad for McCready now it means that everybody's looking at him like you did this you caused this mm -hmm. even though he's defending himself right like as he would but it all contributes because when they're in the operating room, everybody's staring at McCready, which is understandable. He's holding the flamethrower. He's a stick dynamite. of dynamite and a flamethrower. Well, the thing is, <laughs> right? If he if he were the thing, let's run the story. If he actually were, he'd probably do all the same things. Exactly. That's that's mm -hmm. the point. Is is this is his best way of defending himself? Whether he is or isn't the thing, as a human, you know, the thing, thing would yeah. be like, well, shit, I'm a human, so I got to defend myself in the best way I can. That doesn't involve. An attack because an attack would fail, and there's no need Charles to be like, "All right, you got me. I'm the thi You may as well keep it up for as long as possible. Just no, exactly. not the thing." But uh, while they while they're setting up to operate on him, uh, Clark grabs a scalpel and hides it. Uh, he is he is he is preparing to take action, but mm -hmm. before he's in a position to do that, we have our uh, copper being like, "Oh shit! All right, he, like, let me use this defibrillator. Clear," and then uh. It, uh, Norris's <laughs> chest opens up with big sharp teeth and everything and he munches on him uh, this <laughs> shot is amazing like this is yeah. this is such a cool reveal god damn yeah, I yeah. would have seen that coming no way it's great uh, by the way, the tension in this scene is so fucking good because we've got yeah. the audience is left so adrift at this point as to who is what and what is happening necessarily. The trying to save a man from assuming being dead is like an actual like tension filled struggle. But simultaneously, they keep showing that shot of the scalpel and uh, McCready just clearly losing his fucking mind while trying yeah, to control the, the situation. The assumption yeah. is the thing that you expect is Clark is going to attack McCready, and what does that mean? Not. Oh shit! Norris's chest is gonna burst open and yeah. uh, and munch on, <laughs> on Copper's arms. That's why it's right. such a great it's such a great reveal because it's so unexpected. But all of yeah. the clues and evidence has led to this being like, uh, this this is this could happen, right? And this 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 should happen based on all of the information that we have. You know, looking at it retro retroactively, it's good yeah. shit. Did anyone watching this movie for the first time actually suspect that? Um... Norris was the thing at this point. 
I think the issue when you ask a question like that is that I've seen this movie enough times and for like such a huge chunk of my life is knowledge of this movie that I can't actually remember the state of my life where I was like watching this for the first time that, and yeah. what I thought at the time. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you know, it's Greg, too core. It's I, too much of a core movie memory kind of thing. I don't think I got to enjoy this the first time around as a, like, I was actively going, like, what's the evidence for this person versus I was just sitting there watching things unfold and being, like, enamored. I think in my case, happen. I was aware of this before I'd seen the film. I was aware of this as, like, an iconic movie moment before I'd seen the movie. Well, there you go. What about you, yeah. John? Uh, I can't remember, honestly. Yeah, that's it's fair. Insane. That's fair. I'm just curious. Um, I was just thinking. What do you guys say? He kind of looks like uh, uh, Copper. Kind of looks like Mel Gibson. This shot. A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. But a lot of different people look like Mel Gibson. Yeah, just older. <laughs> I think so. Think about think about how much time has passed since the dog thing revealed itself and and uh, Norris thing. It's it's been like well over thirty minutes. Oh, well, a lot of movies in universe, but then. yeah, it's been a while, yeah. Well, in universe, it's been a few days, but uh, for us as viewers, it's been a while. It's been a long time because, like, at this point, things start to escalate dramatically yeah. from from well, this point onward. Yeah, but the kind of the relatively early-ish setup that we get the big gap afterwards, it really does establish the stakes as to what this thing's capable of, what it does. Mm -hmm. Um. So all of the time between that and now, you're just thinking like, oh shit, like one or more of these people can do that, that thing we saw earlier. That is yeah. so disgusting. I'm just watching the it head. Uh, it, off the yeah, table. it is. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the practical effects here are phenomenal. This is the thing. Uh, I, can't, I can't stop noticing how many times we say thing that are not intentional. It's so great. But, um, it should be a drinking game. Yeah. We have to take a We'd shot anytime soon. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the hyper vibration, the build up in the music and the camera moving toward it is everything is about to go to shit sort of vibe. When it bursts out, this is one of the effects I was talking about where um, I can I can still read it as like, oh, I can see how you built that and how it, how it comes to be. But um, when they're so good that it like almost turns that part off of my, my, my brain off, which happens a whole bunch in this film. Which doesn't happen as much in other ones, but uh, particularly that head, as Cap was just mentioning. Oh, the head. There's something about this where I was just like, "Fuck, that looks so good," and the way it stretches, and then as it yeah, peels away, the tongue and is in there moving around. And then, oh. and then all the like shoots out and bursts out as the neck is extending. And it's like, dude, this is insane. There's such a combination of like what you think is happening here to the thing itself feels as though it might actually be in pain. As it's like, I gotta fucking tear off a part of me to get out of here because my body's on fire. Like, uh. Well, but it also could just be the fact that it's it's you know moving and and uh, changing shape so hard so fast while also making noises that it just it's just a horrifying image anyway. Like it's not necessarily. It's like it's so unrelatable. Yeah, you don't even yeah. know if the pain it's feeling is just an act or a reflex or if it actually feels pain. It's just so not like us. Yeah, and then like the desperation Dude. of trying to develop. This is what I mean, like, it, almost like the whole evolution of, of, of Earth, it's got that as a library in, like, its head that's just appealing to different DNA mutations and trying to generate them to move. It's I'm like, gonna turn the head into a spider so I can get yeah, the fuck like, out of here. You know? The tongue yeah. being like, this is working, uh, this, like, it's not very fast, it's like, alright, spider legs, let's go. <laughs> this, yeah. That should work. Go, 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 spider legs. Gadget, spider leg. yeah. and, of, and of course, in this case, it doesn't work, because after they, everybody comes back in and extinguishes the fire, Palmer, who is definitely the thing at this point, says, you gotta be fucking kidding me. And which calls yeah. everybody's attention to uh, Norris thing getting away, and then McCready tortures it. So the thing will work against other things if it thinks it will uh, benefit itself. Which also, is so interesting. McCready actually concludes that from seeing the Norris head detach. That's what makes him conclude the blood test. I think that's yeah. what we're meant to conclude. But actually, mm -hmm. we're seeing that happen in real time with a thing yeah. operating against another thing it's awesome and yeah. uh, i was going to say this particular shot the the fire extinguisher like smog and the silhouetted like it, this just makes the yeah. spider thing look so much better in this moment cuz yeah. i think there's a potential goof factor with the spider head uh, it's it, it is and it's kind of amusing the idea that the thing is like yeah you know trying to get out before it gets spotted like this yeah. So it's a, it could be a tough balance, but I think they, they nail it. 
I love that the oh, head yeah. is upside down, like, as if it oh, wasn't yeah. fucked it up already. <laughs> like <laughs> it's that little extra flare. Like yeah, it does give the exactly. impression that it it doesn't care if it's upside. It doesn't matter if it's right side up or not. It just doesn't yeah. matter. It literally doesn't matter to this creature. But, uh, yeah, they 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 got him. But uh, cop is that he's dead. Um, but now it's time for my favorite scene in the whole movie. This is my favorite. <laughs> I'm not sure. There's a lot of things that you could pick as as a favorite, but the blood test well, is I my mean, favorite scene in the movie. Yeah. Uh, I love it. The it's tension iconic. here is relatively unparalleled. It's one of the top tier ones of all time. Yeah. Uh, so they they're in the rec room, and uh, and 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 uh, every basically like all of the all of the ropes getting thrown out. McCready's uh, telling Windows and Palmer to tie everybody else down, and Gary's like, "Fuck this! We should rush McCready." Um, yeah, he's not gonna blow himself like, up. There's yeah. no way he would, and everyone, and then, uh, no one moves. No one moves Clark, to muscle. They just that's right. Nobody <laughs> wants to do it because it really is risky. Well, and then Clark's like, "Yeah." I was gonna say, I think that's a really great uh, representation of how there is a lot of power in a group, and there is reason to assume a thing. But like, no individual is willing to start that. Willing up. to take the risk. No, except for yeah. I mean, except well, for Clark, basically. Because the thing Clark's is, though, he's like. He, he thinks he has his shot, but he's wrong. You know? Right. Yeah, he's, he's trying to he's sneak like, oh, up I got on a him. secret weapon, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um but he's like, like, hey guys, yeah, maybe we ought to do what McCready says, you know? <laughs> yeah, but do that. I, I quite like that after Gary suggests they just, you know, rush Mac. Um we cut to Mac and he has this look like, you don't think I would do that? I'd I fucking do that. I'll blow everyone up here. <laughs> yeah, I will kill us all. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. But yeah. You think I won't do that? Yeah, and then, and then there's a lot of moments like that in this movie where, like, someone says something, and then there's just a silence, which says more than anyone actually saying anything could. The other one mm -hmm. that we skipped over, but it's um, when he tells, uh, he initially tells them to tie up Doc and Gary and Clark. Doc is like, "You can't tie me up. I'm not a prisoner." And then there's just silence. It's like, "No, you are." You know, yeah, like you that's know, essentially everybody's, the everybody's on board. Everybody's yeah. everybody agrees with McCready. Well, so, Sorry, buddy. Yeah, just as a connection to that, not to get ahead, but when you get cleared from the blood test, it's it's so palpable the trust you get when you're you're cleared. It's like, oh, I that's can right. fuck yes, I know you're a human now. Thank fuck. Like it's you're solid. Yeah, now I got they can you. finally work together yeah. and they don't feel so alone anymore, which is an interesting sort of change in the in the nature of the story. But we're not quite there yet because yeah, uh, that they're setting this up and McCready threatens to kill Child, but uh, Clark lunges at him, and so McCready shoots Clark in the head. It's like, oh shit. Yep. And, um, but, but, but to show just how uh, unhinged they all are, I say unhinged, but I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Clark and Copper's corpses are tied together because McCready wants to conduct the test on them as well. And, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and Palmer's like, come on, like, really? They're dead. But uh, I mean, he's right. Like, the, the dead thing, you know, that was still alive, so... This they have to be sure, so it's a good idea, really. Well, it's just yeah. such a great moment for how far we've come. They're killing each other yeah. now, like, and pretty quickly. This is like, exactly we not got a lot of choices left. This is just the way it is. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, in the span of like ten minutes, the cost is reduced by like four. It's uh, it's uh, it really goes quick. And now, now McCready basically gives a big speech about the uh, the blood test. He realizes that every little piece of the thing is an individual with a desire to protect itself. So he he believes that even the blood of the thing, once separated from it, will seek to protect itself. And so the plan is to press hot metal against the blood of every crew member to provoke a reaction and thus definitively establish who is and isn't human. Really cool idea. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's in it's in the uh, novella that the this one uh, is, oh, is in cool. that the blood test. Though I, yeah, so, uh, McCready, uh, he first tests Windows' blood, and I, I, dude, I love, like, Windows' reaction here, like, he, he backs up and he's looking at him, and he, he's looking at him like he's ready to attack him, yeah. like, almost as if he's anticipating that he might fail the test, even though he would, you know, it's like, well, you're a human, but it's like, that's the, the extent of the paranoia, is that he, he's, like, so paranoid that he thinks he might even fail the test and have to fight for his life, but, um... He and in terms infected. of the filmmaking, uh, like before they reveal that Windows is actually safe, we're cutting to Windows a lot, like way yes. more than anyone else. And you're watching it going like, wait, am I supposed to suspect, suspect Windows? Why are we cutting to him so much? And then ultimately it's revealed that it, it isn't him, but it's just such a great little misdirection. 
and it yeah. and then it, it's the, the perfect way to build relief. it up. Like this is the foundation of the scene. We that was like a okay, all right, that's one down. Ooh, oh, like that was already yeah. bad enough. We've got plenty left. And well, the other thing that it, at this point, until you see that it actually has an effect, you don't even know that this works necessarily. That's true exactly. as well, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Because, I mean, multiple characters say, like, they think this is stupid and doesn't prove anything. But mm -hmm. McCready's on board because he, he, he's like, oh, I guess you're okay. But, Grab the flamethrower. It's like, okay, now Max got back up. And once again, the paranoia, because you get the, you don't even know what's going to work. It's like, yeah, that's what you would say, thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, um, and then, and then, of course, he's like, "Well, now, and now I'll prove what I already know." Tests himself, and, and, and Charles is like, "That's bullshit. <laughs> that's, <laughs> like, that doesn't mean anything." Well, and yeah, then, that, I was yeah. gonna say, that's what's kind of fun about this test as well. It's like you hate this test until it passes you. Then you like the test. The test exactly. Cool, so yeah. Then you love it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then, um, McCready's like, "All right, let's test Copper and Clark." And um, and and they test, and 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 the interesting one, of course, is 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 Clark. Where he, he burns it, and he's kind of looking like he's ready to see a reaction, but nothing happens. And then, uh, and then Child says, "Well, so he wasn't infected, which means you're a murderer." Um, which, which McCready moves on from pretty quickly because it's something he doesn't want to dwell on. Obviously, I mean, I mean what, what a cool reveal, you know? Yeah, like it's tough. I mean, we're not gonna, they're not going to have a nuanced conversation about this in this moment. But the fact is, like, man, he was going to kill me, so you know, yeah, yeah. Exactly, but, but yeah, it's good shit. Man, this this reaction when he says Palmer, it's like Palmer has this kind of reaction that looks like, oh shit, mm -hmm. this is it. You got to show it. it. It really comes across like, oh well, all right, it's uh, go time now. Jigs <laughs> up. <laughs> well, this happens in those games every once in a while when the evidence is definitive, explicit, and obvious. You've been caught, and you could try, but you you sort of have a moment of. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I suppose the thing is, is that I don't know that the thing could necessarily know that the test will work. Um, but you know, I mean, I guess, I guess it's the logic. The logic checks out. Yeah. Um. So it seems like he is almost ready. Well, there's but, that, but like and he's there's not just do anything until he sees. I think that's why the expression's so good because it's it's like. If if it works, I guess that's it for me. If it doesn't work, well, all right. I get, I get, you know, yeah, like it's exactly. I, all I really do is sit here. So this is it. And then uh, Gary's like, "This is pure nonsense. Doesn't prove a thing." And McCready says, "Well, I thought you'd feel that way. After all, you were only, <laughs> you, you were the only one who could get to the blood." And it's like, dude, it's it's a good point. Like, it, it really is. There is good reason to suspect Gary from McCready's perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, saying, you know, we'll do you last, and then like, jump it out. It's such great. a great, <laughs> such a great misdirection that, like, yeah. right before we're about to do Palmer, we're already rushing ahead to argue about Gary. Yeah, like, we all assume about Gary. Yep. That Palmer will be clear. No, yeah, none, none of the editing is by accident, right? You have the shot oh, on Palmer yeah. just muted. So he's sort of like, the audience is aware of him, but there's nothing, he's not doing anything colorful to draw attention. And then mm -hmm. you have the next, the guy who's like, this is bullshit. It's like, oh, maybe it's him. Um, and then like, oh, in the same shot that there is dialogue from um, McCready. It's like, you don't, you don't, the audience doesn't see it coming. It's just so, well, and that's also, all in the writing, the way it's written, right? Got a bit of filmmaking masterclass too, because this little yes. setup here is going to be pretty complicated to nail with, uh, you're going to have to have that come out of the Petri dish, right? So it's obviously not coming out of that. It's coming out of a device that's going to be tricked into the hand and below. So they give us a successful reading and shot with nothing to worry about to help ease us into completely believing this is actually Kurt Russell's hand when it's not. Even like though it's, it's not. Yeah, it's okay, so it's cool. Not. This it, When you start <laughs> to stare at it, you can obviously tell it's fake, but you don't but, when you're well, watching it. Happening. Exactly. And uh, seriously, like to, to pull us back that far to give us a good test sort of thing w while we don't need it to explode is, is very deliberate is to, to ease you into mm -hmm. thinking it's very real. Good shit. Mm -hmm. It's so good. This, this so angle, good. this shot is safe, but it's not. Yes. Yeah. Um, minor, yeah, minor gripe I have at the beginning when they're drawing everyone's blood, uh, they're all using the same knife and they're not sterilizing it between uses. That's true. Uh, you even see windows. No, we... <laughs> no, no, no w w Windows flag. cleans it, and you can tell he he even looks uncomfortable about using it. But it, I yeah. I got the sense from this scene that they were like, just fucking go, get this done. I'm not I'm not wasting any time with the uh, yeah. 
I, 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 it's not impossible, but it does seem really stupid if they believe that it can be just a simple infection. No, yeah, I think that's fair. Like, it, you would have a character mm -hmm. say, like, what the fuck is the point in it's using work. Oh, wow. example is on that, everybody? Is that the second, the second floor in this movie? <laughs> would they think, would they think that it, it might be number three, Friggy, but I'm not all... sure. <laughs> oh, With wow. sub five, Only I know three. that. Yeah. I think they, someone should have demanded it be cleaned between each use. I think someone should just straight up say, use a different tool for everybody. Yeah, yeah. that as well. But, uh, he just wipes it on his legs, like, oh, that, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> just wipe it off. I don't want to uh, get someone's terrible... Well, it's, it's not even get it's, someone's it's... blood, it's get someone's thing blood in me, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, and then the thing blood, it, it, it screams, and then, uh, because, because ah. it startles McCready, he drops the flamethrower, which appears to damage it. And um and then the blood, is it's, it starts kind of, like, running away, like, oh, I'm out of here. But, uh, Palmer, he's, <laughs> uh... He's shaking a bit. He's uh, shaking a lot and um, and starting to transform, but the flamethrower's not working. And poor Gary and Childs and and, and, uh, and Noel screaming as they're tied next to this monster that's transforming right next to them. Listen, I'll tell you, yet, okay? Yet again, amazing. Be a nightmare to be any yeah. of these people. However, <laughs> fucking Gary, Gary, you're in the worst position. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> poor Gary. <laughs> Because uh, yeah. yeah, there's 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 a there's a choice here of which one you'd want to be more than the others, and Gary's definitely losing that. Man, and the eyeballs bulging out of his his head. It's just God, mm -hmm. grotesque, and you know yeah. the whole like the <laughs> like it does yeah. that um in almost all the sequences yeah. we see of it. It makes you wonder if it's just like powering up to start generating all kinds of mutations instantly of or, or shape mm. changes, mass alteration, like it. It's it it is like the perfect creature for describing it as what the fuck is this thing, like that, that that's exactly it just captures it so well. Something that's kind of funny about the editing though is that you can hear screaming pretty early on, but like they're screaming when you can see the camera on uh, Gary Childs and and Knowles, so it's like wait who's screaming? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, right now four, we Windows. Found <laughs> at this point, I'm not ready to believe that it can only make noises through its human mouth. It's got some other weird <laughs> bullshit going on. By the uh, way, I mean, um, yeah. The one thing I think is neat is it's a little thing when they when they he drops the vial when Mel Gibson when he drops the vial. Um, I guess they shot it at an incline because the blood like moves in a direction. Well, I think like, there's no, a bit of trickery because uh. Oh, you mean you mean well, to create the effect? To create yeah, the to effect. Create the effect. Yeah. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. To create the effect There's of the another blood, bit of like, a, moving away. Yeah. Another bit of trickery is that when uh when Palmer breaks free and hits the ceiling, that's like that's that's like the ceiling's on the ground, and you can see because one of the bits of uh of wood uh falls onto the ceiling, like it breaks apart and then falls onto the ceiling because the ceiling's obviously on the floor. Mm -hmm. right, no, yeah. he as, as jumps so fast it. and so powerfully the wood comes up with him. It's oh, look at that. Wow. Gravity, <laughs> yeah, he stands up there with him. Yeah. I mean, obviously, th but this is the nature of it, right? Because everything had to be practical back then. This is the only way that you could do these things. Dude, it's such right, a if, yeah. it, if it's and... not right, you have you'd have to reset the entire thing, you know? Yeah. But it's such a it's such a relief almost. It's like you're secure in watching something that was done yeah. that way. <laughs> you get to appreciate even exactly. with mistakes, tiny mistakes. It doesn't matter. And uh, then he, and then Max screams, the "Windows, you know, blast him!" And he's about to, but then uh, then Palmer thing drops down, and 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 uh, Windows is like stunned into yeah. inaction because of how horrifying the thing is. And then the head splits open, grabs him, and starts munching on him. Meanwhile, everybody else is still tied up, and, and okay, McCready yeah, still can't just, his, uh, just real quick, I, I can't do a direct comparison, unfortunately, but the way this creature's fucking head splits open was something I remembered, like, from when I'd first seen it, because I was just like, fuck, look at that. And uh, the, the stupid remake, man, <laughs> like, it, it has yeah. a scene that's just like this, and it's so bad by comparison. <laughs> it's upsetting. Oh, in the helicopter? Yeah. It's, oh, I yeah, hated that. Yeah. When I saw it for the first time, I was like, Ugh, that's so lame. What the fuck? Mm. Especially being like this one. Just look at the effort that went into that. Yeah. I mean, they, the, this, like, knowing we have to build a set that's upside, we have to build a ceiling as a floor and then shoot it away and then flip it upside down for the thing. 
just the, all the camera trickery and all the, the, the clever stuff you have to do. How do we make the blood move? Okay. How do we get the thing to jump out of it? Oh, we have a fake Mel Gibson hand. All that stuff that they do. It's, it just makes you, it's like that layer of appreciation. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't like the movie as, like, maybe it's not your kind of thing or you don't like Goran stuff. You, you can just appreciate the work that went into it. It's like um, 2001, uh, Space Odyssey. Like, even if you're not into that movie or don't care about it or it's not your thing, like, the, the kind of sets and the camera shots and stuff they had to do to make all of those effects work is just nothing but incredibly impressive. Yeah, for and all the people who call Blade it. Runner boring, you can at least respect it. Come on, you got to be yeah. able to. You have to be able to respect it. Um, and if you yeah, I mean, there's, there's a near deal. infinite amount of microscopic textures in, like, real practical work like that and all the materials they behave in such a way when they're torn apart like like you yeah the webbing is still kind of caught yeah. in the middle mm -hmm. and well, the slime, yeah there's the a lot of as well. layers to the actual materials yeah you, you could yeah, try to mimic nasty. that in vfx but you're not going to achieve that i don't think ever. certainly not like now, now when in maybe in how i don't know like 50 years maybe they'll actually get to a point where we can't tell anymore but Maybe. I, I think a lot of it is the decision making of like when the head splits open, it doesn't like at first, there's still part of like the skin webbing mm -hmm. that doesn't snap yet. So it has that just like messy quality of when it happens. Yeah. It's not supposed to be clean and look you know, like quote unquote look scary. It just does what it does. And so that's what kind of gives it the realism. It's not clean and quote unquote neat. It does make me think yeah. that uh, a lot of practical real shit does stuff that you may not even think to put into the CG one, you know? Like yeah, You're, you're, you're so. trying to replicate it, but there's so much shit, so many variables that happen that make them look so So many good. tiny things that, like, are hard to replicate when trying to make it actually look like it's in the room itself. Things, mm -hmm. little tiny factors, the way the light reflects off things. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The, the way objects and lights and uh, different materials react to each other in a real physical sense that you don't necessarily predict, even if you are a special effects artist. Like, uh, VFX is not going to capture all that stuff. Okay, like yeah. the way it, like, picks him up and it's, like, trying yeah. to eat him. And, like, he's oh, flinging dude, around like, his legs. The mouth is, like, sealed almost. You see it at one point. Yeah. Like, that head, it gets so fucked up when we see uh, he Papa drop down. Yeah, that's right. But uh, McCready manages to get the flamethrower working, and he burns Palmer thing, crashes through the wall, and then uh, then McCready lights a little dynamite stick and throws it, and blows him up. Uh, there's but also a... window, yeah. Oh, there's even a shot where when McCready lights him up, and it's on fire. The thing that they have burning, it even opens. The head is still like it opens up and it moves as it's been lit on fire. Mm -hmm. To resemble the thing that it was, you know, before it was on fire. But even on fire, they knew to have you it know do that thing. That they were mm, like, yeah. listen, we can only burn this thing fully once. It took us ages to make it. We should probably have a shot of the fucking with the animatronics yeah. while it's burning. <laughs> let's, let's do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Not as well. Which is another aspect of these things that I find super fun. No offense to, and not to imply there's no fun in CG or anything. It's just that when you're in your in your editing cave, clicking and clicking and making the thing look really, really good, versus all the guys on the set, they worked for ages on this thing, and they're like, right, let's blow it up. That, like, sort of fun texture to creating movies, I always thought was, like, helpful for the people making them in the first place. It doesn't reduce everything down to, all right, send that to team... Team 2, send that to Team 3. For, like, creating um, any given CG shot, this is, like, the director moves around all the departments that are actually, you know, working on this, the set and the scene itself. Um, part of this is inspired by the fact that I've, I've watched so much Alien behind the scenes uh, semi-recently, but it's, like, it just makes me think about... It's, like, a dead art. Uh, obviously, it's not completely dead. There's still, you know, remnants here and there and, and in different departments, not necessarily... Um, like the creation of Modoc, the guy who did that, or the majority of the work that went behind it, they probably worked really hard and they probably had some fun with it too. But you know, just you know, well, I think a lot of the time when it's still done, it's often hybridized with VFX, and it's just like, I wish there would be more where you don't even bother with VFX so, at all. Did like you just, see him? Just stick with the bracket. I saw someone say, and I knew it wasn't true, but it was still really fascinating as a progress of how we're, we're doing with films. But someone referenced how Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice was so fucking awesome because it's almost 100% practical effects. And I was like, imagine that as a selling point hmm. 
that you're now like our movie comes it's like free range you know like like we trust us we, we're not going to give you any of that cg and then i was thinking wouldn't it be fun as a challenge but i don't it was not, we're not in that universe but for directors you, you're like you are legally not allowed to use a single shred of cg go it's like fuck yeah well, the limitations definitely help breed creativity. Uh, yeah. Regarding the the animatronic head flapping while on on fire, I love that especially because that wasn't necessary at all. But they did it. They took the time to do it because they, they knew it. it would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the um, when he bursts through the wall, you could see that the suit that the guys wearing. Because remember, this was this was the eighties. They just they lit people on fire for movies. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. But, remember Freddy? But, yeah. It's <laughs> the guy. <laughs> The guy who um the guy who goes through the wall and everything the suit that he's wearing has I th I think maybe like the middle where his the the actor's real head is is like covered in black but the he's got like two fake prosthetic half faces to the left and right and that's in the fire too yeah to keep selling the you know the idea Fuck yeah it's then awesome. he goes out there falls in the snow it's it's just well and so <laughs> we don't like. We don't um, like people on fire enough anymore. The, uh, I agree. The Elm Street one, I don't mean to make fun of it too much because like it was it was funny when we saw it, but um when they were filming it, right, like he was told to chase and then to drop to the ground, get the fire extinguishers on him. That's the signal, so to speak, for the actor. And he fell down the stairs and then got straight back up and started climbing them again. And they were they were like blown away by the effort from the guy to keep that all in like to maintain and save the shot to make him that you know, to add to all of it. And it's just the kind of stuff that's like, oh it's so cool when because it, you still get amazing human feats in the form of CG work, but man, no one's gonna hear about it. You know, it's like I did all these. We hours. worked so hard on all those pixels. Yeah, we had to make sure every little thing was just right. Well, on a those guy stuff. who says, like, I was, to, I was at my computer for so long. I literally finished the last shot, and and I had a forty-hour work just non-stop, and I got it out there just in time. You know, like the story of um, Melee getting forty-hour work day. Super Smash Bros. Uh, uh, Melee getting created for me, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, that where, sort of story. Uh, it's like it can happen, yeah. but it's so much less spreadable and less shareable, like compared to a guy in a prosthetic well, yeah, suit when you getting say, set like, on fire. Oh, yeah. You know, all, all the guys at Bungie on Halo 2, they worked like seven days a week for six months. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's like, that's <laughs> that there is a difference between that as a story and, and the kinds of stories that we've been talking about here when it comes to the spontaneous movie making sort of moments. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's the end of Palmer thing. And uh, Windows gets incinerated as well because he's uh, he's he's evil now, but now he's uh. <laughs> <laughs> smoldering so that's the end of that and so then they uh i love the, the grenade or the, the dynamite toss he throws the dynamite at him when he's on there and he just blows up and he's yeah, like yep no, no half measures <laughs> and he just yeah. yeah he's on fire and everything we're still gonna blow him to smithereens to be sure <laughs> yeah i mean as you do <laughs> um and then uh they they wrap up the uh the blood test I, there's um, something quite funny to me that they just go right back to the test after that. Yes, you know? it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> where were we? Yeah, there's, <laughs> you, you. What we needed to fix that was uh, McCready just saying, "Well, that just happened," and then oh we got Oh yeah, that, that's a, that that punches it up. That would have been <laughs> so good. Farrick. Oh, dank Farrick, Yeah, that would have been great. Stop it. <laughs> Well, one uh, of the yeah. things I admire about this movie, it has moments of levity, but you honestly believe the reactions. Like, the you gotta be fucking Natural. kidding me thing. Mm -hmm. Like, I believe that they would react in that way. Um, and none of, the, none of the levity comes at the cost of the horror of no. what's going on. Feels very just naturally emergent. Sometimes people just say things that can be interpreted as amusing, you know? Well, yeah. I mean, something that's funny is when they do the test on Childs and it confirms that he's fine, he's like, you know, just the screaming of, get me, cut me loose, get me the fuck out. Yeah. Well, because it's he's now funny. on their team, and yeah. we don't know about Gary yet, so, you exactly. know. <laughs> so, cut me loose, goddammit. And then, of course, when Gary gets cleared. <laughs> you know, I know you gentlemen have been through a lot, but when you find the time, I'd rather not spend the rest of the winter tied to this fucking couch. <laughs> Right. <laughs> good shit. Hilarious. Yeah. One really of the things funny. I've it, it's interesting we're talking about like the emergent humor that comes from just human dialogue and emotions and how just sort of naturally it happens when people communicate. Um 
when we were watching, this was something when we were watching Rings of Power, both seasons, the show is so joyless and sterile and lacking in like humor or joy that when you watch a movie like The Thing, which is like gritty and violent and bloody and gory and everything, and there are still points where like you laugh at it, it just makes the, the, the lacking humor in things so like noticeable and stark. Um, yeah, like you have to go Contrast. out of your way to completely remove all of the humor and joy from something. Right. It's, humor is a natural aspect of human psychology. Sometimes it crops up and especially in, in situations that are incredibly dire. You know, yep. there's there's a scene in um, Saving Private Ryan I always think of that's like so legendary to me. It's like it's this sort of intercut scene where the guys uh, gets uh, stabbed um there's it cuts to this guy who's like he's just exhausted and he's shooting this german soldier and they both run out of ammo i think and they both throw oh, their yeah, guns at each other the, and then they both throw their helmets at each other yeah yeah and then he is being shot at but the the american soldier is so fucking tired and exhausted he just kind of waddles behind cover like he doesn't even give a shit that he's about to get shot and he's just like pissed off and i, I find that I find that amusing to watch, but it, like I totally believe it at the same yeah. time. It achieves that I've, magical quality. I've been hurt. You know? Fuck you. Yeah. I'm angry. Well, yeah, that I've and been it is struck. That yeah. tonal contrast, right? Because Melish getting slowly the 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 blade like run through his heart to then Horvath get into this goofy fight with this soldier throwing their yeah. hats and their helmets. Yeah. You, just, uh, you get to a point where you're just so exhausted you don't even care anymore. It's just like, well, I, if I get shot, fine. Whatever. If Well, the we, we talked about this kind of earlier when Blair got uh, captured in the room and, and he, was, he was destroying all the equipment. There's kind of this, this clumsiness to combat um, that mm -hmm. a lot of the times because of how strict and rigid like video game combat can be because there's limitations to animations and things. Um, but like, especially if you watch war footage or just random documentaries about, you know, wartime and battles and stuff, it's very like sloppy and messy. And a lot of it is just, uh, it's very like, obviously it's unscripted. People just kind of doing their best. Um, there's points where people just do, just do whatever, you know, and it gets yeah. captured in this movie really well. And Saving Private Ryan does that too. Like they're still people. Yeah, they've had training and stuff like that. And they know how to operate their equipment and they have things built into their psyche for what to happen when, you know, the, an event happens. But they're still people and people do the best they can. And you're not always firing on all cylinders, working at 100% mentally. When you, um, I, I think that works as a really good contrast to the fact that you have people getting killed and you'll have slow motion or dramatic music or different people screaming and a realization or, or uh, like, like essentially exclaiming for your mother sort of thing. But uh, Horvath actually, in a way, could come across as the most realistic, being like, fuck's sake, when you get shot. You're just like, great. Yeah, it's just like, I'm having a bit shot. Now, this is a problem I have to deal with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's you know, this it's very any human worst. about that. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, it feels very human. Of, you know, like, just when you, you've made, like, some kind of mistake and you're just like, fuck, all right, yeah. now I'm, like, stuck with this problem. Like, well, yeah, it happens me. in our lives. Like, whenever, oh, I'm cutting this apple and my hand slips and I get, like, a little, even if it's, like, a little bitty nick on your finger and it doesn't really hurt that much, you're just, like, you get angry. Mm -hmm. Like, God, I'm so stupid. How could I have possibly yeah, have no, I know. But God well, damn I think, it. I, I don't know why the thing that comes to mind is the spilled milk thing. Do you remember that, Mola? Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course, sir. <laughs> well, you're, you're not about to cry about it, are you? <laughs> no, well, so, so what happened, I, I had milk and I knocked it over on my desk and it went fucking everywhere. And I was like, fuck, I've spilled my milk. And then, and then Mola, because I was on a call with him, was just like, well, you know what they say. Right? Like, it's, I can't remember. Yeah, if I, said, I, I remember thinking like, well... Is, no, you you're know, trying. Like, it's like, you really get a chance to deliver that in that context. Well, yeah. Well, the thing is, it's so true because it's like, well, yeah, I just got to deal with this fucking problem, don't I? I yeah. My milk has been spilt, and there's no use <laughs> crying over it. I just that sounds like a book title. My milk has I been can't. spilt. <laughs> what to do when your milk is spilt? Yeah, I was so mad. I was so angry. I will yell over oh, spilled damn. milk. I will not. Oh God, it's just happened. I, I dropped something like it could be a milk jug or it could be a cup I've just poured and it goes on the floor and you're just like, ah, fuck, I got to clean this up. God damn it. And you get angry. Yeah. Yep. It's uh, 
That's annoying. Things were going so well. So we now we're, we're basically in. This is the third act. This is the finale. Childs is uh, on watch. She's looking out the window, and McCready says that he, Knowles, and Gary are going to go conduct the blood test on Blair. Uh, and so he needs to burn Blair if he attempts to get back inside the station. And so this is the last time that we know for sure that Childs isn't the thing. Mm -hmm. Regardless of what the conclusion is later, this is the last time that we know with certainty that this is a human. Question. Why leave Childs behind? Uh, I, I, think, I think it's in this... I'm not sure, because in this case, it's like you're... Everybody's a human at this point. Uh, as far as they're aware, it's only Blair, and I guess they don't believe that Blair is in a position to have gotten out. So, like, there's no risk. So but I wonder wrong. why not just bring him. Uh, Stay I mean, together. All that I'm not about. sure. Maybe maybe it is the idea that if, if their fight broke out, you know, and they're all out there, if Blair managed to get back inside and, like, lock them out, that that could be a huge problem. That's better to have just one person, even, inside. Maybe. I think I would buy two pairs of two more than I buy one pair, yeah, one three and one one. Um, I agree. But yeah, if it were me, I'd say all four of us are sticking together now because we all know yeah. that we're all not yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. It's not impossible that they make this decision. I could see people make this decision, but it, it strikes me as um, convenient narratively, though it's not the smartest thing to do, and I'm not sure why they would do it. But maybe if they, like you said, if they're worried about like Blair somehow getting out and locking them out, maybe. Maybe that's that's probably the best that you can do for it. Um, but, I mean, of course, considering that this will cause problems for them uh, later. <laughs> um, you yeah. Know, this is uh, this was an error, uh, an erroneous judgment. Floor but, number four. Yeah, the same time still. <laughs> well, yeah, but even is that a flaw with the film, or is it just the characters? This is just a an little example, bit. I think. I, I think it's yeah. a flaw if they, if if not for the like the. So they have the thing of like you know you are gonna hold down this area and that that we need someone here. Like I think that's the what's missing there is why they would need someone there. It, yeah. If if we can make a reason for that, maybe it would work a lot better, but. Yeah, like it's it's too important to the 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 value of having the four of you having completed the test and then all in each other's eyesight going forward. That's that's huge right now. I think so too. They do leave him with a flamethrower, so maybe he thinks that well, you can defend yourself if anyone who isn't us comes. It's just why not take him with you? Maybe they're worried about it getting back in and ambushing him, or something getting back in, like if. Like I see part of the logic, but sticking together is that's pretty it's pretty big, especially pretty right strategy. after the test, fresh yeah. off the test. But I guess they thought, well, you're armed. We need someone to watch our back to make sure no one gets in, because I guess they can't account for all of the bits and pieces. Well, they're that, certainly not ready for the idea that he could have tunneled, you know, into the uh, into the. Or, which or is that a reasonable thing, thing not to predict. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I'm sure they were kind of hoping he was just in there. They test him, but he's clean. They're like, oh, it's exactly. over. Yeah. And they'll be like, it's yeah. over. But unfortunately, when they go outside, the door to the tool shed is open. So Blair is out, even though the door was bolted shut from the outside. And then they go inside and find out that Blair created a fucking underground dungeon where he was working on a spaceship. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Bla Blair is the thing. Blair is, is, <laughs> yeah. is indeed the thing. He's been a busy little bee. Um, and then, th this is one of the really interesting shots to deal with for the, the conversation about uh, whether Childs is the thing at the end, where we get a long sh shot as we're moving through the, the interior of the station. The front door is open, Childs is missing, and the interesting thing is the jacket on the, uh, th that was sitting there next to him, it's, uh, th there was a blue one there, but it's gone. I was like, hmm... Hmm, what do we make hmm. of that? I don't remember the jacket detail. Can you describe it one more time for me? Well, so I remember when, uh, when we see that Childs is looking out the window, he's standing next to, there's like a blue jacket that's hanging on the, hanging next to him. But the next time it looks like there's a white jacket as, as though like the blue jacket was over no. top and, and that got taken. And then the, 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 the sort of the beige one was underneath. I think that's what we're meant to look see there. Because there was 
there was multiple jackets. There was there are it's there not, is it's strange jacket continuity because there are a couple of shots of that cloak room, I guess, um, where yeah. the jacket and boots change locations. Um, it is discussed. I'm not sure there's a lot to draw out of it. It's um, unfortunately probably a continuity error. Maybe, uh, maybe, because there's no reason to have it be. Well, like it's one just of the there's so much. Change. One well, of the big it, things know. people say is that he's wearing a very stark blue uh, coat. When the next time oh, we okay. properly see him at the end, he's not. But he, it, the the counter is he is. It just doesn't look as blue it's because of the lighting and the yeah. snow. Yes, that, looks... that's. I think it's a fair read that it's because of the snow and the light. Yeah, because you can even see with like McCready and stuff that their coats have got snow on them. You know, as as you would, which is probably on purpose, right, to make it a bit harder to tell. But the, but then I suppose the the next thing is is the really interesting one is they're they're looking out the window and um, Noel spots looks like Childs running out into the storm, and then the lights turn off. I was like, oh, what's what's going on? Um, and then McCready concludes that the thing must have gone back inside and blown the generator, which means that the thing is going to try and freeze itself until it gets discovered by the rescue team in spring. That that's like the best option available to it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, at this point, the crew resolves to blow up the station, which they know will guarantee their deaths, but also will kill the thing and thus save the world. That's like love... the plan that they resolve to have. Yeah, I love the sort of self-sacrificial heroism of that. It's well, great. there's a certain camaraderie that they, they seem to have here as well, that they all oh, know yeah. that they're human and that they <laughs> are now in a position to stop the thing and defeat it. I suppose what's interesting in terms of marking the conflict is now now this is like an open conflict. Throughout the whole film, it's been like, oh, well, shit, who's the thing? But now we know Blair for sure is the thing, and we need to combat him. Like, they're actively fighting against each other right now, yeah. which is a really cool change in the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Right. I think it's really neat. But, uh, yeah, they, they get to work. They blow up uh, the Blair thing's spaceship, and they blow up most of the station. Just blowing it up. Mm -hmm. Dynamite and fire and all sorts. Yeah, fuck that spaceship. I... Right. Do you think that this served as part of the inspiration for Dead Space 3? <laughs> uh, which, what are you referring to specifically? So when, when they go down to Tal Volantis, um, you know, obviously the, the story takes place long after the... Uh, like, it's like a hundred something years after a group called the Sovereign Colony Armed Forces SCAF. Um, discovered the all the marker stuff on Tal Volantis and so everyone there like sabotages and destroys everything so that the infection can't leave Tal Volantis um they they scuttle all the ships they blow up all the transports on the planet they they destroy a bunch of stuff and it's a frozen planet and I wonder if they got that idea was kind of inspired by the thing where they do a similar thing here they blow up the research station uh, to try and kill it, knowing that they're not going to survive, but to prevent it from I getting mean. to the rest uh, of humanity. I mean, I guess it wouldn't even surprise me, especially with the whole, like, you know, frozen setting anyway. Then I guess mm -hmm. there's a modifier, though, with the fact that Tau Volantis was the, the, the world with the aliens, and then they froze it. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's like a different um, yeah, modifier. I, I think yeah. it might actually have been confirmed that the thing was an inspiration for Dead Space 3, but that's if it wasn't, then I, I can totally... It to makes total sense that this would feed into the creation yeah. of that game, yeah. yeah. I mean, in a sense, it feels like necromorphs. They're not. It's not the same as the thing, really. But there's a level of you know the whole like body. Yeah, the similar. If it gets stuff. yeah, if it gets to humanity, it'll infect and spread. We have to stop that, even yeah. if it means sacrificing ourselves. That kind of thing. Um. So. so they they head underground, and the they discover that the generator has been completely destroyed. Um, and so now that's it's it's just about destroying the remainder of the station, setting up dynamite in the underground portion. But uh, the the trio splits up. They uh they split up, and 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 Gary he he rounds the corner as he's working on his uh flashlight, which isn't working. And then Blair thing pops up and grabs him, and it's, it's it nice and pretty spooky. This one. Yeah, yeah, this one's nice and spooky. It's uh it's he just darts out, <laughs> blank stare as he um. uh. That effect, I think they knew what they had with that one because it hangs on it a bit. They're like, this looks fucking good. <laughs> this, this, there's no yeah. problem here of uh, worrying about it not looking good enough. 
It's yeah. just it's just gross. It's like this. It's already got him, sort of thing. It's too late. And uh, the blank oh, rather, expression. Sorry, the, the the generator is gone, not destroyed. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that reaction. A horrible way to it's go, a... indeed. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, and then uh, while that's happening, Knowles appears to notice something. Uh, and so he goes looking for Gary, uh, but then disappears. And then McCready sort of looks up and realizes, like, "Oh shit, I'm I'm alone. This is yeah. it. Like, I'm 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 on my own." Which is uh, very much like a damn Dude, the... that happened so quickly as well. You know that like the way he lifts up the plunger, like as he's thinking about what could possibly be happening, he's also getting ready to be just be like, "Fuck, <laughs> it's so over." Like... Yeah. Well, yeah, and then he he lights the dynamite, but then the uh the thing bursts through the floorboards. Like, well, so it's, uh... the impression I got here was that the thing is looking at him slash senses him, and it's it's like they're both squaring off as like make your move. Are you gonna do it? Are you gonna do it? And then it, when he does it, the thing's like fuck. I gotta go for you now. Like it can't approach him in any way necessarily without revealing itself. And so mm -hmm, when he begins right. to light it, the thing is like fuck, 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 no, 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 like <laughs> yeah. And then burst out, and then you get the big horrific amalgamation of several well, entities. Before before we get to this amazing <laughs> thing they've constructed, do they do stop motion for the tentacles when yeah. it like, comes up through the floor and grabs the thing? It was that uh, I think I noticed it, but it's good to see that kind of thing, you know. Still, it's fun. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> it is fun. I appreciate it. I like it. I think yeah, some of those old stop motion movies are just really neat to see that that was a whole thing that they did, the the CGI I, before CGI kind of stuff. I think stop motion was used uh, at least a couple of times in larger quantities, but only snippets of it uh, were used in the edit, just because you you know if you hang on it too long, you start seeing the stuttery nature of it. I think. Well, it's because there's, I think there's, there's a lack of motion blur with uh, yeah, stop motion. They, they do a combination. I think when it goes through the floor, I think the planks of wood and everything, I think those are real. They actually have yeah. something bursting through the floor. So that part's real. Mm -hmm. And then you just have the, the tentacle bits coming through. And it, it is really short. But uh, you, you your brain clearly knows what's being conveyed here. But I was just thinking, oh, I think in order to do this, they might have had to use stop motion. You could, you could just you could tell if you kind of know about it and look for it. Mm. But I love to see it. It looks great. Love now, to see as it. I understand it, they kind of had to fight for enough money to complete the uh, the Blair thing at the end because, as mentioned previously, they went over budget on this movie. Uh, I think it initially had a ten million dollar budget and ended up being fifteen million, with about one point five million for the special effects, which actually resulted in a few things being cut. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, as I understand it, they had to fight for a little bit of extra money to make sure that they could uh, create this one, which is uh. Yeah, it's a, it is a crazy one. This one is uh, gnarly. I mean, they all are, but, you know. <laughs> spending five million to have people talk about your movie forever, especially in hindsight. <laughs> one, you do 1. Think, 5 like, million. Yeah. Oh, 1. 5 million. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I thought, oh, oh, I, thought you, I thought you said the budget was 10, but it went over. Oh, oh yeah, I mean, it, it went over, but the, the special effects budget wasn't meant to be 1.5 million itself. That went over as well. Okay. It's, it's just it. that it kept going up because of a variety of different things. Okay. Um, <laughs> I get, yeah, early on you mentioned shooting on location, delays, weather and stuff. Yes, re but... re rewriting the script so more stuff could take place outdoors. Isn't it interesting that you have companies now who throw hundreds of millions of dollars time and time again at movies and shows that nobody gives a shit about two weeks later, let alone like when they release? And then this movie goes over, you know, budget a bit to have a movie that people talk about for it. Like, it's, it's literally been generations at this point, I think. Or, you know, it's two years from being generations people have talked well, about I mean, this movie. Yeah, this film is so. 42 years old. Oh, 42? Oh, it has, it's literally been generations that this movie has been talked about now. So, it's crazy. Like, the money, man. You could spend, you could throw it at nothing or you can throw it at something. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it doesn't always get spent on something useful. I mean, the amount of money that gets pissed away in the industry on projects that are not, you know, that that don't have the script done, or there's a bunch of casting issues. I always think about that Kevin Smith story when he was making Die Hard Four, and there's a day where they're waiting for Bruce Willis to show up, and they pissed away like hundreds of thousands of dollars that day, and they didn't get anything done. 
<laughs> and it's just like yeah, fuck. Well, I mean, you could have done so much with that that money, you know. That, yeah. <laughs> it's funny to do a raw numbers long. conversation because it wasn't worth it technically for the box office wise, but perhaps maybe they made it back in like DVD and home video sales. Oh, uh, they might have because I might. I think that may well have happened for a, a decent number of John Carpenter's films that they did better uh, when Someone they released on that. home. I was video. Uh, I was looking at some some stuff about this movie talking about because i briefly looked like what this movie didn't sell well when it came out did it lose to anything at the box office did anything suck away all of its attention or whatever just kind of well, wasn't blade runner it. that's for sure no it <laughs> wasn't <laughs> blade runner um, also didn't do well Fucking... but someone had mentioned that vhs played a role in kind of keeping this movie alive and really spreading it out and i think the same was it was the same thing was the case for austin powers too i think was i don't think it did the first one it didn't do that great at the theaters but then it was the VHSs and the extra sales afterwards that really just revitalized it to the point where it got sequels. Was it E.T. that eclipsed this film? Is that is that the... Well, yeah, it's a big e. one. Oh, yeah, if fuck E.T. That came movie. out the same year and E.T. <laughs> was the highest grossing film of all time uh, at, at its release. Only to be beaten by Jurassic Damn Park Damn you, later. Spielberg! <laughs> yeah. Minor thing yeah. about this scene that bugs me. So it's it's tunneling under the ground like tremors. It emerges in all its crazy, gory, awesome glory, and then just kind of hangs there for a minute. Um, I mean, instead of attacking him, it could have misjudged the exit point, and then as we've seen it in past points in the film, it does seem like it needs like rev up time with a lot of the decisions it makes for attacking things. Yeah. Like, okay. uh, you can see parts of it erupting. It, it does seem like the... Th I mean, it's a, probably a choice I would have had for this creature, because you gotta... You can't make it like it is in the 2011 movie. Otherwise, it can't be stopped. Like, um, you yeah, need it to take strong. time to generate things and to prep itself, sort of thing. I mean, it's to be like McCready said, that it's vulnerable out in the open, so I'd rather hide in its imitation. Uh, I mostly agree with you. The thing I would push back on is that it, it killed and subsumed the other two very quickly. Well, you could argue, right, that what's happening, what we're seeing here is the is the attempt at subsuming them, and it's not, like, done yet. It's this, like, horrible mess because it's still figuring things out. Yeah, which, which follows. Except That's that if follow. it's, like, tunneling under the ground really quickly and then, like, well, it can do that. dynamite away. I meant like to to, to, to be more him. um it like it didn't it didn't complete the process of turning itself into a, 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 a normal human shape. It was still like a That's monster. Fair. But it can't attack Kurt Russell and um, disarm him. Like I said, I think that it's 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 revving up. It's it, it's still erupting. Pieces are coming off and and coming out of it. We we saw that with the dog portion. We saw it with the the blood yeah, it test scene like it thing. seems to do a lot you could have said like why didn't it immediately just fucking splatter across the entire room in the blood scene but it looks like it's prepping the the whole vibration and the it's like it, it's like it's building yeah. itself up yes except that right before it emerges in front of kurt russell here it's like ton moving really quickly under the ground it's yoinking the dynamite away it's just like there's there's something that feels like Either we either we linger on the shot too long because they're so proud of the effects, which are great. But like something about that moment feels a little long for it to not be doing anything to him to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. How far away is Kurt? Uh, sorry, Mel Gibson. How far <laughs> is he away from it at this point? Uh, it's pretty close. I'd have to look to see exactly how far. Um, we'll see in a second on screen again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. It's, you know, a couple feet. Pretty close. Yeah. It's pretty close. Pretty close. Yeah. Like, if it mm. fell on him from there, it would probably achieve its goals. But he, it he comes up. up, it roars, it's got, like, little dogs coming out of him, and all sorts of fun, gross stuff. For well, a bit. Fast enough. Didn't get him. Because McCready does a little roll. He does a roll and gets He's, right. It could be an editing thing, in. too. Um, as in that that sequence of showing all the shots of what it's doing, it could be that McCready is actually getting up and rolling away while that's happening, if you understand what I'm saying. That's true. That's right. Well, but, um, yeah. Maybe it's I like... I wouldn't uh... assume that, but that's fine. Well, no, but you Have should assume that, it? right? Like, Because it makes more sense. No. What do you mean no? No, because they follow on chronologically. Why would you assume that we actually rewound in time? Because films then... do it all the time. What do you mean? 
When yes. whenever something they happens, they do that at the beginning when the guy gets shot. Well, yeah, uh, a, we do this in the film several the times in terms of an event, and then we show several reactions. We're not they're, they're not necessarily real time continuity ones, as opposed to that was his reaction, that was his reaction, that was his reaction. This is right, like you know, this is a really common cinematic technique it to can give us. Be. It's not. I wouldn't say it's. But why wouldn't you? Com they do it in this movie already. They do it at the beginning. What, what I'm saying is you, it makes you, the film make more the, sense, so why wouldn't you? Well, I think you would I think you would need a reason to believe that that's the that that is I wouldn't assume it on the movie's behalf just because it improves the movie. You know what I'm saying? That doesn't seem But like what's the scene in the beginning where they sort of cheat time like that that you're thinking uh, of? I don't. I don't know if I'd call it cheating, but it's when the uh, when well, you... the Norwegian when the Norwegian guy shows up and he is shooting at the group and he hits um, uh, Bennings in the leg. He shoots and then we get like a second or so before to have the people there and then we see the bullet impact his leg, so that it like makes more sense to us as a viewer as to what happened. Okay, so so, so I guess it's just I didn't read it in this scene as ever like the monster comes up the slow thing out of it i didn't i didn't see enough evidence to assume that kurt russell's actually jumping away while that's okay. happening especially because we're not hearing it either I, I i wouldn't call it cheating personally but i do well, know I, what I'm you mean because like, no 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 i i know what you mean because things are not happening in real time for that brief moment but like sometimes like there's a bunch of moments in movies where you, you need the audience to understand every beat of what's happening but you can't like you obviously can't stack shots together well right? it, so let's so, say for example it bursts out we show the kurt russell shot we cut back for maybe one or two seconds of moving toward it then we cut back to kurt getting up to grab the the dynamite then we cut back to the thing as it's erupting one of the dog heads then we cut back to kurt and he gets does the roll cut back to the thing roaring cut back to kurt and then he's like I could totally see in the editing room where they're like, "This isn't. This is way too choppy." Like if we do it well, so that we get cut longer. a few of those, but yes, I, I I just don't. It doesn't read to me at all like what we're meant to assume is that while the dog is slowly bursting out, that Kurt Russell is jumping in that time, especially like I said, because we don't hear it. I don't think you need to hear it. I think you need to hear it. I, th I think the, the, the camera being as close to the thing, thing making its noises, I don't need to hear the it rolling. Well, I just, I, I need to, I would need something to assume that's what's happening. I don't, I, I don't know why it wouldn't be enough that it slots in, but, would be why you'd, you'd assume that instead. What do you mean that it slots? Well, we, we, we do need to see him rolling, right? And if we heard him rolling over the previous shot, then seeing him rolling right after would make sense. No, but it, right? so, so it's better to preserve the sound for the shot that it belongs to. And we do need to see all those beats. And That's plus, hearing the thing. same thing twice to yeah, okay. scenes exactly would probably, yeah, just yeah, for the no. sake of not being confusing. Yeah. I think you're right about that. Yeah, I just, the only thing I take issue with is the logic that because it improves the moment, that's why I should assume that's what's happening. I've always felt that that's what we do with everything. When we have two options that both work, we'll pick the one that's more in line with what the movie's going for. For the, that's just like good faith. I mean, well, I, that, I, like every I would, alien speaks in English is like such a commonly accepted version of this that we don't even even think about it. I would say that's a whole different thing, but um, I would say sometimes there are things that there's no evidence to assume and that assuming it on the part of the movie just seems like you're doing the work for them. I've no, as all. long as I'm not inventing anything, I completely disagree with that assessment. It's it's working with what they give me and to not assume the worst, I'll assume the best. Doomer media moment. What the fuck are you talking about? Sorry, I just you know. No. <laughs> no. I get. Yeah. I completely have, understand have what you're reasons. saying, and there are yeah. times where oh, that God. will be tested. Cap offered an explanation. He's, he's, he's yeah. Yeah, to he's, yeah, in chat. <laughs> no, no, I know. That's what I'm saying. Cap is not having yeah. a Doomer moment. He's no, what, what's ha what he's doing is something that I Cap, know have I have been done. Watching movies for thirty years. Uh, there is. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there are definitely times in in stories where there is one explanation that may make a thing work that is so not at all what I believe happened from what I saw that it's hard for me to be like, yeah, okay, that's what happened, sure. Yeah, so I get it. That's all I'm getting at. But um, I do generally think we try to have that as a rule that if there's an explanation and it's the only one that could possibly work, that we try to give the movie the benefit of the doubt, even movies we hate. 
which you know when it's a fucking marvel movie or a newest one we'll we'll run through like a thousand excuses for why some dumbass spell from doctor strange doesn't or does work and by the end of it everyone's like why are we still here and it's like just to make sure you understand how bad this is that's all versus yeah you know, talking about a, a a cinematic flourish here, which in this case, debating whether or not this is error number five or if there's nothing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nothing wrong. Yeah, that moment didn't. It's just the way it read to me. As, I, I, just, and I would have moved the I thing guess. further back uh, for this sequence. Yeah. Probably <laughs> would be the move. Yeah, I think so. It's a little. But thing. I mean, regardless, uh, it's a big McCready, thing. Actually, it's the biggest no, thing in the whole thing. Actually. McCready, he does a little roll, and uh, and then he, he turns back and looks at the thing screeching at him, and he says, yeah, fuck you too, and throws a stick of dynamite at him. It's a great away, one blows up. I love it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just feel so raw of like, yeah, fuck off, dick. <laughs> like, I hate you. You're an asshole. <laughs> well, um, dad. Bye. I actually think it really does uh, spell to us that he's recognized, as does the thing. As the, it just, it just like, yeah, this was a big old fight between you two at this point. Yeah, exactly. And the thing's pissed off at him for like, yeah, all right, I guess uh, oh, it's not over yet. And you, you know, fuck you but, uh, too. It's just like, yeah. But he gets it, him. It's, it's a great finishing line. And usually, like, when I see movies with like a, a line like that where it's simply like, fuck you or eat this or something, like, oh my God. A lot of the time I'll roll my eyes and be like, oh my God, that's the best you can come up with. But here <laughs> it actually works because he is taking into He's account what this monster must be thinking. And it's yeah, thinking, I mean, fuck the human race. And then he's thinking in response to that, well, fuck you as well. Like, we don't exactly. want you here. Yeah, yeah, when he's got that lit stick of dynamite and he brings his arm back to throw it and he says, get away from her, you bitch. And then he throws the dynamite at it. <laughs> oh, it was, it was Rags, crazy. It was no, deliver it's, it's, it properly. It's, it's get away from her, you <laughs> bitch. Stop it. Stop <laughs> it. No, this one's great. It's it's just the raw frustration of fuck you, like totally, completely, and utterly get fucked. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, yeah this up. isn't. I don't even want to be clever. Just, yeah. I just hate you. And you're, it's also yeah. a fuck you too you. in response to that demonic moaning. Exactly. Thing yeah. yeah, I love it's, it. It's it's the word too that makes it right. If it was just yeah. fuck it you, is. it'd be kind of lame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, but that's it, and the the whole the whole station goes up and it explodes. A whole bunch of explosions. That that's it. The station is absolutely ruined. A blammo. And, um, I like McCready, the um, he, he, like, explosions he, in general. I don't know what it is about this one in particular. I think it's the contrast of the darkness. I really like this explosion. <laughs> this this, yeah. this one yeah. is beautiful. Well, it feels like a massive eruption against complete darkness, right? Yeah. In a yeah. sense. Like the explosion resisting the encroaching darkness. Well, hey, this one last hurrah of You humanity. can combine that with the one liner. It's it's the humanity saying one last fuck you to this creature we couldn't possibly understand that's way more powerful than us, that is yeah. from a different world. It's like, yeah, fuck you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, it's very cathartic uh, for the ending of a film, especially when there aren't that many explosions in the movie, yeah. you know, to, to end it's with a big one. It's one of those movies where all the dark values, like, are in terms of the picture, are really dark. Like, the color grading yeah. is really well done. Well, it's a, it's yeah. it's also the film stock it was shot on. A lot of like oh, so many fucking right. great movies yeah. from the seventies and eighties are use this one particular film stock. I think it's called Eastman One Hundred T. But that film stock was very very high contrast, and it like really crunches blacks like that. So it's just pitch black. And of course, it's the only source of light in the scene. So it really <laughs> shines oh, yeah, in contrast yeah. to everything else. It's not competing mm -hmm. with the sunlight. Which uh, brings us to the final scene of the film. No. McCready shuffles through the, the, the wreckage. He sits down, and Childs approaches from behind. And uh, McCready asks, you know, you're the only one who made it. And, uh, and McCready says, N not the only one. And then Childs asks, did you kill it? To which McCready asks the very apt question, where were you? It's kind of the question on everybody's mind at this moment. Where did you go? And then Child says he thought he saw Blair and went after him and got lost in the storm. This is strange. It's a strange story, isn't it? It's a bit <laughs> like, huh, did you? You know, like it's a little right. bit too it's a little bit too odd of a of a cover story for uh for what happened, you know? Because of course right. they said, like, well, if, if Blair comes back, burn him, but like you ran out. The generator went off. You got lost in the storm. Like, I don't know about that, bro. <laughs> well, I mean, I actually don't think there's anything inherently um, 
I mean, it, obviously, you can be suspicious of it, but I, I think the story works. I think it works. It's no, just it makes what I'm it, it it's, gives it's, it's, a, it's a little sus. bit odd. It's, all, it's, it's, oh yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, sure. it's sus. It's not. It's not implausible, but yeah. it's not great. Yeah. The the um, fact the lights are off, and I don't know if there's anything for him to. At this point, it's a I risky mean, early move, on, but I guess if you yeah. thought, you know, that's the thing, that's the last. If we get him, it's all over. So I just gotta, gotta go. I'm well, gonna get him. I, I assume that the lights are still on when he sees Blair scurrying about, and then he goes after him. Then the generator goes out, and now he's stuck out there in the darkness. He had, he doesn't have like the rope tether that everyone else is yeah, using. Right. To go. So now he's I mean, actually out yeah. there in the darkness. He could, but it almost feels like that emphasizes why did you do that? Why would you? Why did you just stay inside? Um, where it was safer, uh, compared to if it was the thing, right? Like if he, if he wants to get frozen running out to the storm, that's a good way to do it. To then get discovered I, later, even though that's, love, that's not like a great plan, but still. Yeah. I love the line getting lost in the storm and beyond the literal. It's just like, this was so fucked up. What yeah, we all went through. Whole thing yeah. And it's just yeah. like. What what does it even mean to be a human being at this point? To exist in a universe where a life form this bizarre and fucked up can exist and thrive, you know? Where part of its defense mechanism, part of the reason that it thrives is on being as terrifying and appalling as possible in a way that it disarms its victims. Where it's just like, what the fuck? And then it takes advantage of that, you know, them being frozen like a deer in headlights or something, you know? like. What kind That's of universe both, um, allows for this? Someone in chat has pointed out, like, it, he couldn't have seen Blair, right? Like, Blair would have had to have been inside working on the, the, uh, the generator because the generator goes off, like, so soon after he leaves that, like, either, either he, d he thought he saw Blair, but, like, how could he? Because we know that all three of the, uh, the guys were in the building and Blair must have been inside of the station um so he could have seen what he thought was blair or he could be lying part of the thing right is like Wait, it's, it's i don't understand yeah. why he couldn't have seen blair well so he runs out into the storm and then about five seconds later the lights go out is it that quick i can't remember it's it's real quick okay. it's really really quick um it just makes it, it really odd um but obviously there's still more to talk about in this scene um, and, uh, you know, McCready pretty, signals pretty clearly, like, that he's very skeptical of him, and, and Charles is like, all right, like, what are you doing? And then, uh, McCready basically says, you know, we're not really in much of a position to do anything about the, about our predicament of, of figuring out who is the thing. Uh, and then, you know, Charles is like, well, so what, what should we do? And McCready's like, why don't we just wait here a little while, see what happens? Which is a really fun line. I, oh, like I fucking that. love it because um, <laughs> there's so many there's so many things for us to talk about. One thing that's just on my mind right now is like, well, what if if one of them suggested let's do a blood test? And if you if you imagine yourself as McCready right now, like yeah, we could do a blood test. We both bleed. We we set up, and then if you're the thing, you just fucking kill me. You jump on me. You do whatever because it's like, well, I'm not gonna let you corner me like that. If you're not the thing, it's like, well. I guess that gamble pays off, you know? Like, I get to know the truth and I don't have to die. Or, I don't do the test and I live for a little bit longer, assuming you're not the thing, assuming you are the thing, sort of thing. It's, there's so many different results that can happen here, depending on what the case is for everybody, that it's, it's, it's almost like I get Kurt Russell's fucking point of view here of just... Uh, let's just... Sometimes people are just tired. <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah. Yeah. They, well... If you look at him, he looks fucking exhausted. It's like, I'm just, let's, let's just wait it out. The let's thing is, happens. though, he still might have the trick up his sleeve because uh, McCready hands Childs a bottle of alcohol, or what appears to be alcohol. Childs drinks it, and then McCready chuckles. Now, there's a, there are a lot of ideas about what this means. Uh, about I've what, heard what some of these, means. yes. So one of them is that, um, given that it was established earlier... That um that they shouldn't you know eat or drink anything that anybody else has used. It is weird that Childs would drink it when if McCready is the thing, which he could believe he is, that would be a risk. But if he was the thing and he wasn't afraid about being contaminated, then maybe he would just drink it and thus out himself. Basically, uh, I believe another one is that the bottle might have uh like petrol in it that it's not actually alcohol. 
um, that if he was a human, that he would drink it and spit it out immediately. Uh, that one, because he doesn't do that. I don't that quite buy, more, because like, yeah. if you watch the scene right before Childs makes himself known, it looks like uh, McCready's about to drink it. It's like, yeah. I think it's real. Um, and there's also the angle of, why would we assume the why thing can't the tell thing the difference in the gas. taste of gasoline exactly. and alcohol? That, that's, well, there's like yeah. a there's a physical reason why humans are like built into like being able to recognize and be repulsed by rotting meat yeah. and things like that. There are some things that are, you, you try to eat something inedible yeah. and you typically will just know that, oh, my body knows this isn't, this isn't for me. I think that one was more popular as an idea, but not so much anymore. The, uh, the, the petrol one. Um, I think that one's a bit more like, hmm. Yeah. I don't think I also so. don't. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, going back to the objecting to drinking from it because it could be contaminated, I, I don't believe that that's proof that it's um, the thing. because It's not definitive proof, necessarily. No, but right. we've also demonstrated earlier that they stopped caring about contamination to a degree, especially when it comes to the blood samples. So I, I think the thing I would go at is a human could make that mistake. Oh, but, of course. It could course. be that Childs himself is resigned to like, well, who fucking cares anymore, right? So like, I think that it could be that. Anything. As you mentioned, though, it could also be that he is the thing, and the thing even knows about that, and it just drinks it up being like, yeah, Fuck are you, you going to yeah. make a move? <laughs> that sort of thing? Yeah, that, right. that's an option as well. Now, isn't another thing that people talk about is the idea of the breath? That's, uh, that's, I know that's something that's important. Unfortunately, the breath and the eyes are both not useful. Um, yeah. Because we have too many references throughout the film of that, it's like both breath and eyes not being following the the code, so to speak. Like it would have been really cool if they had matched it one hundred percent throughout the film, but they don't. We see breath not only coming out of Charles's mouth in this scene. Uh, if you look at very, if you get autistic about it, but you also get certain scenes earlier where people are explicitly like definitely the thing, and you can definitely see them uh, making breath and in, in you know like steam coming out of their mouth. So. Is that there's also um, the effort to not make eyes gleam and reflect to, to represent them as the thing as a little tell, but there are several moments where people who are explicitly again the thing have reflections in their eyes, even in the blood test um, section yeah. with uh, Hopper, he, you can see his eyes reflect in a particular shot. So you could say, well, yeah, but that's that's a that's a mess up, and it's like, yeah, there's too many references to use it, uh, but. With all of this in mind, and we can do some more references as well, I think this is all happily what John Carpenter wanted. Definitely is. He's uh, never yeah. said. He's never confirmed uh, one way or the other, like, who you is the thing. Guys, I'll... Uh, you hear that? Ridley? <laughs> Don't say... <laughs> yeah, apparently, he, ha he has said that he knows, but he won't tell anybody. Well, he yeah, he won't tell anybody what well, it is, is what I'm saying. Like, he wants the mystery to endure. Didn't, um... Didn't the cinematographer make the claim that Childs was, and then John Carpenter said, the cinematographer doesn't know the answer, I do. Uh, that's <laughs> something like that. It feels like funny, because now this is reminding me of the fights on Blade Runner, yeah. right? Between, <laughs> between different people involved well, so... <laughs> on uh, whether or not De uh, Deckard is a uh, replicant or not. What I think I find so valuable about the lack of answer or lack of definitive explicit answer for the thing is that this absolutely generates the full back and forth conversation and, and, and you'll get a lot of people being like, nah, it's fucking, it is Childs, definitely. And then some people are like, no, it's not, it isn't him, you're wrong. Like this aggressive sort of fight over, I'm not going to necessarily say all of the audience is paranoid, but they're using the same references that a lot of people might have used in the real world where this happened, and they're acting in similar ways, and you're getting the experience that the film was actually desperately trying to pull off more effectively than maybe it even realized it would, that it has four decades later, people are still debating back and forth with all the details and not trusting any given character at any given time because of different references Where's that can come up. That's the point. Exactly, you know, that's what I think like he was going for, thing, and yeah. he nailed this better than most directors could ever fucking dream of. Absolutely, this ending is perfect. This was not the original ending as well. This uh, oh. they, they arrived on this later. Well, so, so oh, uh, we should ending. probably mention what? there are some people who might say like, well, but this it gets confirmed in the game that uh, both of them are human, and it, there's confirmations in different third parties. It's like we're just considering the movie, and that is not in any of the movies either. Just well, this sorry. one. So something to bear in mind in terms of it is that in the in the novella, the the humans win like in a very definitive way. They very definitively prevail over the thing. Um, so there's that. 
Uh, but as I understand it, in the original ending, McCready and Childs were both going to be the thing and then get rescued uh, in the spring. But um, that, that John Carpenter didn't like it. He didn't like this as an ending. And so then eventually, uh, him and the screenwriter Lancaster settled on um this ending with with yeah. the with the desire to emphasize the ambiguity of the situation like that that was important that the ambiguity was um mm -hmm. was something that was strived for which of course i i really really enjoy uh it's it's uh i mean i, I love this ending it's um it's really it's, good, it's so good. The, it, the thematic... it is exactly what kind of ending it is and it just embraces it the thematic content of the film that it's so clearly about trust between humans and the deterioration of trust to end this in any conclusive way would be a step down. I mean, the ambiguity the is, makes the you point. You should trust clear. people. You it's, shouldn't um, trust people. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy be to say that there's kind of like differences in terms of, cause something I would say about the novella is there's a bit more of an emphasis on like the, the prevailing of humanity. Um, it's, it's kind of like um, the, the, the sort of contrast between the distrust that they have of each other to when they know that they're all human, the, the camaraderie of working together and prevailing. There's like a really sharp contrast there. Uh, obviously here, we, we got that in part, right? That by the end of the film, when, when, uh, when McCready, Gary, and Knowles recognize that they're all human, they all basically work together. They're very cooperative. But obviously, yeah. it's like you're going for different things. It's like kind of like what, what exactly is the angle you want to run with? So I'd say like, in this film, in the way that it's all been presented in this film, I would say any ending other than this one, I would be less happy with. But like, yeah. as for having a different ending with the same premise going in different directions, that's a bit more like, well, it depends on what the, the goal is. But in this case, the goal is definitely to establish that like, yeah, you don't know, don't you? And ain't that fucking scary. Well, so yeah. uh, out of curiosity, would any of you label this ending even partially or fully nihilistic? No. no, I mean, no. I have a Nihilist problem with the nihilistic. word nihilistic because, okay, so because what nihilism ought to mean, based on the word itself, is like a belief that there is no meaning at all. But usually, like what it's just lack used of to value mean to things, yeah, is just like extreme pessimism, which uh, I'm, I, 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 that's a pet peeve of mine. But I wouldn't call this pessimistic, really, because I mean, obviously, there's a fifty-fifty chance that they won, in a sense. So I definitely yeah. wouldn't call it so, nihilistic. I recently uh, have, have found it very annoying how much um, films with what you would call sad endings, bad endings, tragic endings get called nihilistic, because that's not what that means, as you've just laid out. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the first times I've ever felt the need to call a film nihilistic was actually Joker 2. I, after seeing it, <laughs> yeah. it actively felt like it was taking meaning and destroying it. It was like, no, you're yeah. not allowed that, you're not allowed that, and it was just like, fuck Values, me, dude. meanings are bad, this, right, and we hate them, and it's all shit. Yeah. This, for me, is a horror film through and through, and it, it fucking comes through on that. It gives The only reason this has the effect it does is because of the contrast with what humanity is capable of, and it's showing like a dark side to the light side as uh, was just mentioned the cooperation in this film almost gets them the win like definitively it really gets them close it's just like that paranoia that yeah. interest in self-preservation uh, when you can't be sure of your fellow man sort of stuff it's a real thing that humans deal with and that to me is hyper meaningful to make you think about yeah, what, all the ways look at that, what they're able to accomplish yeah like and that's what I see the point of horror films is is to have a dark reflection on humanity and all of our like darkest moments, all of our failings, all of the ways we can be destroyed, and then obviously by uh, things outside of ourselves. But this movie, as much as the thing as a monster is incredibly effective, it it's definitely making a point about humanity itself. Yeah, I mean, th this ending, I could never regard it as nihilistic or pessimistic or whatever because. It, it doesn't serve to diminish the idea of trust between people. If anything, it's it's a cautionary tale about, like, we need to be able to trust each other. You know, well, in the, order at to, the end, yeah, once they, once, once they do the test, they cooperate and they do all this stuff. And that's what essentially... And they become very probably, effective. Yeah, absolutely. Once that happens. It's really mm -hmm. tough for a film to argue that cooperation is dumb, actually, and it's terrible, and you're strongest when you're alone. It's a really, it, it's not a message you see often in films and stories. It, it's a tough sell. Yeah. The Joker 2 example is interesting. I actually agree. Cause that, that ending felt like you are just trying to, it feels like you're just trying to piss me off or upset me. 
and well, it just like, doesn't feel like it's in in service of anything it's, respectable. It's, it's, it's just kind of like a big fuck you, right, to the audience. It's just right. uh, well, we're, that whole film. Where this film, like, it, like Joker Two is closing doors throughout the film of meaning. It's like can't be that one, not that one either, not this one. This one just kicks open a fucking coliseum of doors. And it's like, all right, go nuts, <laughs> bye. And you're like, holy shit. Exactly, because the film is not... I mean, I suppose... You, I, if, if nihilistic just means that they died, that's pretty stupid <laughs> as, a, yeah. as a way of defining it as being nihilistic. Conversely, yeah. if, if there's no way to have a definitive conclusion about it, then that can... How can that be nihilistic if you're in a position to think more optimistic and positive things about the mm -hmm. ending, which avenues of which are available to you. I suppose it depends on what your interpretation, right? Because kind of a thing here is that, well, there's a viability that McCready and Childs are both human, but like they can never know it with each other because fundamentally the, the existence of the thing means that if you are apart and then you reconvene, you don't know. But like, it wouldn't it, wouldn't it be stu like, what what can you do other than acknowledge that that is the reality of the situation? Right, anything right. less than that would be dishonest. It would be dishonest to what the point of the film is. That's why this yeah. is. That's why it's such a good ending because it's really following through on what the the film is about. This is the point of the film, essentially distilled to its purest form, which is you don't know, you don't know, and you can't know. Um, and how does that make you feel? It reminded me a bit of uh, the um, uh, the conversation made in the seventies. Gene Hackman. Mm -hmm. um, he's like a. He's a like I don't know if he's a government agent, but he he works in surveillance. He's like a he's PI, like a PI like surveillance yeah. guy, yeah. But uh, he like he does that for a living. And at, at some point in the film, it turns on him where he believes he's being bugged, and by the end of the movie, tears apart his entire house, and he's left the the space that he's living in is just sort of a metaphor of his destroyed mindscape because he doesn't he's lost trust in everything was there a bug in his house wasn't there it doesn't matter the point is that is that he has been destroyed by his paranoia um yeah and and that's so, sort of a similar thing here where it's like the the point is the ambiguity that's its strength it's good it's a good ending i like it i well, like it to is. think that they're both that they're both human and they died nobly that's what i like i, I don't know well, that's where i'm at Really, I was no, say, not, the case is, not to like, ruin that, but the, the idea that they're both human, they both never believe that about each other, and they both die. Like, <laughs> they die. Yeah. you know, well, I no, still because then they saved, then they saved you know, the world. They saved Correct. Humanity. Yeah, that, that's yeah. totally fair. Um, uh, and I'm with Fringy. I have no idea. I don't know. I I, I, don't I find know. it all fascinating. I adore this movie. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Which it uh... is one of the best. It is like I said, forty, forty-two years, and we're still talking about it. And I am still. Yeah, I actually told right. so, someone messaged me as we were um doing this, and they asked, "Hey, you know what? Like a casual, what's up?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm just doing a podcast. We're talking about the thing, it's one of the best horror movies ever." And like they hadn't heard about it, which is odd to me. Maybe they're maybe they live on Mars, but I was like, "Yeah, you you need to see this movie. It's one of the greatest like movies ever." So as time goes on, video games are the same way. People come in, people go. It's like a cycle. People discovering the movie and enjoying it, and new people discovering the movie and enjoying it. And it's just, it's timeless. Nothing's going to invalidate this. I read, a, I read a funny little test screening story where John Carpenter was present and someone put their hand up and they were like, so which one's the thing? <laughs> and, and and he's like, that's for you to decide. And the person responded, Oh, I hate when that happens. I hate that. That's funny. It's just like uh, well. some people want a conventional ending, man. They want the scene yeah, where just... all the ambulance pull up at the end and someone's in a blanket with hot cocoa and it's like everything's okay. We killed the thing. The thing you should call that ex wife <laughs> yours. Like call the ex wife. But uh, uh yeah, that that, uh, that concludes The Thing, the one of the thing. greatest movies of all thing. time. Oh, so good. What a Halloween uh, to a spend watching wow. something like that. And hopefully yeah. this was everything well, yeah. you guys in chat were hoping for in terms of us breaking I hope down so, yeah. a classic. Uh, this movie deserves to, to be praised extensively and thoroughly. Deserves the hype. Oh, and yeah. it's super rewatchable, which yeah. is another cool thing, too. Yes, it is. is. Oh, it's worth it. Oh yeah, Goat good stuff. Can't wait material. for a really, really neat no. sequel. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Look, Mel Gibson's too old for it now, man. <laughs> we can't no, get he it. isn't. He could do it. 
All right, fine. We'll, um, but yeah, that kind of wraps the conversation. Our adventure. Yes, of, um, thing. We'll we'll try to do some more of these as, over the years, you know, because I like talking about good movies. Um, we did a Jurassic Park mm -hmm. one. What else have we done? Train to Busan. Um. We'll do more. It's there gonna happen. I swear. I, uh, I know what I want us to do for Christmas. Ooh. Well, on my channel, we did one on Gone Girl, so you can go watch that. That's right. Yes. Which totally took us way longer times. because holy shit! Why did that take us so long? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did it take us uh, way longer? I'm sorry, misremembering. Well, bear in mind, Gone Girl is longer than the thing. It took us a very long time because I went through autistically basically every line <laughs> of the script and talked about how it's all so good. But when you've got so it. all hyper autists' power, like yes, just that's off, right. Yeah, <laughs> channeled into into one conversation. Um, uh, well, well, and what's creepier? On my channel, right? I covered a girl I wish was gone, but the well. Gone Girl monster or the Thing monster, which is scary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, women, women, yeah, easy. Right. women, <laughs> women, easily. yeah. <laughs> Thank God there much, no like the, much like the thing, like they have the like the outward appearance of being human, but the kind of craziness that lurks within <laughs> is it's oh man. They're chaotic monsters. Oh. But, um, <laughs> that's a, a fantastic oh. intentional segue there, Cap. You do yes. indeed have that video yeah. on your channel, and you should all mm -hmm. go check it out if you want to hear me and Fringy gush about uh David Finch's Gone Girl for hours on end with him. And uh, what else are you up to on your channel right now, right this moment, right this second? Uh, a reaction video sort of thing about, um, well, it's about a, a sweet baby ink employee who slanders Django Unchained. Oh, and, that video, yeah. Oh my yeah. god, yeah. yeah. Rags yeah, that video. Enough, recommended it to me, so we're going to be covering that in a big video coming out soon, only on YouTube.com. Oh boy, check it out. Sweet. Yeah, that um, is quite a video. Yeah. John, my good man, what are you up to? What are you doing? Uh, John Graham on YouTube. I do Arby and the Chief, a machinima series called Hard Justice. I'm still picking away at those. I've been doing a bunch of gaming streams as well. Been, I'm going through all the Halo games. I don't know if you were playing um, Sonic. Are you, are you playing the, uh, the new Sonic Generations the, uh, re remake? Remastered? I was, yeah, but I kind of lost interest in it. I thought oh. it was, I started off okay, but like, I thought it was kind of meh as it went along. Mm. Okay. Personally, but that's just my yeah, onion. Fair enough. Happens. Um, but yeah. Um, obviously, thank you both for joining us, and the links to the yes. channels in the descriptions. Check them out. Uh, Fringy, Rags, is there anything you guys wanted to mention, in any way, shape, or form? Well, um, I've got two videos out recently. I plan to do more. Um, hopefully soonish. And I don't know what my Halloween plans are. Um. My mom just came down with like some sort of cold or sickness or whatever, so she's uh, under the weather right now. So we're trying to figure out what the family's gonna do with like Halloween plans. We don't know what's going on. And as far as the stream goes, I I got my days mixed up. I with like the Wednesdays and Thursdays and the Halloweens and the numbers. I thought I was originally going to do a bunker stream today, but we did this. So tomorrow I might end up doing like a late night bunker stream. I'm not do exactly it. certain. Blinky so bunko. We will. We will see. We will see. Hopefully something, but either way, I'll be probably working on stuff. Oh, I just got a text. Oh, my God. I, I just got a text from her, and I mentioned her. Just a second. Let me... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. So, anyway. Uh, um, I mean, wow. While we were it. thinking, wow. while we were doing the big thing, it looks like yeah. uh, we're almost completed on the 1K goals. Bringy has passed... The, uh, oh God. the the plushy goal, which means that is locked which in for Wolf. Wolf is playing. All right. Yeah, Wolf, is, is Wolf has no choice now. Um, Did it. And, uh, now Rags is still uh, free awesome for another 10 hoodies. <laughs> wow, <laughs> wait, wait, just a second. Mahler, <laughs> our plushies are at the exact number. We're neck and neck. We're both at 1,087. Wow, yes. That's wild. Holy shit. And the hoodie uh, is... But, oh, but by the way, seriously, thank, thank you guys uh, so I was gonna much. Say it's, I really, we, say. we really do appreciate this uh, yeah, it level is, of enthusiasm and support for our uh, it is an, It's an incredible amount of support that you guys give us with uh, these. Makeshift does a great job. We really appreciate uh, you know your patronage. It helps us out a lot, and it helps us get you more stuff. And it is legitimately really thrilling to see that we have an audience that is willing to support us and our endeavors and what we're doing and our streams. And we, it really means a lot. Thank you very, very much for doing that. Yeah. And obviously like, I'm glad this one 
worked out, so to speak, in terms of like the designs. The we try to give you stuff you guys would actually be interested in, as well as giving you the chance to sort of support the show in this avenue as well. And um, people are very uh, hyped about the idea of clothing, so we're gonna have to try and figure that out the more time goes on. I think because uh, you know there's there's, there's all kinds uh, of different things. Time. Yeah, I don't Rise like clothing more. myself, but some people are really into it, so I'm really glad that there's an option for them if they wanna if they yeah. wanna go down that route. Looks like Rags is is all but certainly going to be also playing Pollen as well. I don't think so. Um, uh, nine hundred ninety. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's still. I mean, you won't. I don't, I don't yeah, know. you're right. It'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, no one's gonna yeah, buy. Be fine. It'll, be it'll, fine. it'll be mm. fine. Mm. No one will buy ten of these incredibly comfy, well fitting, <laughs> uh, neatly designed <laughs> EFAT branded things Halloween, that you yes, could with, with wear at Halloween and yeah. Oh man, yeah. That's actually wild. That's crazy. But yes, um, but bear in mind, yes, you still have about a day left to yes, uh, yes. grab, grab um, your, your uh, EFAP plushies and hoodies. But listen close. In terms of events, because uh, it's fucking, it's going to be weird. I think I'm going to try and upload this episode to Moolah immediately. Just, yes, just, it's just going to go it. straight up uh, and be public because tomorrow we've got the Elm Street finale, which is two hours, the video. Because we watch the movie and then we rank them, and the ranking session takes a long time. <laughs> we talk about everything you could think of with the whole set. <laughs> so, uh, Wolf has done wonderful work on that set, and you're getting the last one tomorrow, yes. two hours before Open Bar starts up, which will be uh, a big old special Halloween -y episode. And then after that, uh, I'm planning on doing a stream, probably Astrobot, funnily enough. <laughs> I've done my yes. spooky streams this year, but I want to do the yes. rest of Astrobot. Yes. And I'll probably, game. like, title it such that people know, literally, you've got hours hey, look, left to, to pick these up Astro if you want them. Spooky levels, so that it does. works as a Halloween, as a couple of spooky levels. Um, and then simultaneously, if if that's happening, Rags might be doing a bunker stream. I'm not sure if that'll, that'll happen or not, but it's all good. Uh, yeah, I... I don't know what the plans are with the with mm -hmm. the fam fam, so who don't know? Maybe, maybe I'll do it on. Maybe say, oh, "Fuck it, I'll do it November the first and be like, oh, it's not Halloween anymore." It's like, <laughs> yeah, but the, the spirit's still here. It's all <laughs> Soul Day it. after all. Well, and uh, maybe you've got to hurry too hold because on to the Halloween. You know, you and Wolf. Oh, what an adventure you may yeah, be on soon enough. That's right, you and Wolf on Gollum. It's gonna be great. Excited stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, we never said when we were doing those. Streams, oh, I see. So, uh, <laughs> no, we'll uh, yeah, we'll think about what happens. Uh, we'll pick a good time. I mean, Halloween would be a good time for the Gollum stream. But, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know. Something to tide us over. Uh, we will see. We will see. Fuck yeah. Well, that's that, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for the support. And I suppose we will see you this Saturday. For the second half oh my God. of Agatha, which is what we'll be doing with uh, Theo Woo! and Nutso. Agatha! We're going to drag them both into it. You guys have fun. That sounds <laughs> so much <laughs> <He> fun. Will. <laughs> we did. It was very fun. All righty. Toodle pip now. Cheerio. Thanks, bye bye. Everybody. See you later, everybody. Yeah, goodbye, everybody. Have a good day. Happy Halloween. Oh my God, Fringy. <laughs> <laughs>